first of a series of consultations and general discussions of copyright law revision implementation. I am scheduling the agenda to make about a five minute uh, opening statement, and I will. Uh, I hope it can be shorter than that, but before starting, let me say, and this applies to what I'm going to say, I think we ought to make this as informal and loose and unstructured as we can. The agenda has times in it, but I don't think we should feel absolutely impelled to stick with the times. And after debating this a bit, we agreed that it would probably be useful to have open questioning throughout all of the presentation. Open questioning, open comments. If anybody has anything on their mind, that they want to say at any point, I think that they should feel free to do so. Let me stop right now and ask you, does anybody have any other views on this? Would you rather go on and make your statements and then have questions in any case? If not, let's do it that way, and I think we should probably err on the side of asking anything that's on our minds, don't you? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, was, I have read through all of the material, not just what's in here, but some of the other stuff that had come in earlier and uh, some of the stuff that came in around the same time as this that supplemented it, and I am really and truly extremely impressed with it. I think the level of it is remarkable. I knew that you all had the interest and commitment, and none, none, none of that surprised me, but the depth, the level of knowledge and the insight that uh, the questions and the uh, statements and assignments reveal uh, really did impress me. I have tried to think, and I've asked the other members of the coordinating committee to think, if in all of this we're leaving anything out, if the sort of thing that does hit you sometimes when you come to this point, that, oh my God, we haven't really addressed this. If, if any of you have any feelings, you, you've all got copies of this, I assume. Did anybody not bring theirs today because we do have some additional copies? Everybody has it. Uh, let me say at the outset, in this whole batch, we're not including the extra added attractions, the performance royalty in uh, sound recordings, which is Harriet Oler's special task. This is separate and in addition to revision. It's not part of revision. Similarly, this thing that we've now got cooking on videotaping off the air and the manufacturing clause and the photocopying thing. These are extra, and they're not supposed to be included in here, although to the extent of revision implementation, obviously some of it will be. Uh, there will be an overlap. But let me ask the group now, before we get started, is there anything in this the package that we've left out that, that has hit you in thinking about it? Have we addressed this in, in terms of questions or comments? I'm not, not trying to pin you down that we have covered everything. I'm really asking for information. I think we'll know more after we've had each of the past group heads present. Uh, okay, I'm gonna I, ask this question again. I've had a question or two, but I'm fairly sure that Mike Shelley will cover it. If not, I'll bring it up then. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Um, I am awfully grateful for the willingness of this group to pitch in and really in many cases, in most cases, do two jobs uh, pretty well full time for a while. And uh, I'm also impressed by the lack of game playing and uh, uh, jockeying for position. I was looking for that, frankly. And I think this is the sort of thing that you have to look for in something like this, to see whether people are trying to feather their own nest or to uh, put somebody else down. And I saw none of that. Maybe it's there and I just wasn't sharp enough to pick it up, but I was very pleased to see that. <laughs> okay. I don't think what we're here to do today is to answer questions, really there are undoubtedly going to be questions that come up that we can answer, and I suppose we ought to go ahead and do that if we can. But that's not really the purpose of this meeting. The purpose of this meeting is to explore and to inform and to consult and not to answer. I think that the answers will emerge from what we do today uh, in different contexts. But, uh, if you want to pin us down, go ahead. I'm not in any way trying to uh, uh, restrict the questions that you ask, but I don't think that you should seek and expect to receive 
definitive answers today. We'll do what we can, and I'm well aware that some of the things that you're doing and the questions that you are, you're asking have to be answered before some of the other groups can go ahead and, and address their problem. Okay, um, I think I've covered all of this. Uh, one question that did come up was the scope of the questions that we should be trying to discuss today. And I think that we are getting a lot of questions in the office, within the office and from outside, concerning the interpretations of the law involving things like rights, matters that really don't involve the office directly. And I have no objection to discussing these, but I don't think that's the purpose of this meeting. I think that uh, we can, uh, I know that a lot of questions are coming up, for example, from the training sessions. And we probably ought to know what these questions are in some organized framework and see if we know the answers or see if we should try to seek the answers. Uh, I realize that there are people in the office that have to come to grips with these questions in one context or another. On the other hand, I don't think that is really our function. I think we should be trying to address what we have to do and the questions we have to answer in order to do it. One other point I want to make, and it's a matter of philosophy and direction. And I, let me say at the outset, I'm not, I'm not in any way suggesting criticism of what's been done, because it seemed to me that in reading these statements that they're neutral in tone. I don't in, interpret them in any way or uh, one way or another. At the same time, I think it's, it would be useful for me to make the statement and then see if you have any reaction. I do feel that it is the function of the office to serve the public. I've said this a million times, but they're not just words. We're not here to uh, try to make our own job easier. We are here to provide the best service that we can. And it, it has a lot of uh, impact on specific decision making, what philosophy you approach a problem with. For example, in terms of deposit copies. Let's take that as an example. Uh, it just, it's, it's, it's one that's in my mind because I talked to a group in the Library of Congress yesterday. Obviously, we have a dual function here. Uh, one is to provide the most efficient method that we can with respect to uh, getting in the copies and accounting for them and getting them to the library. And that obviously is important both to the office and to the library. But at the same time, it seems to, to me that we should go at this with the, a really even more fundamental goal, which is to make the system work in the most efficient way possible without burdening the public. In other words, it seems to me that in every point, at every point that we have a decision to make, we should try to decide, is this useless for the library or in balancing its usefulness to the library or the copyright office? Are we overburdening the public? Does the burden on the public outweigh the benefit to us? And it is very, very important to me and to the office in general. Uh, greetings, Glenn. This is uh, the one person who isn't a copyright office employee, and uh, I, uh, it's, it's Glenn Zimmerman, the director of personnel, in case you uh, uh, don't know him. I'm very delighted to have him with us today, and you're on tape, Glenn. <laughs> you're late. You're late to, arrived. Goes to show you that you let anybody into your meetings. <laughs> right. Um, and I'm very, very grateful that you were, were willing to come to this today to get some idea of what we're doing. I'm just about to end up my spiel by saying that uh, essentially what I want to do is to create a framework in a situation in which we serve the public to the optimum degree possible without burdening the public. And uh, in every single decision you make, I hope you'll keep this uh, in mind. Does anybody want to comment on this as a philosophical approach? Does anybody disagree with it? Does anybody agree with it and want to say so? <laughs> at, the proper, at the proper time. <laughs> at the proper time. Okay. Well, to the extent that we make ourselves more efficient, we serve the public better. And well, of course, we of course. But you know, the, 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 the bureaucratic uh, image attaches to every single thing that we do and to the extent that we can just own that and disprove it uh, it seems to me that we come out ahead and we we do better what we're supposed to be doing 
Okay, yeah, Dick. I just think it's something you've got to constantly keep in your mind. That is the uppermost purpose of what we're here for and what we're all about. Right. I, I would want to add to that our special responsibility to LC. Well, why don't you develop uh, that I point think a is bit? A cor cor corollary. Well, uh, I confess the other day when Waldo was talking about should we or shouldn't we, should we not catalog the post apocalypse, my reaction was negative. But uh, the rejections you're talking about. Yeah. Not I meant rejection four oh seven, four oh seven. Oh the four oh seven deposits, okay. All right. But if if we are going to be in the business of helping LC with that kind of thing, and if there is a tie in with compliance, uh, then maybe we are going to, uh, in order to help them, uh, need to keep more detailed records than we would get with a simple uh, title input on the university. It means more work. It means more work, which ultimately the public does pay for, and is is it worth it? I'm I'm asking the question rhetorically. I don't know the answer. The public is also a beneficiary. Yeah. Different. And there public. is that. There is that yeah. side. Yes, but it's still the public. Yeah. That's very true. Well, this is the kind of balancing that I think we need to go through on every single issue. We just don't have any idea of how many yeah. items. You know, okay. Part of your balancing is how much of it is there. True. Okay. Uh, well, we've broken this open. <coughs> this is the kind of discussion and free interchange that I hope we can have all day. It's going to make a long day. We plan to go to about five. If any of you have to leave with the carpool or any other reasons, uh, feel free. I don't think uh, you, you should feel compelled to stay at the bitter end. <laughs> we'll uh, see if we finish. Uh, we hope to have a little wind-up uh, discussion at the very end. Uh, Marlene is going as thank you Marlene going to take uh, notes and we will try to get all the questions into the uh, into the records of this meeting the tape is just to show that we had this I don't think it's intended for any substantive or cognitive purposes and uh, it'll just go for an hour is that right Dave yeah uh, I didn't arrange for it so I, <laughs> I don't think my wants are really very relevant uh, but uh, in any case, that's not the record of the meeting. What Marlene will be uh, taking notes on will be. And the people that are mentioned as speakers in the agenda are the task group leaders, not the subcommittee chair people. On the other hand, the chair committee uh, leaders, the, uh, the, the four, well, let's see, uh, Bob, Waldo, uh, yeah, Marlene and, Marlene John. and John uh, should feel free to, to chime in in all of the discussions that the, their task uh, group leaders are, are giving. Are there any general comments or anything else that anybody wants to stay, say before we break this up? Say it out loud for the, for the tape. <laughs> I just thought I'd give a quick rundown of status of the rulemakings which we're now involved in and which are upcoming within the next week because it involves many of us here. The final regulation for the termination, termination notices and the public broadcasting recording provisions should be out within the next week or so. And those will be final regulations. The comments have already been reviewed. We have four well, I'm sorry, one additional one, the final cable rulemaking for the initial cable reporting provisions is supposed to be published in the Federal Register this morning. The, uh, and then we have four upcoming rulemakings within the next week or two weeks, which I just wanted to mention quickly, a full cable hearing for the purposes of implementing all the cable provisions, all the reporting and filing provisions of 111. Uh, we're, planning to announce the notice in the Federal Register early next week. A rulemaking to <coughs> issue regulations for the compulsory licensing provision, also a hearing 
the notice of which will be published in the Federal Register sometime early next week. And advance notice of proposed rulemaking for jukebox provisions with a notice to be published in the Federal Register within the next week or so. And finally, uh, an advance notice of proposed rulemaking for the regulations for the library photocopying warnings under Section 108 also to be published in the Federal Register within the next week or two. In all of these cases, these are advanced notices. They don't propose regulations. They ask questions and ask for information. As I said, the Registers Conference two weeks ago, I think for working purposes, you can distinguish between procedures, substance, organization, or what have you, but when you get down to resolve the issues, I don't think you can. And I, I've given Waldo and Joan uh, a list of dates involved here because I think their respective committees and task force together with mine and Dick's are the ones principally involved in these four upcoming rulemakings. And I think that all the you, uh, your people and Joan's people will have to be involved in reviewing the comment letters and participating in the hearing. And at the end, we are going to have to sit down and resolve these questions together. Many of the cable questions are going to be questions of organization and procedure rather than questions of legal substance. That was the only purpose of this list. I have extra copies, but I didn't make quite enough. <coughs> That's all I want. Um, well, let me let me throw in uh, in relation to public broadcasting, uh, cable, and jukebox, isn't it? No, procedures. What was the, the only two you have? The only two that I have. You gave me a third. Third one will be termination. Okay. Yeah. Right. 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 Um, Waldo prepared. Uh, how was that done? Well, what we was just, the structure? Of well, the we just had a really a, a very ad hoc committee uh, made up of representatives of each division, uh, and we, or at least one representative, and sometimes more, and we just uh, uh, wrote out a draft and then worked uh, against the draft and edited it down and came up with an agreed. Uh, uh, so we have procedure. what are in effect. To compendium sections, what we right. would, would have normally considered right. compendium sections. We, what we did, I think, is it's uh, fairly <coughs> obvious, uh, is to go really a little more on the procedure side than one would in a compendium. To be to be a item in a compendium or something that needs some editing, culling out of of details about uh, the shapes of cards and this kind well, of thing. Well, this was precisely my problem, and it wasn't. A, it wasn't. It was a nice problem. It yep. wasn't a bad one. Um, just how did we fit these into a, a larger structure so that they would feed into something that obtained eventually permanent status? And did it go into too much detail? It's similar to what we had years ago and were called practices, right. but uh, that was all kind of hit or miss, right. and it did eventually lead into the formalization of the right. compendium. Some of the detail is, is in the compendium in those chapters That's on certification right. and exactly. recording, for example. I, I think it's easier. The detail, yeah, I think I, it's I easier to call the detail out than for somebody to say, "Now, what did you have in mind yeah. in terms of detail yeah. here?" Since it's it's better to edit back rather than upwards. Since this was all new, I think we did put a lot of detail. Right. Sure. It goes from here to there. And so Correct. Exactly. How it each station because it was all new. We never had these right. Back right. But this was all completely kind of spontaneous and ad hoc. It wasn't as a part of this revision. I'm not being critical. No, but oh no. I'm just trying to we had a deadline, out what we and now. John yeah. had to have this. Waldo and I had met with Mary and Penny and decided that, particularly for cable, where we could be getting 3,400 statements very quickly, and for termination, where they could come in quickly, and public broadcasting, where they theoretically could, we needed an outline of what to do with the things when they came mm -hmm. in. I, Waldo and I sat down, and Waldo agreed to constitute this ad hoc committee to draw them up. Uh, whether they ultimately go in a compendium or something, I don't know. But I think if we needed something, because nobody would know what to do with the statements when they get in. I think Skip will need the cable procedures almost immediately. He's going to be doing phone calls. His name is on that notice. So I think we have to resolve at least the cable one and subsequent public broadcast to get the documents completed in whatever form they take. Okay. The Skip is among the audience. Well, when we discussed this, you and I, uh, last earlier this week, we agreed that it was most important to get those regulations out and not to worry about the detail of the uh, of these practices. On the other, I had a few problems with with odds and ends, and I I had this overspanning problem of what do we do when we get these out? We can give Skip Schultz some pieces of paper, but obviously we have uh, uh, both. 
obligations to the office and to the public to put this in some kind of final form. And one problem I've had with all of this is I'm not too clear as to how the revisions of the compendium are going to emerge from all of this. Does anybody have any questions on this? Well, and, and some of the assignments that, that Dick and I have given to Subcommittee 1, Task Force 1, and Subcommittee 3, uh, revisions of the compendium are built into the assignment. That's particularly true of the ones for uh, assignments and renewals. In essence, the assignment is <coughs> redraft the assignment and renewal sections of the compendium. And we'll take it from there and decide what goes in regulations and what stays out of regulations. But the assignments themselves are a revision. But that's only where it involves legal policy and uh, the tr being translated into practice. And then, of course, the compendium is a vast array of other stuff too, beyond that. And I'm not sure that this has been addressed in an overspanning way. Penny, Penny and I have discussed it, and I think we're going to see that the people who are, that John and Dick assigned to these subjects, in turn work with the committee yeah. for its appropriate Well, that's, it's that's vital. And I, what, what I'm saying, I don't think we should do things in little bits and pieces without going through the revision coordinating committee. Somehow this all has they, to be coordinated. Well, we had this first meeting, Mary and Penny, and one of the purposes of this was to try to get that same type okay. of parallel operation going on. I might say we're trying right now to uh, identify all of the documents of one sort or another, whether they be applications, uh, statements, notices, whatever, that the Copyright Office will be receiving to record or register. And uh, given the benefit now of this uh, uh, outline of the scope of assignments, we can see better where the overlaps are and we're trying to get out to the group uh, an outline showing what committees need to consult with respect to uh, preparing the content of these uh, applications and documents. And my own feeling is that we won't know really too well who should be responsible for preparing circulars or compendiums and so on until we see better where this overlap is and who would have primary responsibility okay. in certain areas. Then I think we'd know better who ought to draft. Yeah, and of course, the issue about the opinion, that's always going to be an ongoing document. It's never going to be complete. And, uh, obviously, people prepare very uh, position papers that could evolve into uh, sections of the opinion. It's going to have to be reviewed in a various, various work area for comments and additions. Do you have any feelings about uh, what the, these, these first three papers that say in detail what the office does with notices of termination, cable stuff, and uh, oh, public broadcast. Quite honest with you, I haven't seen them. I haven't seen all of them myself. But uh, somehow or another, this, this shouldn't be just done without some kind of larger context and also some consultation and cross-germination, too. Bob? <coughs> I think there's a real virtue in having that kind of document covers everything that has to be done with, with any new uh, procedure that we have. Uh, and I would suggest maybe it's not a bad model for what we need to do with, uh, with other kinds of uh, new procedures. I'm not sure uh, they are too deep. I'm sorry, Bob. I'm not sure. As a, you know, as a preliminary draft, statement of what is involved um, because after that's done somebody can take that and draft a compendium statement uh, Marlene's uh, the organization committee can take a look at it and say okay here are a whole lot of new work procedures and here's how we're going to get together there's a lot of vital information there but we don't do it as we do each of these Procedures were drawn up with present organization sure. in mind. Yes, of course. Well, so oh, they had to be. Reorganized in a way. Well, I'm not too sure they're too detailed. I think we should also recall that they were drawn up with an ad hoc committee representing every division, so there was coordination. I think we do need something like this for now. That's, that's my only concern. We need something like this within, with documents that are going to be coming into the office. And in, indeed, we've got to. Cable those are sitting at my desk now, and we don't know what to do with them. 
Okay, yeah, but at least me, we could issue the right. interim uh, operating procedures or something just so people know what's going on. One problem that, is, that that kept eating me when I was reading them, though, is the fact that these have the the, the, the legal effect of regulation. No, I. I differ. Uh, they, they are operating manual practices, and I think in order we have to reveal them to the public if anybody asks them, and if we change them, we have to reveal the changes. And I don't think we want to tie ourselves down to whether you put something in pencil or in ink, which they do. And uh, in terms of these being directives, you have to do what there is there, and you can't falter it. And I think we should be careful what we're tying ourselves down to do. Well, do you, do you want to issue them for comment? I don't think we have to do that, but I think we have to issue them. And we have to make people aware that they exist. We have to have them indexed in a way that they, you can find the information with them and all that. And uh, this all has to be done. We can't just stumble into this. We have to have it all planned out in advance. But clearly, at the point that we wanted to revise any of these, we would merely be the point of revising and then issuing a revision. Yes, that's right. But it, this is a you know massive project. Right. And if you have, it, it, in some cases, it's better not to go into too much detail in writing, I think, if you, if you want to leave yourself flexible as to how you uh, deal it. And I use examples like whether you type something or write it or what all that, or whether you call somebody or write them a letter, that sort of thing. Could they be identified as interim? I think we have to, because they are. There's not. There's no question about that. And the cable is interim, interim. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay. Well, we, I mean, uh, well, clearly we, we, have to, we have to expect that, that we, that's going to occur if we have to make revisions as we go along yeah. next year or any time. That's got to be built into the system. Fair enough. Uh, I guess all I'm really saying is that uh, we're, uh, we know we're going to have to, to make changes. Why tie ourselves down knowing that we'll have to go through a, a process of making the changes? If we, if, if we don't need the, the detailed information in order to uh, operate. But uh, admittedly, uh, at this stage of the game, I know people feel more comfortable if they have everything in the flowchart spelled out. Okay. Uh, Dick, do you want to start now on, on our regular agenda? We're only 40, uh, 35 minutes late. <laughs> You may hand out that you have. You notice the Bordell Street number one, you've got 20 different assignments. Um, mm -hmm. Of those 20 studies, uh, we have assigned 10 of the most pressing uh, problems in the matter. And I've got the reports from the people who have these assignments. They are on target as far as time is concerned. Hopefully by in the next two weeks, we should pretty much, not all of them, but from the beginning of the number of them, we finished. Uh, five of those came. Uh, I do include the last paragraph of the proposed regulation. For example, the first one is the uh, number seven, your list. Performance video notice and objection. This study has been done. I'm not yet seen it yet, and the draft has been, has been completed and it's on its way to us. The second one is the simultaneous fixation notices and registration provided for in section 411B. That one is assigned and should be finished probably by the 1st of April. The third one is the author death and still living statements provided for in sections 302B and E. Uh, and the author identity statements called for 302A. That, uh, that will be finished hopefully within the, by the 1st of May. Both of those. Both of those. Are, did you lump them together as a study? They're the same people have both of those. Right. And we've been put it on the in those assignments, people from Jimmy Roberts' group as well, because it's dealing with records and so forth. The fifth one is the library photo duplication warning, which was assigned to Patrice. We had to pull her off. John what number is that? Pardon? Number is that? Uh, number six. Yeah. Uh, as John has already explained to you, death is notice of inquiry, uh, which will be published 
to the Federal Register soon. In addition to this, one of the assignments involves the preparation of a comprehensive statement of all the renewal practices that we will call out the January the first John referred to that one. Also the similar assignment with respect to assignment. The practices and recording and version of the document. Those have been assigned the same uh, group of people. Uh, we've included in that group people from Jimmy's uh, group as well. Uh, in that assignment. We have assigned the preparation of a list of uh, examples of methods and application and provisions of notices from various types of works. Uh, that should be finished again within the next couple of weeks. And we've assigned the one on appeals. Uh, Lou has that. I don't know how far he's gone with it, but he's got the assignment. <laughs> uh, and the last one is, in, is number 18. That's a rather extensive and it's a fundamental, it's a fundamentally significant assignment. <coughs> involving the gathering of all of our non-subject matter grounds of rejection and rule of doubtful acceptance. Uh, we're going to determine how each of these should be treated under the new law and also listing the additional uh, non-subject matter grounds of rejection and doubtful acceptance under the new law and discuss to the extent to which we should engage in correspondence under the new law where we can register, but the formalities, for example, are doubtful or they've not been met, such as a faulty notice. So those are the ten that have been assigned. I've got some questions that the people have given me that they need answers for, but I'll hold off on those until a different task groups report and then I'll ask my questions at that time. Could you give us a name for each one of these assignments? A so, person? Yeah, just one person for each, each one of them. Okay, number, uh, number, okay, number six, well, that's okay. Number seven is uh, Ken Dunlap. Number nine is Christine Brusick. Ten and eleven is Santora. Twelve and thirteen is Beats. And 18 is Catherine Armstrong. Four, 14 is? 14 believe is Bowie and uh, Vitalis. And Lewis, uh, and Lewis is, is, is the formal 17. Well, 14 wants to stay this event. 14 should be finished within the next couple of weeks. Dick, can I add something? Actually, one through seven, yeah. one through six, have in effect all been assigned. Uh, two, three, four, five, and six are in the rulemakings I mentioned. So in effect, they've been assigned and they're in the works. The assignment ended up being my assignment. That's simply the way it worked out. And number one, for all practical purposes, has been, ass has been assigned. Uh, there are various people in the offices working on it. The uh, one other point on number 18, Dick mentioned the the fundamental, fundamental nature of number 18, it's, it's a question of identifying everything we reject now on the non-subject matter grounds and deciding when we can, whether we should continue that practice after January 178, A, with respect to works published before January 178, and B, with respect to works published after, and the answers are obviously going to be different, for example, a notice of manufacturing laws, and there are going to be some very difficult transitional questions. 18 was broken up into various stages. Stage one has been completed, that is identifying all of them. Now the people are going to stage two, which is deciding what we do after January 178. In addition, it's likely that number 18 will spin off into other independent assignments for some of the things that are just uh, too major to be taken into account by this, this one small group of people working on this project as a whole. A corollary to number 18, Dick prepared a list of all grounds of subject matter rejection. And we're now in the process of splitting those off into assignments. For example, the question of the Yardley case. We've never changed our regulation to comply with the decision of the Court and Customs Appeals in Yardley. And GE was threatening to sue us, but I'm told by the Commissioner of Patents that they didn't get the deal they wanted from the Patent Office, so they probably won't sue us. That's these 
number 18 in the corollary to, to dictate our lead offs into very general but fundamental questions. We also have about 10 or 15 other studies in the works. Well, uh, you had mentioned 19 was a sign. Uh, no. No, I, maybe I was on the. Lou was seven. indicated an interest in participating in 19. Appeal. Yeah. Okay. Appeal. Uh, right. <coughs> I only come up with nine other than the ones that you do. Actually, myself. everyone has been assigned except number eight, 15, and 16, which are all deferred until the late the last months of this year. Number 17. 17 technically hasn't been assigned. It's one of the little ones that participate. 17, 18, and 20 have not yet been assigned. Right. Everything else has been assigned in one manner or another. Okay. And 19 has not been assigned. No. All right. Does anyone have any questions on this? And we will return to the questions that are generated from all of this uh, at some later time. I don't know exactly when. Yeah. 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 I'm going to ask one general question that some of the attorneys have asked me. Uh, there's really thought of a policy decision that I've been asking the attorneys who draft the regulation to sit in when it's discussed. Sure. Uh, they would like to be able to do that if it's all. It's a very good idea. One other minor point that Pat might be particularly interested in. Some people have asked me, what's happening to all the questions that were raised in the examining division conferences? And the answer is that they either have already been plugged in or will be plugged in by amendment or new assignment into assignments. The idea always was that the examining division conference would be something to raise the questions. And a great number of them have, are, are already included in these assignments in the renewal area, in the assignment area, and in the cable and mechanical area. Well, so primary, why no, yeah. Nobody is ignoring those questions. No, They're all being plugged in. Terms of additional <laughs> questions, and they'll be plugged in. The assignment's already been given out. So the person who has the assignment will just be asked to make sure that this question is included in the assignment. Any other questions uh, of a preliminary nature on these? Okay, let's go on to you, Mary Beth. And, uh, I don't have too much to say. <coughs> training. Could I ask, will these uh, papers, when they're completed, be made available to subcommittee uh, chair people? Well, I would certainly think so, but I think we should have some discussion. Is there any reason why we, why they wouldn't be? No, again, I think Penny and I will have to take care of that. Well, should we ask a general question about funneling the, the, the product of this, all of these endeavors? Well, we're wanting to get all papers, and I think we are. We have the qu questions, and I'll get Mary Beth's questions if she wants to coordinate I just haven't received anything uh, from um, anybody. Well, I take it nothing, nothing, well, nothing uh, has come out of this task group one yet. Uh, I gather there's one in draft. There's but, one that's completed, yes. And uh, I, oh, are people seeing the rules as they uh, are? Oh, yeah. We see them after they're uh, as a circular. That's, that's what's happening. They, when they get the mailing with stage. All right, let's take that. Should, should that be emerging at some earlier point? I think subcommittee chair of people ought to know the same thing that their task group heads get. Certainly. I don't well, argue I think, with that. No, I think mean? anything that we've circulated, they have, but there's been very little. <coughs> we haven't received that much, really. I'm uh, about the future. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, I think well, so. I think we have to distinguish between the, the papers that will come out of these assignments. It, the, it was my understanding, I believe, Dix, that these papers would be submitted to Dick and I as the task force and committee chair people and general counsel and system general counsel respectively in any event, at which point we have a first level stage of approval. And from that point they go to the policy decision group. I, I imagine copies can go to the other task force and subcommittee chair people, particularly if we anticipate that in some way it will affect their operations. But now on rulemakings, the actual notices that go into the Federal Register and the like, the way I have it on my checklist is when it goes to mailing list just to make sure the copies of that mailing list publication get out to everybody. The task force and committee chair people should be already be involved at a much earlier stage, which is one of the reasons for this document, for example. They, Joan has to be involved with the cable rule. Well, I'd like to so copy what you give her. Well, then everything you know, will have to be done. Can I comment on that, too? Part of 
what we've been doing in my task group is informally, I've been discovering <coughs> and talking to other task group heads, areas they're considering that have an effect on my task group. And consequently, I've gotten copies of their studies and reports. Now, within my task group, what, we, what we're doing is everybody, when they're completing a report or a study, I've got two of them so far, I'm distributing in the memo form to the other members of the task group asking for comments and saying, if I have no comments within a week, we'll assume that nobody has any constructive mm -hmm. criticisms to make of this particular proposal. And I'll handle it from there. Now, it sounds like it might be advisable to pass also a copy of that up to the coordinating committee, assuming that they will eventually know exactly what the overlaps are and can pass them on on a formal basis to the other task group basis instead of doing this hit or miss basis. I would agree with that. Does anybody uh, disagree? Because it does seem to be very sensible. There's a lot of paper and a lot to read. On the other hand, I'd rather err on that side That's than the only uh, way you can be yeah. informed of what your groups are doing. I think we'll make for every document that goes into the Federal Register, either advance notice or notice, we will see that a copy of the Federal Register notice, if possible, even before it's sent to the Federal Register, after the Register signs off on it, is sent to each committee chairperson plus the Revision Coordinating Committee. That should take care of that problem. And uh, as far as the assignments go, I think they won't be distributed until after Dick approves them. I approve them, and then they can go both to the policy group and to the revision coordinating committee at the same time. And the other task group people, if they want to have input before the policy decisions are made, can, can make that point known. Okay, back to you, Mary. Okay, I don't have too much to say. Um, we're in the long course, we're now going into the fourth week. We just finished the first of the, the main course, the basic course. Um, you finished it, it's done. First one. The first no, one. Got nine more to go. I know. I know. Right. <laughs> okay. we, we finished it this morning. Um, people seem very enthusiastic and, and with it. Um, Five uh, hours was it? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, right. Total. Right. Was that enough? As it turned out, do you think? They seem to want more. Yeah, um, that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> no, they wanted more. They yeah. wanted to find the longer car. Yeah. Some of them said afterwards, um, I really wish I had been in the other one. Mm -hmm. As far as the speaking is concerned, that seems to be moving on, and having Susan Weissman on board has really helped. And so we've had her meet with some of the people who are speaking to library groups, and I think she was very helpful. She gave, she did a prepared speech that I approved, and it was given out to all of the people who were speaking to library groups. She made them understand the philosophy behind librarians and how they have a problem with the copyright law, which tries to restrict them from disseminating information. She gave them uh, good ideas on the questions that they're going to receive. And so that seems to be going along pretty well. Um, I am getting questions that I do intend to funnel up. I just really haven't had the time. They're all on pieces of paper. And as soon as I can sit down and write a memo, I'll put them all forward. So it's too difficult to answer. <laughs> I'll offer an unsolicited comment that I've had nothing but uh, positive reaction from my people in both the Maxi course and the mini courses to the job that's being done in getting the material together and the way it's being presented. I'd like to second that. It's yeah. tremendous. Yeah. I, I, that's my uh, general reaction, too. In fact, I've heard nothing <coughs> adverse at all and a great deal of uh, praise. I think that uh, people are beginning to realize the, the depths of this law that they're dealing with. This has been a big revelation to a lot of people. And well, I didn't realize maybe you didn't know as much about the old one. That's right. <laughs> 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 um, does anybody have any suggestions or comments about how this is all marching along? Mary Beth, on one D, I, I've spoken to AGAC, the Association of American right. Publishers, uh, Recording Industry Association of America. <laughs> some of the performing rights societies, and they're all very excited about the possibility. So are the employees of the Copyright Office. They're but really what they have to understand is they're not being invited here to plead their case. They'll have right. hearings for that. They're being, they would be invited here to explain what they do. What they do right. And yeah. why registration is important to them, and, and yeah. why prompt action may be important. Right. But everybody that I've approached, including the one I didn't mention was the National Music Publishers Association, are all very much in favor of doing it, and have all said, no problem in sending people down to the office. That's great, because the people in the classes are really excited. You know, they, they really think that it would be a very big help, not only morale-wise, which you mentioned, but to plug in with what they do to help these people. Um, what would you, you've got a very rigid, exigent 
curriculum laid out. Would you work this into that, or would no, you try to do it separate? We have to do it separate. There, yeah. there just doesn't seem to be any kind of time. Um, in fact, when we had a, a concho mix up in the room, yeah. um, we just we had to just put it off an hour and forget about lunches. Um, we really don't have time to fit it in. The whole day seems to be pretty much covered with flexi time. So it looks like it's going to have to come sometime this summer or after January. Um, right. And we can probably just do it you know, after that. Your whole, uh, Mike. Do I don't right? want to interrupt. Go ahead. Well, I just, uh, when do you plan to have this phase all through the mini and the maxi boat? Um, the mini is supposed to finish sometime in the third week of May, yeah. and the maxi, um, I haven't figured it out. I, I block 16 weeks, but it may not take 16 weeks. It may be 15. I don't know. But it will definitely finish somewhere in June, um, whether it's the third week or the second week. Right. Now. Okay. Um, d just to express this thought, <coughs> I'm going to get back to you. The, um, I have participated in some discussions where people from the patent office and uh, a trademark attorney just made general statements about these related fields of law and they'd be willing to do it I've asked them so we might plug them into oh, what you're now right. talking about and kind of plan a, an external affairs uh, course which would include both the private sector and related government sectors that might, good, yeah. might include the FCC I just did it for the patent office they indicated to me they'd be willing to come yeah. here right. so. they can be larger groups can't they yes oh yeah in fact, we found that out. I, um, unfortunately, I, at Registers Conference, I gave you the wrong view um, that only six people came to the main group. There's a problem. Bernie Dees canceled the law class Monday, and he put a sign on the door that said, copyright law class canceled, and he didn't sign it. <laughs> and I had a meeting with Susan Beisline, and by the time I ran up there, oh, everybody had it was one of those board. signs on the door that you were And they had to stand at that kind of thing. Okay. But okay. the larger groups do seem to work okay, too. They um, do. Especially for this other kind of yeah. thing. Uh, it doesn't seem to inhibit people at all. They seem to just be able to talk freely. Right. It's a friendly teacher. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Great. Okay. Now. Uh, about a month or so ago, I guess, at a registers conference, uh, we discussed concern that some of us had about the, the forgotten group as regards training, and that appears to be the rest of the library staff, the other six departments oh, of the I library. Agree. Now, I know you spoke yesterday, Bob Stevens and Lou Flax, and I have spoken to different groups at the library. LCPA has asked uh, ask us to do a series of articles for its newsletter and that sort of thing. But I, I wonder if we ought to be sure that we take a good, solid look at, at the overall job we do on behalf of the library and be sure that we don't overlook any Let's discuss this because I think it is an important question. I don't feel I was really talking to the right people yesterday, Bob. I don't uh, know, but I bet <laughs> <laughs> It was it was a who nice it was a nice meeting, but who I didn't. Wasn't there who should have been? I thought uh, there were responses. A lot of uh, department heads who should know this and not weren't, and uh, this and that. Uh, I I don't. I, and uh, well, Vivian Schrader shocked me when she said that she was the only person in her department that was asked to come. You were there. She said it in your presence. No, I had left you. Oh, maybe you when did. you were okay. talking to her, I didn't know that. <coughs> when she says her department. Not her department. Anymore. That's what she said. Uh, so no, she's wrong because right. there was a whole row yeah, of people a from E and G in order. There was. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I saw quite a. Well, do you feel stuff. that this was the kind of group that I should? Have <laughs> I I didn't feel that uh, I was getting the questions that I should have been getting. I'll put it that. I got a lot of questions, but I didn't think they were the one. They didn't go to the heart of that thing. Maybe so. For I'm, example, uh, what were you looking for in questions? Oh, a great deal more on deposit and that sort of thing, and uh, how how can we work this out in a structural way? But uh, maybe it was just it was too early for that. Yeah, maybe uh, basically an ignorance of the of the volume. Could be. Uh, That's right. How to ask the right questions. I think. Uh, the point is, you almost need to have an agenda for these <coughs> groups uh, and give them some information or key them into certain provisions of the law that True. identify yeah. those something very basic. Uh, whenever I've spoken to the group over there, I've taken along a, a fistful of copies of the law and of the R99, the highlights of the new law, and people would just jump up and down with joy to get copies of that circular because it, it summarizes things so nicely. Maybe we should make broader distribution of that in an early day. Everyone knows that's easy enough. We can certainly do that. Well, I, I, I felt the need to, to pursue this. Have you asked that to be put on the agenda for executive session? What is that you say? Yeah. <laughs> I got a, I got a few things hanging. Okay, I know you. But uh, but that. Uh, okay. That's a good suggestion. I talked to Don, uh -huh. and after the budget, uh, they, 
recognize me for being sort of remiss in having the meeting. I'll, I'll, I'll speak to him again. All right. Now, I feel very uh, urgent about this. Uh, I don't want to, do, to, to uh, uh, misfire by going at it too early. I think we need to have our own ducks in a row, which is what this we're doing now, a, a little more than we have so far. But uh, at some point, I think we need in-depth consideration of this, not just formal speeches. I don't see training the, the library in the new law, not the way we're doing our own staff, but uh, structure somehow a better uh, framework for, where we can have consultation that we need, I think is very imperative. Well, I think we have some of that through the subcommittee groups, Barbara, yeah. who are already starting to work. You do. You're saying well, really an answer to I'll, Mike that maybe we've got you enough. Uh, no. Uh, no, I think we're talking about two different, two yes, different uh, uh, publics at the library. You, it seems to me that in a general meeting where you are informing a large number of people, you, you really can do no more than get them started thinking about yeah. it and asking whatever questions are topmost <coughs> on their mind. But then you have to follow up, and, and I think that's what we are doing okay. Uh, okay. in a structured way. Uh, well, I'm getting ahead of things, I guess. Here, <laughs> but, uh, uh, up Lou, to a point, get ahead, and then, then we'll, we'll uh, come back to this in your presentation. Lou and I have had uh, a lengthy meeting with uh, uh, Alan Fern and John Finzi about how to proceed with, with the ANTRA, and, uh, and Alan will be setting up uh, an interdepartmental committee, uh, and uh, we will be working then with individuals who are going to be concerned with in the case of uh, best edition uh, compliance, the deposit question, uh, we have already started working with the acquisitions committee uh, on the photocopying question. We will have a, uh, we've had a meeting with the uh, professional group This is the ELP. Uh, no, this was the reference round table. Oh, sorry. right, right. Yeah. Right, yeah, the reference round table. I did uh, a thing for CRS. We have a we have a meeting scheduled early Monday morning with the photo dupe people, uh, and we are scheduled to go on from there to get input from the reference departments and CRS who needs in regards to uh, photocopy. My, my concern, obviously, since I'm managing yes. managing these efforts that I was talking about, my concern is not for the near term. It's that over the period of the rest of this calendar year, we not forget that we have responsibility to educate the library and to be sure that when we do it, we do it in, in an organized and, and complete manner. Well, let me uh, And obviously, you. a lot of that education has got to wait until we get our own house in order. Uh, to what extent should your endeavors be related to this? I don't really know. If it's the kind of, you know, what, like education kind of thing, I don't see why we can't. But Mike and Dr. Steele certainly know the need for the library far better than I do because I, I mean, I only was a non copyright person for about two months. Um, <laughs> and I, um, <laughs> I, I started in processing. Um, but uh, I, I just don't know. I'm open to any suggestions. Well, I, I think. Uh, what's emerging here is the need for some structured training once we have a, a, a clearer fix on what we're going to be doing. And I could see you being the uh, uh, a focal point of this later on in the year. I do yeah. too, and we're, we're, um, we're going to have a, a planning uh, for industry training, yes. and we're going to start that next month. Um, but um, right. Dorothy Harris is coming down from New is. York, and I don't see why we can't plan for library training at that time. But this is for this fall. I suppose that in any training, there's there's always a possibility of peaking too soon also, yeah, as far as the rest of the library is concerned. Uh, if you hold it early on in the year, when then when you get down toward the end of it, uh, in the day-to-day -day business of, of everything, people uh, may tend to forget or, or not. So the, the timing of it might be pretty important. Fair enough. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Now, yeah. It is fall totally is probably better because the fall, the kind of training we're going to be doing, I'll be coordinating, but I won't be doing most of it. Mm -hmm. the, um, 
team leaders, the section heads, that kind of thing will be educating their own staff and how to put them into practices. And I'll just be looking at what they're doing in auditing it, but I won't be doing you know, that little bit. Okay. Any other fur uh, further comments on uh, training and the document? Uh, on training, uh, we we have been taping all of yes. Mary Beth's uh, Maxi course. I don't know that we've done a mini course no. yet, have we? No. Um, I thought about that. I thought maybe I'd wait till I got to the fourth one, since okay. I'm still perfecting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would think we ought to build in a mechanism somehow so that every new employee who comes in um, can pick up and listen to the uh, tapes and, and then start the uh, start the course at the point he arrives, and, and then we may want to do this with newcomers later on after Mary Beth has uh, actually quit giving. Do you have any thoughts on that? No, we are doing it now. We are. Um, what I do is I give David a, a little folder that says session two that has the outline mm -hmm. and material and hypotheticals and the assignment sheet for next week. They can go and do that. And I'm working out with him right now because the material, um, the video takes stuff in the catalog. There's something, you know, I think it's better than nothing. But if you look at the video tape, um, you know, it has problems. <laughs> what you do in an open situation with a live class seems fine, but it looks terrible on video tape. Um, it really does. Your arms and your movements all the same. <laughs> <laughs> it looks terrible to the subject. Uh, That's right. No, I mean, I, don't, I think they're okay, and I think they serve a purpose, and, they, and they're a useful purpose, but I don't think they're the end all at all. Um, Face-to-face -face is much better. Of course, mm -hmm. but uh, if you can't have face-to-face, -face, it's at least something. It's a uh, reasonable fact. Uh, I think this is a step forward. I'm pleased with it. Uh, you, you wouldn't carry your remarks to the point of suggesting that we not use it in the way that Bob oh, has no, suggested. No, no, I'm just saying that... Um, <laughs> you're being all, modest is what no, you mean. No, it's all physically possible. I think life is better. Which I'm really trying to do better on the video tapes to knock out the ums and not to rock and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> but something happens after the first five minutes, I forget what I'm not supposed to do when I'm in church. I make all the faces and everything all over again. Video tape doesn't get the interaction she has. No, I do. That's, that's which very is true. part of the success. Well, David gets, um, he's been pretty successful in doing that. He's had a hard job. Um, David has his done. One question I wanted to ask, um, if you have to schedule makeups with, and you can't work it out with the room, would there be any point in renting a room like this? I don't know. It's um, not all that expensive. The problem is that you've got 35 or 40 people, and I don't know yeah. how big you can do it. And I know we've got a problem with the, the hearings coming up. And you do. They, they I, I've had that in my mind. And then it seems that they're always scheduled on a Tuesday and Wednesday, so it, you can't really work out, and you can't really take two days and put them into, I mean, four groups of days and put them into two, because the classes get way too big, because we're doing like 260 students now, and that's a lot. I don't know, I was going to broach that section, um, I, not necessarily here, but we do have to come up with an alternative to fit at least 50 um, or 40 people on those alternate days. Do they have bigger rooms than this? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. oh yeah, they've got rooms of all sizes. Mm -hmm. I have, I think it's worth the money. It would be about a hundred dollars. This mm -hmm. one, this room's seventy-five for all day. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I don't think uh, we're going to have to have the room for those hearings. That's I know obvious. You are. And obviously, Contu has to have it too. And Contu has to have it. And I really hate to interrupt the, the momentum mm -hmm. as it's going. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I think rather than cancel it, we'll just cancel classes and try to condense things that you know you shouldn't be condensing. Let's try to find another place. Okay. Okay. Thank you. 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 If that's all on this, um, let's now go to what I think is, is probably the hardest of the whole bunch. It's a mess. It is. I understand. <laughs> I understand exactly why. I must say that I'm very impressed with what you've done so far, and it's impressive in more than one way. It's impressive in terms of what you've done, and it's also impressive in terms of the, the, the difficulties that have been implied. This is the whole question of the registration system, including the application forms and uh, other forms. And 
why don't I just turn you loose? Okay. Before I get into it, um, can I go back to number one on Mr. Glasgow's list about the seal? I seem to be the only one here that's had any involvement in it. So Tell us what, what well, that's I'm not a, not a chairperson by any means of this. I kind of got involved in the group mainly because I needed to know what kind of a seal we were going to have in terms so that I could plan for the application design. Uh, so there was a meeting, oh, I think it was early on, January or early February, maybe, where it was agreed that um, we would have a new seal. It would be redesigned. Uh, no one holds any uh, favor for the one that we've been using for goodness knows however many years, and this is a perfect and ideal opportunity to redesign it and have something that is really a seal we can be proud of. Uh, so a certain we pretty much decided what we didn't want, but nobody had any real clear idea of what we did. <laughs> so Joe Ross had already checked into the uh, Army Institute of Heraldry, and they do this sort of thing. They do government seals. They design them, and then they create the dyes and the, uh, the sculptural uh, reproductions of them, this sort of thing. So on February 18th, a uh, small group of us uh, consisting of Joe Ross and Dennis Everett and I went out to the Army Institute of Heraldry. Fascinating place. We really had a very good feeling that they understood what we were trying to tell them. We wanted something, uh, something traditional. We don't want an, one of these new corporate logo type things. We want, we want something solid, something that represents creativity, human creativity. Put your mind to that and see if that's really much easier said than that. So we spent about two hours thoroughly confusing them. But, uh, no one's looking this copyright. <laughs> Not necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I won't, listen, I won't even go through the various possibilities that we discussed it throughout this. Uh, in any event, uh, we came away with really a good feeling that they, they had a feeling for what we were trying to grapple with and probably far better equipped than to it. So we left it with them. As I said, that was February 18th, which is quite a month ago today. And we're promised a design within six weeks to two months. So that should be in any time pretty soon, uh, where they will give us three possibilities, and we will hopefully choose from one of them. Hopefully, we're going to like one of those three. It's going to save an enormous amount of work and delay <laughs> if we just put our minds to liking something. That all right, that's the easy part of the problem. It's so much easier to manufacture the, the uh, dye, apparently. But uh, I don't remember saying about All right, we do a depressed seal now for our certificates that we send out. Certifications, however, have the embossed seal, which is the hand process. That's a raised seal as opposed to a depressed one. Mm -hmm. um, well, in any case, the word has got around that you want an embossed seal on every single certificate. And if that is true, <laughs> do we have problems? There is, I and mean, we can go to the, we can put a man on the moon, but we cannot get a machine <laughs> that will do an embossed seal in combination with an ink signature. Well, I assure you, I'm not. <laughs> well, then I won't go into the problems. All right, we can, furthermore, even if we get this machine, it's not automatic feed. <laughs> <laughs> and we've also discussed the possibility of doing the jukebox certificates on this, and I figured out that it would take 55 days of solid <laughs> <laughs> effort <laughs> to get all of our jukebox certificates out. All right. Um, well, I'm not. Uh, I'm. I'm really puzzled as to how this. Uh, I don't know. Well, got started. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't you even do know what you're saying. It. What is the difference between an embossed and a and a and it looks much better. Yeah. It's uh, classier looking, there's no doubt about and it. And what do we have now? We have a depressed seal. And uh <laughs> well, <laughs> and, and that's the that, yeah, okay, don't ask. Okay. <laughs> but you're you're saying we can have a depressed seal, but not an embossed. Oh yeah, yeah. in yeah. combination with an ink signature. Yeah. Right. Which we do have we're yeah. assuming that there is every reason to have an ink signature. <laughs> How about a raised signature? <laughs> oh, it's just insane. Yeah. Um, all right. That's depressing.
pressed, this is raised. <clears throat> well, I, I must say, I've uh, never confronted this problem before. <laughs> <laughs> In other words, it sticks out the bottom instead of the That's top. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay. Well, it, it, it does look better. It, there's no question. On the other hand, I'm well aware of the, uh, the, the uh, constraints. I was a, assistant register um, for, no, well, among other things, back in the 50s, I guess, or 60s, when uh, they did change over to a different machine, and I remember the problems then, and uh, I don't see any more. Is there any problem with a, a raised embossed signature? Does it have to be inked? Is there any legal significance one way or another? Does anybody have any feelings on that? Yes. Why, do you, why do you want to do that? Well, we can do it with one machine. They can make an embossing machine that will emboss the seal and emboss the signature underneath it. The only problem is it's going to significantly reduce the size of the seal. That's one operation. Well, in essence, we have one operation now. With, yes, right, with the ink signature. And with, the, with the ink signature and, and the depressed seal. 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 So if we if we merely change the dyes, we can go ahead and use this, use the same equipment we're using now, which has proven to be very reliable. Has and proved would, to be has proved to be reliable, reliable. In operation, and I certainly would hate would hate to uh, have some equipment problems. Well, I, likewise, I'm well aware that uh, we 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 could have a situation in which if, if we decide to go with a new seal and we're not really uh, prepared mechanically to deal with it, we'd have to do every one by hand for a while, and I just can't see. Burdening the office with that. The the law was written deliberately in a way that uh, makes the office seal the seal that we are using on the date the new law comes into effect. So we really have to have it ready if we're going to change. Um, look, I'm loose about this. You don't have any objection to a base signature, do you? I have no objection to anything. I'd, I'd like to have a decent uh, design, and I don't think what we've got now is very um, imaginative. I think it, it, it represents the wrong thing. It represents the artifact rather than the act of creation. And somehow I'd like to expand it beyond bound books, which is all this represents. A query, if we, if we get into the business of a raised signature, it would be raised but not inked, is this going to cause any problem for our clients when they start making Xerox copies and so forth within their own uh, business? Because the raised signature, for instance, might not uh, make a show. It, if it's not inked. Yeah. You think it would indica indicate that the, that the signature was there? I think you pick up the parts of yeah. it depending on photocopy. And you raise the point. Well, what people do, they take a piece of carbon paper or mm -hmm. something and highlight it. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't make that a determinative factor, although I suppose it should be considered. Well, any determining factor is as good as any other. Yeah. <laughs> well, it weights one side. Well, we all want to live forever, but we're going to, all of us are going to die, and when the register dies, uh, can you quickly make, make I, a, I sincerely a hope I retire before I die. <laughs> 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 I think retire. Okay, all right. Uh, uh, what, 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 I'm, what I'm saying is, can you quickly, con as quickly convert from a, a stamp signature with ink, uh, can't you more quickly convert that way That's than you could with a with a die because you'd have to, the die would have to be made by the die maker, which might or might not be a factor. It was it, there was a time as many of us know when the thing was actually printed on there. Uh, the register signature was part of the thing was printed. Yeah, I remember you were there too. Was anybody else? You weren't in the office, but uh, uh, Mary was when uh, you know. Uh, West Publishing printed the whole form, including the, the seal and the, and the and the register signature. And yeah. then Siegfried was acting for a while, so they printed up a whole batch with his uh, signature printed on that. This is really very funny. We suddenly started getting these things in after well, Fisher was appointed. Well, there any objection to pre-printing the, the register signature, not the seal, but the signature? But the problem was that, that uh, they kept using them after. Uh, yeah, after see the things coming years later. He was later. only acting for about a couple of months, and uh, that, that they kept sending them in for years after. That's right. Oh, that's yeah. We still get them with sandbags. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't understand the 
the impetus for, for change on, on the sig the way the signature is done now. I, I, could you explain that? Why there's a, is any desire or interest in changing the way the signature is to apply that? No, no, I'm not making a case for that. It's the, the certificate has got to bear the signature. It's a matter of the machinery, the combination of machinery, the combination of what we require for the seal and the signature that determines. No, I'm not making a case for that. My feeling is that we should stick as close as we can to the system we've got now, but redesign the seal. I, that's all I've ever really had in mind. And, uh, if we make it look better, fine, but I wouldn't <coughs> m mess up the machinery for, uh, for that. Well, we can get machinery for something like between $25,000 and $50,000, but we can use that Yeah, we can use it for something better. Something else. Okay. Right. Um, huh. However, well, let me not say this. It, it appears, well, if we go with the raised signature and the seal and the uh, signature over here, we've got big space problems on the certificate, which I was trying to minimize. But if we go with the depressed seal and the signature together, that solves that mm -hmm. problem. Fine. <coughs> All right, moving right along then uh, to the registration numbering system. We presently have 57 different numbering systems. Do I need to explain, <laughs> explain those to everyone? Uh, okay. Um, we seem to have survived with 57 different numbering systems, but the question is can we simplify and any by reducing the numbers and what are the uh, requirements of automation? And alternative <coughs> systems, you either have multiple registration systems, such as we do now, whether you have 57 or 24 or 32 really doesn't matter. The, the question is, shall we have a single numbering system or shall we have multiple numbering systems? <coughs> Largely at the request of uh, ISO, we began considering the uh, problem of a problems, possible problems in a single registration numbering system. And I'm glad to have here Dr. Stevens and our cameraman up there will, I hope, chime in and explain to me how, or explain to the group how uh, this is going to affect their particular operations. Basically, the single numbering system will begin on January 1st with works which are registered under the new law. There will be a classification, a letter classifier before the number, but the number will begin with one and it will proceed through 99,999,999. In other words, that's eight digits. How many years will that take us through? We figured about 100. 100 years. OK. Now, you can clearly see that um, you're, you're positive. Well, that would be positing. Uh, Less than that's a million a, a million year. year. I see. wouldn't. I don't know. That we'll have more than a million. Mm -hmm. Could be. Have you spoken to uh, CDF? Of course, when they set up the the new system for the old car division, on Carolina Distribution Service, they they there was a real problem with that numbering system when they got tied into it. Because they, they put the, the, the catalog distribution service, probably Jim Stevens uh, was involved in it, but it was a real problem in the, in the numbering system. They they re, they started running out of numbers, and we, and the library had to extricate itself, and uh, it caused quite a deal of confusion because the original estimate it would go on for many many mm -hmm. more years than, than than happened. On this system? No, I'm saying on on a numbering system, any numbering system, particularly if you're going to tie it in the machine. Automation. We're now registering about 400,000 a year. Yeah. Over that. Over that. Well, uh, 430. 430. 430. 30. Yeah, that, that sticks in my mind. And you're saying it's not going to double. And I'm saying it sure as hell is going to double. I think you need another well, digit there. Oh, all right. <laughs> That's all. Well, it's not going to well, what did you thought in a hundred years we'd start over again? So we start over. We start 50, over again. Fifty yeah. years right. we start yeah. over again, and right. would be some way of indicating when we start over. I mean, yeah. we have always. 
In other words, you go right on until you run out, and then yeah, you start, start over again. again. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. And at that point, um, use some prefix to indicate it's a new, s mm -hmm. a new series. You'd have to identify this in the series. Well, let me get this straight now. Um, everything would be numbered uh, sequentially, but there would be uh, an extra added letter indicia to indicate yes. the class. Yes, we would have classification. It would be an A, two, three, four. Yeah, right. And how many of those would there be? Classification. 57? Oh, no. No. <laughs> okay. I'll get to that. Okay, you'll get to that. All right, okay. fine. Um, all right. Uh, it would have to work, I think, this way. All right, well, let me point out first that Lee Foley is the one that has to deal with these 57 different numbering systems. And Lee, of course, is delighted that uh, with the idea that we could reduce the numbers, the number of different sets that he's having to work with in terms of statistics every day. It's not without problems. Uh, but let me explain how it would work. Um, it depends upon batching. Theoretically, you could have an A, one, two, three, four, an A, a B, one, two, three, five, uh, M, one, two, three, six, et cetera, but it shouldn't work that way. It will depend on batching within the examining, when a work has been cleared in examining, I would hope to have technicians batch in given numbers of, uh, in an X number of copies or, or claims for the work, uh, 10, 15, 25, 100, or whatever seems easiest. Lee would then be able, if he knew that we were going to batch uh, 20, 40 Bs in one particular <coughs> set, then he would assign the next 40 numbers in the sequential series to one of his numbering clerks. That numbering clerk would do those 40 Bs uh, with the numbers that he was assigned so that there would be 40 numbers in a row which would have B prefixes. Uh, then we were planning to retain the batching until they got the cataloging, which was going to ease the cataloging burden. Um, now, there was a problem, and I want to ask Dave and or Dr. Stevens to comment on all of the uh, discussion we went through on how this was going to affect the CCE. Uh, Dave, I, well, why don't you state your, your problem with it? The biggest problem that I first saw was uh, accountability of the records. Um, right now, you can tell at a glance where there's a missing number in a particular catalog because the number is supposed to start with a certain number and go to a certain number lot certain ones all along for different classes and have these natural gaps in your entry. Um, so I was seeing that at the time we we gathered these records together to publish them, that you have problems accounting for and if a number is missing, how do you know why it's missing? Is it missing because it's another class or is it missing? Okay. Um, the the uh, counter argument to that was okay, we'll assemble all the records sequence uh, irrespective of classes and will count for ones which are really missing uh, that way. My reservation for that is you're talking about two things really. First of all, you're talking about a half a million records at one time. Right now, the most that we accumulate for any, even for our largest catalogs is 100,000. So I'm, I'm really wondering whether a computer can handle half a million records comfortably at one time. Fine if everything goes well, but as we know from experience, uh, things happen uh, and uh, you have to recover. You have to recover half a million records uh, on really one. Uh, the second reservation I had about that was uh, if you assemble all your records at one time, you're assuming that your publications are timed will have to be published at the same time. Okay, suppose your larger catalogs, you have to extract with a shorter period or for a longer period. What do we do about those few records? How do we account for gaps in those few records as opposed to the, the entire record? Uh, Bob Long from ISO and I have talked about this. And he doesn't see it as a problem. He thinks he can. Uh, it's 
satisfactory list that comes in the piece of evidence. So what it comes down to is we're dependent on his list of individual units and uh, we're vulnerable uh, to that extent. Don't we have a similar problem with our application record books there too on the next one? Will we continue to file those by category? No. No, they'll be purely sequential. It wouldn't be by category. So this would be quite an economy for that operation. The only, there, there is a, a comment that came up with regard to that too. Uh, if somebody has, say they're doing a, a publisher search like this for Kato, uh, where they, they go through applications of, of a particular class, say they're uh, somebody from the public representing the music industry, uh, and they want to search through the music applications, say, to extract, to come up with a publisher's list or some such thing. Well, now these music applications will be scattered across the entire set of boxes on the shelf, and they wouldn't be able to go to just the music ones. They would have to go to, uh, or it would be impossible to do a search like that. Now, maybe uh, you could do a search through the computer Actually, um, you're really talking about mailing lists, which we, our regulations forbade up until recently, and I'm not sure we need to worry about accommodating people in that for that kind of motivation. But are there other reasons why this what, is? What, a, what he's really bad. talking about is the use of being able to search by using <coughs> the bound and loose applications. In other words, it's a isn't a choice between uh, grouping the material by its nature or category as opposed to the, the, this business of the uh, sequential numbers as an economy in terms of uh, uh, system control. Right. Gail, I'd be interested in hearing, aside from automation, what the office has to gain from changing the numbering system. What is the impetus behind it? Well, you, you put your finger on it. Yeah, primarily it, it was uh, Bob Long makes a very strong case from his point of view for the simplicity of creating a system based on a single numbering system, a single series of numbers. Uh, we approach, I, I, <coughs> we're not treating on, we're not allowing him to dictate this to us, but we, we went through each process in the system to try to determine the disadvantages. We, except for what Dave has mentioned, we haven't come up with serious disadvantages in terms of how we operate on a day. How about the advantages aside from automation? Are there no? Um, <coughs> yeah, well go. <laughs> go. At the uh, at the tail end of things when people are are assembling the registrations in preparation for binding, uh, if you have Separate subgroups, you have to retain them in separate files, and then you have problems of when are you ready to bind this particular group? And uh, oh, I'm it's well more, aware of that. It's much you more can, efficient when you you can accumulate for years and years in and a small not get plant. to anything in a small mm -hmm. plant. And when you do that, of course, the you open yourself for loss. You lot not that other stuff gets very dull here by the time it's uh, been around. The damage is damaged. Yeah. Some of that could be solved by having larger categories, by changing our categories. Well, one I guess, thing I guess my concern yeah. really is that uh, I'm concerned from what I've heard and, uh, is that we're letting automation uh, take the leading role here. And I think uh, from what I can see, and I haven't talked to Bob Long in depth with this, but it doesn't seem to me uh, that a numbering system is nice for automation, but it's not, it's not crucial. Uh, I no, he'll admit that, yeah. I would think that uh, the overriding thing should be what works well for this office, and then uh, and call automation and see how see how put that in as a secondary consideration. Because under this system, uh, in terms of searching for this material and physically locating information about this, it, it has to be completely dependent on retrieval through the automated system. Is that what you're speaking about? Otherwise, you can't uh, you can never go in and find an application that pertains to a certain type of work, you know, as you said, rippling through the material uh, at a given period of time. The
patent office has a sequential thing that goes back to the beginning of the patent mm -hmm. system. 1836, yeah. And you really can't tell anything from the patent number. Uh, that's, I suppose, if you know the series, you know you can gauge generally what the uh, uh, year is, but only in a very general way. Um, there is another factor, Jim. I, go ahead. I don't, you know, addressing your comment about making it easier for mm -hmm. I really don't see where it makes it easier for Lee. Um, I think he's got a lot more work to, to handle and juggle those numbers in a one system <coughs> and assign them to a separate class. I mean, you're going to have a one, you're going to have a one numbering system, but under that, you've got to have these various categories. Uh, I do think that we want to have a, a broader category and fewer than 57 separate uh, classes. But I don't see where it really well, on, on balance, on balance and registration numbering, I think it would have really no practical effect as far as workload because we have to account for numbers now in a number of different classes. And under the system, we've looked at, uh, at this proposal, and uh, Lee would be parceling out blocks of numbers to registration clerks who would be handling classes and materials. So we're still having to account for numbers. It's just a difference in the way we're doing it. Okay. Yeah. We, are, we are in the process system, and, and I, I guess I hate to see a lot. Uh, determined on the basis of what the <coughs> registration and numbering because we have some, we have tentative plans, which we think we're trying to find ways of, make, of changing that all around under the in-process system. And one idea we just coined with, and uh, I guess I think maybe has an even chance, but our friends in ISO think they have a pretty good chance of having some form of a machine hooked up to, uh, hooked up to our computer that can assign numbers straight away and slap it on something, either, either on a tag or on some flat material, flat piece of material. And the numbers could just be going, could be going sequentially or not. It wouldn't really matter. And they could assign the class too, right then and there. Yeah. So the statute wouldn't be needed in that case if we could well, do that. Well, we're talking about the manual system. I mean, you're not ready to go on January 1st. Well, but we're designing, no, no. But if it was something that was awkward for a year or two, and then we're, if we change our numbering system based on, completely on our manual system for the next year or two, is, is that wise? When we have a system that's gonna last for how many years? Let's state it in another way. We're trying to establish a system that can be dovetailed into your in-process system when, when it does occur. Well, I, I just have two thoughts. One, one argument one way and one the other. <laughs> show my nobleness of mind. Uh, <laughs> uh, one, the, 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 more no, the more numbers you get strung out, I believe the, the more chance there is of, of, of uh, errors in transcription and transposition of numbers. Uh, on the other hand, uh, having one system of numbers uh, and running as high as those do, uh, you would have less likelihood of two works Bear, same works bearing the same number, which is a little bit of a uh, problem once in a while to, today uh, because we only get up to a, a certain point and then we start all over again with B's, for example. You and go as far as six digits. Yeah, right, and you would go much higher, right. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's one one, one way, one the other. I take it that what's going to emerge from this is the, that these arguments will be marshaled on a piece of paper and submitted to the decision. Well, that's group. what I was going to suggest. Yeah. It's obviously it's very controversial, and I think you ought to get it in writing and maybe an alternative proposal and give it to everybody. We'll give it to everybody on the staff to react to, including yeah. the BSO group. Yes, um, absolutely. Okay. Can we separate out things like the idea of having more digits? I think that's going to be a good, we can make a good case for that regardless of whether we. Uh, have continuous uh, numbers between classes or not? Is there a separate issue? Uh, I think Gail's aware of this too. Any of these numbering systems will have a strong effect on the storage and access to the depositories. Yeah, and so that right. if we change the numbering system, it also involves changing the, the storage right. system. Uh, Tim, didn't you and Mike think that the what she was going to propose would aid um, Pickett Street? I think that mainly Mike and I think you'll talk to Neil too, since I'm not that familiar with what's going on in Pickett Street. I kind of deferred that to people who actually work down there. And we did have one discussion with Neil about it, and he, he, he seemed to feel that it wouldn't be any big problem, but it would involve a change over of the system. Right. And I have, I have talked with Bob Long at some length about this, and he has prepared, uh, based on the, these discussions, a proposal uh, that would help us in, in inventory control, really? in determining what is there. Not only that, but in, in determining its locations, uh, letting us track uh, with, I think, a, a very small amount of difficulty. 
on where copies are that have been withdrawn from deposit copy storage. And so, uh, but his proposal can uh, can operate uh, independently of the type of numbering system that is set up. Uh, sure, it's going to involve some changes out there. I, I was going to make this very point. The one thing that we're going to have to have that would be essential would be an accurate listing and sequential number of all items by class so that we can know what we do and don't have and what we should and shouldn't have. Uh, well, I assume that this would be easily obtainable from the in-process record. But again, since the point, since the point, well, I'm not talking about in-process, of course, we're talking about next January and February of next year. Yeah, true. Um, and he assures me that it could be available at that time. <coughs> but we are, again, at the mercy of the computer. He being Bob. 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 Do you we have a retrieval system on the carpet by the end of the year? When we're also, when we're, when we also have some problem, we can get the whole carpet up as it is? <laughs> <laughs> This okay. is why I think we need to get it in writing and let them react to it in writing. Yeah, I think this mm -hmm. is quite urgent, Bob. You said the word urgent. Uh, I would urge a, uh, <laughs> a, a deadline. Could, could you establish a deadline for Gail and a deadline for... Well, we talked about deadlines group. this morning. <coughs> I, agreed we really I think we're in agreement uh, that Gail's got the most, most urgent uh, problem. You don't want to establish deadlines in matter. Well, I'm, I, I don't feel confident off the top of my head. To I think Gail deadline. would have to say if she's ready to put it in writing. Oh, yeah, I can get me a typist. I'll have it by Monday. <laughs> <laughs> That's the hardest of all. <laughs> <laughs> Mark. <coughs> just, just one thought to, to Gail. In your investigations, have you, uh, have you uh, or were you able to determine the registration delays that might result in this patching? In other words, the batching is basic to, to this new numbering scheme. So what about the delays that might be encountered in registering? If you had to set aside a, a group of numbers for small categories, for example. Well, we would simply set aside smaller groups of numbers for small categories. The, the A material and the B material, of course, come through in vastly larger quantities than two J's, for example. But the whole point of it, So that sizable you segments in one category. Well, right? they don't have to be necessarily sizable. They just Lee has to know that here he's got forty or fifty or a hundred Bs, so that he can assign that many numbers to a number of clerk. Well, for example, uh, suppose you were to say, well, we'll, we'll set aside fifteen. Be um, useful as a result of this discussion for people with questions like this now to send them to Gail in writing. Certainly, I think so. I think we could go on all day on this. Yeah, yeah. I believe we, we really have to get move past on. this point. Um, we have. I think we've covered everything in your item, Big Roman One, except the last thing. I don't know. We want to. Uh, uh, I, no, I, let me defer on that one. All right, let's do. Okay, let's go on to two then. All right. All right, we will have a classification system. We never considered not having a classification system. Uh, let me uh, see, run me down. All right, class A will be literary works, including what we currently consider to be book material, and I would very much like to phase out our use of book material, book, the word book has caused a great deal of difficulty, misconception in the past, so we'll call them literary works. We can call them non-dramatic literary works if we want to, but that does seem a bit pretentious. Well, why not include the dramatic works in them? I've got other plans. All right. <laughs> Well, you got you got to say non-dramatic if you're not going to include them, because they certainly are literary. That's that's a, that's a fundamental uh, semantic difference that's drawn throughout the statute, and I think we couldn't yeah. ignore it in what we did. All right, um, class B will be serials, which include periodicals, and this is uh, done at well not at but uh, with. Dr. Stevens, who has ideas.
process of combining in a single catalog serials and periodicals, which are serials. Would you like to sketch your reasons for that? In three sentences? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, in the first place, uh, there are economies in cataloging and there are efficiencies. One of the problems that Lila Beth has pointed out recently is that the same serial title appears in the CCC in a variety of forms. Um, if we handle serials, if we do periodicals, this means we will set up a standing title and the new registrations get listed under that title. If the title changes, of course, we have to change it to make the <coughs> second uh, reason is to uh, to get us compatible with the rest of the world. Uh, LC Serial Record handles both serial and periodical material. All of the major union listings combine both. Uh, there are standard definitions, and those are, are uh, reprinted in the House. efficient for us, it's, it's more efficient for the users. Uh, Waldo is nodding his head, he has thought a lot about this. Well, for the, 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 helpful the, it would be. for the sake of the general discussion, could you give an example of a periodical that's not a serial or vice versa? Time Magazine is periodical. Uh, that is not a serial. Would it? Uh, yes, well, it no, is. no, wait a minute, serial is the generic term. All right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In other words, every periodical is a serial, but right. not every serial. Not every serial. Right. Who's who in America is a serial. Yeah. Um, there has to be some regularity to the publication, but it doesn't necessarily have to be issued in a subscription and through the usual. Regular yeah. periodic intervals of less than a year. It can be annual, it can be biannual. Right. There's an implication of continuation. Would you do law books and Loose leaf services, the whole range of that kind of thing. You do get into some problems with things like travel guides. That's, uh, is it a serial or isn't it? They issue a new edition every year. Doesn't the ISSN and the ISBN enter into this? Well, of course, that enters too. Uh, the serials, when at the moment, they aren't assigning ISSNs to annual. Ultimately, they may, but there is that natural yeah. Yeah. Librarians are are uh, trained to make the distinction between serials and non serials through some serial decision process, aren't they? Yes. To, to which everybody uh, uh, can advert to, to make a decision in a particular case. Well, I don't mean to bog us down on this. I think it's kind of interesting. Why don't you go on? Um, Class B, Form BB, I've always found very distressing. We've had this problem of is it a BB or if it's a drama, should we register it in Class D? Or if it's music, should it be E? If it's a poem, shouldn't it be A? Um, I'd really like to do away with contributions to periodicals altogether, except that we didn't have this little problem in the law, the group registrations. I would like to make a, a subclass BB applicable only to multiple contributions to <coughs> periodicals. If we have a single contribution to a periodical, it would be registered in the class that it would normally fall into, regardless of, of its form, of, of, of whether it appeared in the periodical or not. Reserve this one particular subclass for dealing with the multiple contributions, and therefore we can design a special form for that subclass that will allow for the group registrations. Um, yeah, uh, within reason. Uh, whether you put it under B or under some uh, or A or some other category, I, I, it doesn't seem to me all that map to make that much difference. You do have to deal with it separately, there's no question about it. <coughs> um, I 
it is contributions to periodicals. Yes, it's it periodicals. Periodical. Yeah. Um, all right, before I go on, I will say that um, we attempted to keep the classifications, uh, the, the letter designator, as close to what the public is accustomed to as possible. However, here I come to the first change. What we presently know is Class C lectures, dramas, uh, or I mean, uh, lectures, addresses, and sermons, and this sort of thing, unpublished material uh, prepared for oral delivery before an audience. I've moved out of Class C. It will come later. Okay. Class C instead would be choreography and pantomime. Class D. Wouldn't the other material of now come from C would that be under A? Well, it, yeah, it could be one of two places. It could be under A or my class D includes dramatic, dramatico musical, and oral works. It's a performance work, primarily. It is non dramatic literary text also. I guess that's just a trade off. We put it somewhere, and I don't see really strong reasons for one place or another. Well, the rights are different. Yeah, they are. Yeah. Yeah. The so rights are different for like things like dramas, performing kinds of, of works, as opposed to non-dramatic literary. And with the A ones, if they went for the non-dramatic literary stuff, it, the rights are a little bit clearer. Uh -huh. I, don't know. I would, I would be inclined to agree. Let's not make any decisions. No. Uh, but um, you would put them with the non-dramatic. I think I think you if you're going to make classifications at all, you have to follow the the, 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 the framework of the law, and it's quite radically changed in some areas. And I think this is one of them. Um, I'm puzzled. Are we saying it should be with the performing works? No. 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 Not. It's, non it's it's non dramatic, and it is uh, the, the distinction is between non dramatic and dramatic literary works. And I would say. Uh, I also have some question about the necessity for a se separate class of choreography in pantomime, although I'd be willing Well, it's not a dramatic work. I mean, we, we're no longer concerned with the dramatic elements. We're not con we're considering it separate and apart from Oh, why not just have a, 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 a larger class and just lump it all together? Yeah. All right. just, I, I see a distinction because we've always been so involved in in drawing out the, the dramatic elements for choreography. We can only we've only been registering it if we can discern the... Well, why not have a class of dramatic works, choreography, and pantomimes and lump it all together? Well, I'm, this is what this, this meeting yeah, well, is I, supposed to do. Yeah. It's just to kick it around. I don't think we need to make any decisions. Well, I see. Stay with my... I, am very, I will say in a general way that I'm going to have great trouble with tiny classes. I think one of our biggest problems right. is, is all this line drawing, and I do want to okay. I do want to well, lump it together as much as we possibly you'll, can. You'll be happier as I get smaller. Okay. Class <laughs> <laughs> E is everything else. No. Class <laughs> E is music. What is D under your list? Under my list, D is uh, dramatic, dramatic or musical, and it would not or dramatic and dramatic or musical. That's uh, plays. Musical comedies, operas. Okay, e is music. Non dramatic music. Non dramatic mm -hmm. music. Um, well, that's a question I don't, we could go on for the rest of the day. When, when music, what is the distinguishing line between dramatic music and non dramatic music? And I'm still troubled with that. Is it for the purposes of classification? If it's not a dramatic or musical work, then you're sense of that uh, totally artificial term. It's music, and uh, it, it, the fact that it may have some dramatic aspects uh, in, in its content doesn't in any way make it a dramatic or musical work. What about some of the avant-garde works, though? <laughs> <laughs> we better move on. <laughs> uh, could, could I ask one more, one general question before yeah, we do? Sure. Uh, is any consideration being given to giving the classes some other designation rather than letters? Uh, because we are going to depart and we're going to have 
uh, uh, refraction between the, the, the seas, the new seas and the old seas, and the previous seas, which were something else still. Uh, would it be possible to give the classes numbers rather than letters or s some other designator? Well, we considered this, and it's, yeah. it's largely a matter of making uh, departures as minor as possible from what we've accustomed ourselves and the public to. Well, let's test that as a philosophy. I'm not sure I necessarily agree with it. I'm afraid if we're going to make changes and we keep it too close, it's, it might be more confusing. This is, this is something that I'd rather, I'm willing to entertain the idea of just starting over from scratch. I'm not necessarily wedded in any way to double, them. double letters like AA, DD. We already had them. We have had, we've had them. <laughs> you name it, we've had it. <laughs> or then a combination of the letter and a number for the new. We've had that too. We have. Indeed, we have. Everything's been done. Yeah. Except, <laughs> except pure numbers, I think. <laughs> then we had the number be a uh, Roman Six. number. Mm. <laughs> 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 yeah, that that presents a problem. Computer out of here. Computer out of here. No, the trademark side, the uh, patent office classifies on the number they bases do. and not exactly. on the bases. Exactly. By class. And they don't do that. Well, I think if we go to go to eight digits or nine digits, it's pretty clear that it's under the new system. That's one key. Too. Are there any advantages uh, in assigning the letters to be more mnemonic? It's possible. Than we are now. It's possible. Like class L for literary works, or class P for phonorecords, um, records and that, that sort of, or S for sound recordings, or something of that nature. I have. Uh, well, let me throw this out. As I don't know whether any consideration has been given to working the year into the day into the number at all. This isn't classification yeah, uh, in the century. We dealt sense. with that, and apparently the LC catalog number has the year, the end of the century. Yeah, it doesn't do us any good. Yeah. Because <laughs> at the beginning of it, it's, it's, it's confusing. Yeah. We didn't, did not want to confuse with the LC yeah. catalog number. My objection to <coughs> the L for literary works and so on was the educational public. You know, they've been used to L for motion pictures for so long. And you know, that was my that was my step back a lot. And I personally I personally agree. Yeah. You know. Yeah, but some have, stuff is gonna be uh, well obviously we're gonna have things that are falling into different classes. If we stay too close to what we've got now, I'm afraid it's gonna be very are there any letters we have never used, like Q, for instance, oh, or something yeah. of that yeah. nature, that, that uh, we, we could that we that no that, that we could apply <laughs> that we could apply as as a suffix? Let's mm. say maybe from now on everything be AQ, why or something like that? Just just to make the distinction. That's all. If, well, if people feel a distinction, has to be the fact made. is that Gale at least has started from the position that uh, in some ways you're going to assign letters that some relationship, at least a general relationship, between what the public is aware of. What we're going to establish in the system has a relationship, and the assumption is that it's not going to confuse the public. I'm not quite sure what the assumptions are underlying the rest of what I've heard here. Uh, I'm not, and I'm not at all clear what are what are the real reasons for a classification system, and what are the most important reasons in designing any classification system. Um, I mean, one factor is the one that seems to be to have been decisive in assigning of particular letters. What if what was an A under the 1909 law is still going to be an, an A you know, under your system. And it begins to break down around C. I, the problems that we've had in relationships between A and B uh, under present practice don't seem any worse under what you've suggested than what we're going to do now. But I would be curious to, to hear uh, I mean, what are the factors that should go into design? Well, I, I think one of the points, and certainly with Gail and I talked about idea that these classifications meant different application designs. And in other, in other words, we were trying to capture as, as much similar information on different applications. And, that, and this was, this is, this is a type of grouping that they were trying to make. And of course, in terms of subject matter, there are reasons that one may want to be in one classification rather than another. I think that is the one of the controlling factors, whether you call it a, an A or a Z, I think that's, uh, that's, Again, a problem of education in the public, but that clearly these, you know, these letters or whatever are going to be different. Well, we do have, I, let's start with the basic question. Do we have to have a classification system? 
and I think that's what Lou is asking. Well, I, merely, I can't see how merely, we can adu- avoid having yeah, some merely, like merely to Yeah, <laughs> if we, if we start out with the premise that you cannot have one application to cover all the different uh, possibilities, now you, now we're moving on to what are the, what, what applications can cover, fewest number of applications can cover the greater amount of work, and what and, and then group those uh, works around the, the information that you wanted to put on the, the application. Well, I'm not sure that the application is all that determinative. What would be determinative of, uh, for me would be the points that have already been mentioned, cataloging and, uh, and copy retrieval. Moreover, we've got to have accounting and statistical information that uh, uh, couldn't possibly be lumped together. We've got to be able to tell in... in uh, well, all of those things can be done after the material is received here. That's right. All right, I'm, I'm suggesting to you that uh, the application for that group contribution to periodicals may be totally different from an A. That's possible. And so because of that, you want a different application form. Uh, right. In terms of uh, controlling it, uh, numbering series, and this business, that, that's, that's for the convenience of the copyright office and, and making it uh, available to the public at the end of the process. But initially, the question is, uh, how, do you aim, how do you direct the public to choose one application rather than another? Has the the early concept of a single application form without any classification and classifying it only for an internal purposes when it comes to the office been abandoned? I don't no, know. No, it's not been abandoned. But this is certainly this like is certainly this is certainly uh, what this is leading toward. I mean, in other words, if you have a single application, obviously, uh, or a burden of a few, uh, you, you place a greater burden on the uh, individual to explain exactly what the nature of his work is. And in, in well, I think you can have problems on the other side. That Section 102 sets out certain categories of works, and the House reports is very clearly they can be overlapping. Somebody has a piece of choreography that's fixed in motion pictures. They submit it to motion pictures or work of choreography. That's, that's exactly one of the problems. Well, in, in a way, the application that you submit with the copy is, is the starting point of determining what's being registered. It routes the material. It routes the material. Exactly. So we want it to continue to do that. Well, but think the problem if, if every piece of material that was received had to go to some classifier who would classify what, what it was and send it to the appropriate section. And but maybe it's easier for us to do that than we have to, yeah. have to do it. Well, it would mean, it would mean uh, on, on some sort of preliminary type of examination. Whereas we ought to be able, as you mentioned, we ought to be able to cover the situation in which we're there are several different types of claims, different types of works that are being protected in on a single registration. Obviously, applications have to be able to accommodate that situation. But in the vast majority, a work may fall into one general area. So uh, if we have a system in which there is no uh, indicator, uh, that means that someone has to sit down and make that determination before you even uh, do the rest of the examination process. I would, I would certainly let, let me uh, let me try it this way. I don't think it makes that much difference whether you call something A or E. I, I, I think to, to, to try to single in on the groups that we're going to decide uh, to, to divide our workload up into is more important. And I, I don't have any problem with what you've been suggesting with some minor variations. You're saying literary works are non-dramatic literary works. You're saying serials as a separate category. You're saying Dramatic and dramatical musical, maybe with or without choreography and pantomime in them, maybe separate, maybe, maybe, uh, and then non-dramatic music, whatever that is. Let's go on, and we'll, we'll assume that we are going to have this kind of breakdown. I don't see how we could conceivably do without some kind of breakdown. Does anybody feel that we could just lump everything together and go? Well, I think it's one thing we have to know from my angle anyway, is when we provide this information that's in the file or whatever the end product is that we work with, Search. I think we've got to know what it is that we're reporting to the people uh, because they're going to ask. You know, if there's no class designator or no way to tell, uh, they're not going to know whether this thing that we're reporting to them that appears under the name or the title or whatever okay. Okay. is a book or a piece of music or a drama okay. or whatever. You know, so I think that has to also be taken into 
Well, I think I'm, I'm really, uh, what I'm saying is that I agree with yeah. you, that yeah. within right. some kind of uh, yeah. framework, but does it matter that much whether it's foreign or domestic? Does it matter no, that I much don't. whether it's a reproduction of a work of art or a print or pictorial illustration? That kind of distinction seems to be totally artificial. If you can figure out a large category, that, that really you're better off, I think, no, I, than I, these I agree fine distinctions. I do think we have to have some kind of designator, even if you have to, to run under one number and then put an identifier as to what it is in a description. Well, this is sort of the way you're coming out. Right. Right. Whatever. May, may I clarify yeah. one thing? Gail, does your proposal uh, take care of subsisting copyrights? You're not suggesting to, that we continue the present system for subsisting? No. Okay. That's, well, that's another. I know. <laughs> no, okay. I'm not. Uh, basically, and I, I can go into this in a little more depth later, we had just simply got to. Right, I, I chop agree. it off on January 178. Mm -hmm. And everything will go into the new class. So a, work just a work published before would come in under the new system. Right. Under the new, yeah. But uh, the application may have to be different. Yeah. May not. No, it may not. Uh, the thing is that uh, the, what new about application, the, the new application, the new application, the new application will contain all of the information that would have been required on an old application. It will contain, in most, in some cases, more information than we would have required prior to. January 1. One way to handle it, the one that uh, strikes me as most obvious, is that if information on the new application uh, that did not, uh, if we have an omission in information on the new application that did not appear on an old application, we would not require it. Did, did I state that correctly? Mm -hmm. If there is an element on the new application that would not have been required, for registration of a work published earlier, then we would not. Well, we can we probably. Huh? We we could if we want. We're you getting over it. We can not. Not. No, no, we you mean, want to? You mean that its omission will not uh, delay, delay. 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 registration? But if it's filled out. Oh yeah. Yeah. Sure. Let's save application forms until we're finished with the, with this other. Dick, did you want to say something? I just wondered if someone wants to register as dramatic rights, non dramatic work. Are we registering A or D? Because we're going to do this visibility now. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> uh, no, it's not uh, a dramatic work. That's, that's the conclusive the thing. The, the work itself, itself is not a dramatic work yeah, that we registered in A or whatever you want. Even though the rights is registered okay. in well, you're raising another question that we yeah, haven't resolved, and that is, are we going to register multiple claims yeah, in the well, same work? Yeah, that's right. that. And I don't think we are. And that's not oh, something we're going to discuss today. Okay, we got to move on. Oh. Okay. All right. Uh, class F. F. Yeah. yeah. Class right. F are maps, uh, including atlases, uh, globes, celestial maps, and projections, and this sort of thing. We have got to be able to identify F material separately because, uh, look, uh, correct me if I don't state this correctly, the, the one we published, the one collection of. <coughs> The one catalog for maps in the world, country, whatever. We have subscribers to the catalog who want only class F material, present class F material, map material. That is not conclusive as far as I'm concerned. No, I mean, you can, you can determine that at, at the end of the process. Yeah, sure. Right. So there are two, no, no, well, there are two ways of handling it. If, as long <coughs> as we can pull out what are maps, so we don't have to call it class F mm -hmm. precisely, but as long as we can pull them out for purposes of identifying just cartographic material in a catalog, we can do it easy. We can lump them together right. into class G, which I would like to call, having been through I think every conceivable combination, I would like to call it fine and applied arts. It's not graphic arts, graphic and applies to why not use the statutory phrase? Pictorial, graphic, and sculptural works and lump everything together. That's, boy, that's what I had in mind. Okay. <laughs> All right. And this would include possibly maps, works of art, reproductions, technical drawings, photographs with the exception of film strips, prints, um, and commercial prints. Right. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, 
motion pictures and film scripts, this again, this we would, I think, call class L. There were catalog uh, considerations for putting motion pictures in combination with film scripts only. I believe, am I right? Right. They would prefer to have those two together in one catalog. And there's no reason why we can't. They're, they're images in the same a film strip. Well, I'm, I'll, I'm waiting to hear what you do with Mokanese. Uh, I would, well, okay. Ann, I have skipped Ann. All right, Ann are sound recordings, which we will continue to handle separately. All right, back to Ann. Multimedia is a problem. And I, I can make recommendations, but I really wish to have some guidance on whether we can treat them as collective works whether we can register a sound recording and other material on one application, whether we could put two numbers on one application, whether we should have separate applications with the same number. Um, have any ideas? I'd address it with trouble if it's actually the involves collective works just because it publishes by the same case. got a big problem. by rights, and the whole significance of administrative classification with respect to rights seems to be just from the top of the proverbial head. Uh, a little trouble. We don't have to. No, we don't. Uh, I, know, I know we don't, but we are. But uh, I also That's don't think that we should decide it on the basis of what our catalog subscribers yeah. want either. And uh, there seems to be that sense. But I, but I think, Barbara, though, that that, that that should be a fact. It should be a fact. You no. You did mention right up front remembering you know, service to the public, and uh, there certainly is a very vocal public for card drafting materials. How many subscribers do we have? That I don't know. It's in the hundreds. Yeah. It's good. Uh, well, I'm not suggesting the, that we not publish you know, the catalog. Some of these but, areas, yeah. we are the one overall national yeah. bibliography with these categories of materials. Motion pictures is a good example of cartographic materials. Uh, sound recordings is immensely. Um, we, from oh, just a quickly related comment. If if we lump certain of these things under larger classes, with an attempt to sort them out at the end of the process, mm -hmm. we run a risk of omission. omission. If, the, if the if the if the depositor identifies something as being cartographic or some other uh, nature primarily, that apparently is a designation he would like to see applied to it, and we might take a look at that and just borderline make a judgment of the whole thing. I'm, but we, we broke this off in the middle of discussing <coughs> multimedia works. So, uh, do you feel you need more guidance there? Yeah. Well, uh, frame your question. Um, well, uh, base, I was lead, or my mind was leading toward treating them as collective works. With a, even though we've got a sound recording and text, to give them a single registration. Well, are you thinking of a separate class for collective works? No, not necessarily. But well, I don't know what. Multi uh, I mean, a multimedia work would be a work is nearly always a work with a sound recording and with other material as well, either text or graphic or this sort of thing. Can we treat that as one single work with individual parts? Well, <laughs> could I frame? I think this may be a <laughs> Do we 
do we treat a multimedia work as a single work, or do we attempt to identify its part around, you know, around the, uh, the various rights it may, may have made for the first part? The jury spelled out more on two, which I think is still Well, that's the question. <laughs> In other words, uh, for the convenience of the individual who wishes, wishes to apply, you have a single application, he identifies all the parts. Now, for the purposes of a pure record, do you, uh, for our records, uh, we, do we uh, identify the A part, uh, the textual expression, the non dramatic literary part? And I, I think that's something we can lay down as a basic principle, that uh, we, we're not, for artificial reasons, we're not going to require more than one registration. If they want to make more than one registration, I, they should be able to. So it's possible to make a, a single registration for a multimedia work? Including sound recordings? Yes. Okay. One thing to bear in mind, though, as I said originally, call it whatever you want for our purposes, don't use the term collective work. No, no. For a very simple reason. One contributions to collective works can be made works made for hire simply by agreement. And if you imply that any one of these is a collective work, then the authors are going to be screaming. Well, I don't. I don't really understand why it's relevant, whether it's collective or not, which I is a word of art. I don't think, I don't it, think is it is. All we're concerned purposes. about is the nature of the work for purposes of getting it through the office. I'm and just suggesting the, we don't use the phrase collective work. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm much of one, one, one big question, of course, if uh, our kids are around, I don't know what it means. Gail and I have talked about this. It's in uh, 408C, uh, Administrative Classification is an option of positive. And it's the second sentence, which begins, the regulation may require a permit for a particular class of deposit then by the material of copies of phone records. Deposit only one copy of phone record where uh, two would normally be required or, and this is the place, a single registration for a group of related works. What are you going to do with that? What, <laughs> is, what is our policy going to be in defining the term related, related works? And how, and, you know, in view That's of, for our convenience. In in view, and and it's where, in it's where we want to do it. Yeah, but in view of what we've done with the contributions to periodicals and the second the next, the next unit, the group registration of the country. We really only have one unity there, and that is the, the author, the claim is exactly the same. Well, you know the history of that. Yeah. Uh, this was intended to accomplish exactly that, and more besides. On the other hand, the authors, in uh, being willing to stand still for the fee increase, insisted that this be put into both the fee bill that we then had in Congress and also the new law on the theory that this made it obligatory on the office to give this privilege. This is the one case where we have to do it. We can do it anywhere else we want to. All right, what I'm, what I'm suggesting you know, under the concept of group of related work is that we try to establish, it, uh, we try to restrict that group as, as much as possible by making more uh, unities, I mean, you know, uh, claimant or whatever. We certainly have that privilege. It's yeah. entirely up to us. Well, is it solely for our convenience? Because that's certainly not the word coming from the public. Uh, reading card manufacturers have, have been running up to me. Uh, well, one we've talked about, and I sent you the memorandum, which probably is a good illustration of where we can do it, is the uh, multiple editions of the same newspaper published on the same day. Let so me make it very clear. We don't have to do it any, oh, at all. The only places in which we have to do it are those that are identified in that uh, the, the, the renewal and the group uh, registrations for contributions. Would we handle it on a case-by-case -case basis? Well, we don't have to. If we can identify areas in which... Uh, I, I, one, one thought we had, I had, was portrait photographers, where we had a long go-round and worked out a deal <laughs> with them. And this would legitimize exactly that sort of thing. But, where, you know, the kind of problems I see with this are, if, all right, we've already got uh, jewelry mentioned specifically. Trafari sends in 350 pieces of their spring line at one time. Does that mean we register 350 pieces of Trafari jewelry? Not unless we want to. And we, we could register. We, we, we could be, if we wanted. The choices would be that they would, they would have to have one identifying title, and for that purpose, that might not be what they would want. 
we could we we could say that if you submit your entire spring line a wide variety of pieces, it's not but sufficiently related in one way or another to well, take it on one But if they that submitted is. 26 uh, 26 letters of the alphabet and charm form. There is legislative history on this which suggests it's not only for our convenience and does mention jewelry. If it says May, John. Yeah, it does say that. Mm -hmm. We don't give that. those three examples. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's not on the tape. <laughs> Burn the tape. Well, it, uh, I, I don't want to I will design an extra form if collective registrations are going to require individual subtitles. Gail, I think that I, I, I assume that what, what we're getting out of this talk is that the questions of are they are they not collective works, one application, two numbers, and whatever, it is basically that there are no, there are not necessarily any answers to that. That by and large, you you have freedom to make those decisions on, on where we should make those exceptions, where we shouldn't, based on the workflow considerations in light of the needs of specific industries. I wouldn't, uh, uh, I can't see having a separate class to deal with that. Uh, no, no, I don't plan that, but it would require a supplement to the application form, for example, if we were going to allow them to subtitle each of their works. I wouldn't worry about that at this stage. I think that's what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. At, you one, at, one point, at one point, you talked with John about um, the advisability or inadvisability of uh, going to some form of inquiry. Uh, no, but that was well, good. Well, I think oh. it's right to dismiss them. All right, okay, but do you? <laughs> the question of, now, of course, it came up in the context of trying to define related works. Well, now, let's forget about defining related works. Let's just talk about, generally, certain kinds of group registrations outside of the specific requirements of renewals and contributions. Uh, do you still think there's no validity in an inquiry? Too troublesome? I, I think I, I Pat, Pat and Gail have talked about it, and they think it's much too early. Everybody will ask for it. I think well, that's exactly. Pat's reaction. Exactly. Until we develop some concept of what the word related should mean for our own convenience, it's premature to start inviting what will be. We know what the answers will be. The publishers will say every work in a series, <coughs> and the uh, encyclopedia publishers will say every revision of an encyclopedia is related to another revision. Well, they're well, necessary today necessarily uh, there's a r relationship of one fee for one application. Will that necessarily have to be so under the new law? In other words, <clears throat> take a, a, a so-called group. There, the cataloging cost might be considerable, yet it might be perfectly logical for the man to file only one application and yet for us to charge him four fees. Is this a possibility or are we locked into a one-to-one? -one? We, we are locked into a one-to-one -one as far as registrations are concerned. There's but, nothing... Uh, magic about the, the form, and if you if it was more convenient to have four applications than producing one registration, I could conceive of that, although it seems a, a little unlikely. What you do have, though, is uh, a catch-all for special charges, and you mm -hmm. could charge if it, if it required additional work. Uh, I don't really see that kind of, I, it, I think to try to run something exceptional like that would be so much more expensive by itself that I, I can hardly see. Yeah, so. Could we think in terms of, a, of an audio-visual class which would be motion pictures, film strips, and multimedia? Film and strip with, with sound. With sound. Yeah, well, we could uh, and, again, uh, okay. and exclude from that sound recording. That's the way that the class is in the, uh, in the, in yeah, the lower we would, we would do it the same way we could do it for maps. We were concerned with your having to do the motion picture catalog if we could pull the motion pictures out from other audiovisual works. I we could do that. I think it was um, Mel who spoke to that in one of our meetings that they were very concerned uh, with keeping the motion picture catalog. Uh, we could combine them with audiovisual works, it's true, in the same classification system as long as they can be drawn out. thing is that everybody who has ideas about this folks are approving the Yeah, I, we're going to have to move on. It's nearly All right, uh, let, me, let me do it another way. Okay. Jim Bird.
Vassar and on my committee has been working on, we started out by proposing the idea of a single standard form. And I'm not sure whether it's my fault or not, whether I oversold the whole idea initially, but I am moving very strongly away from this. What you have here is a standard form. So please don't take this as, as the last word of my committee, but it is something for you to look at and work from. There are comments and implied questions in the, uh, the memo that he's attached to the, the top of it. Um, let me pass these and possibly at your convenience, take a look at them and uh, scribble down questions, comments, anything anyone All right. Um, oh, wow. Oh, there's so much. Um, uh, maybe, maybe just let me outline what I consider the most important questions. We don't even perhaps have to discuss them right now, but these are things that I would like some guidance on. The data creation, when we've got a work that may have been created individually. How do we define the date of creation? Should we allow for multiple dates of creation? Is there any significance one way or another? How do we handle works made for hire? And I think that's in um, one of my questions in this thing. Uh, I've asked John about this already, but uh, I'd like some sort of a definitive answer as to whether we ask for on the application an indication that the work is either joint or there is divisible authorship here. And I said no. You said no. Uh, group registrations we've already handled. Uh, foreign works, and this kind of spans all of spans both all registration, the classification, and the application. Um, I think we can do without a separate foreign classification, per se, but um, um, somebody brought up yesterday the problem of whether we're going to still have to retain foreign options because of some Iron Curtain countries. Oh, is that Ellen? Yeah. Do you know what I have to get talking about? Yeah, I, I was wondering what was going to be done about the option Bs that we have existing at the present time. Um, it's my understanding that there, there are several Iron Curtain countries that are not allowed to send currency outside. And uh, if that's the case and we don't retain that option, we, it's really crippling. Yeah, but the law doesn't retain the option. No. So I think that's settled. And uh, they can uh, make the arrangements. There are ways of doing okay. it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then um, I'm concerned about uh, optional deposit provisions for things like the works of art. And is whatever is decided on that aspect may may have ramifications for that part of the application that deals with optional deposit. Um, depends on what's decided there as to how we set up the, the application form. Um, questions plus the ones that appear in, in the, the handout that we have. Um, I think we all want time to look at it. Okay. Can we defer that or can we handle that in a smaller group somehow? Yes, I think uh, this is highly commendable. We do have something to look at and I think that's great. Um, obviously, I'm sure everybody at these tables has uh, uh, tons of questions and uh, suggestions when it comes to that. I think the coordinating committee after this meeting will have to sit down and figure out what to do with all the questions that are printed and that we're scratching out. I think we're going to have to do this we again. We may have to have another meeting. Well, I don't think we're going to possibly finish today. So mm -hmm. I think uh, that in itself is going to take care of some of it. But um, there's nothing more important than what we're doing than <coughs> this. And, right. uh, okay, well, let's think on that. Let me just then finish up by pointing out some of the you wouldn't believe the problems with the simple matter of application format. 
Uh, well, I guess my basic question, well, first of all, you, th this is, uh, let me try several things on you. Um, we've got to move on. Um, th there are several premises built into this. One is that you have one form. Uh, I'm assuming that we're, that is not settled by any means. No. And uh, in fact, in your own thinking, you're moving away from that. Okay. Number two, that you have all of, the, the form itself consists exclusively of blanks and that you have all the instructions separate. Separate, exactly. The it's, problem it's with that, as we well know, is that people don't read the instructions and they go and muddle through the form and uh, the you, you've got to be very careful about your headings or they're going to be misinterpreted. 409 requires so much more information than we're accustomed to and I mean, you can look at our present forms and see how crowded they are with instructions and if we've got to allow room for extra information so <coughs> something's got to go. Okay, but you're, you're this is my third point. You're basically <coughs> aiming on a one-page application. And do you no, have to no, do that? No, okay. okay. Right. Um, With supplements, but still basically. And the, the, the corollary to that is, are we going with this kind of unusual and cockamamie idea of the certificate being made by the applicant himself as a carbon copy or duplicate right. copy of the... the yeah, I mean, there, that's... I'm not, I'm not wedded to that. It's um, just rife with problems. Yeah. That, that it's, is it's, right it's terribly problems. constraining as far as the design of the application. The alternative is to have the applicant fill out the application portion only and then we issue the certificate. Now, the certificate must contain all of the information on the application plus the seal plus the effective date of registration. It's got to be identical to the application. Now, in terms of the information appearing on the certificate, now we can have people sit down and retype, but that's insane. Oh no, I agree. We can't um, do that. All right. <laughs> An alternative is to for us to photocopy the certificate, I mean the application, and attach the seal and the effective date and the signature, and that will be. The, uh, now I know that you had a go around two or three years ago with Buddy Brodowski on this very point. Well, it was in a different context, and it wasn't this point. It was in terms of uh, issuing additional certificates. issuing additional certificates, which would be photocopies of the application. And the application is not the certificate. We don't have a copy of the certificate. We've sent it out. And number one, uh, we could we could do that. On the other hand, uh, we're we're giving we're certifying as a certificate as a duplicate certificate something that is not a duplicate certificate. That, that this, this was a constraint which doesn't exist oh. now. See, okay. second, uh, I had some reservations about uh, the, the fact that photocopies are not permanent records, uh, but I I mean, that wasn't the fundamental problem there. Okay. I was willing to write into the uh, regulations. We had them all drafted. He just wasn't interested once uh, uh, th there were too many conditions attached. Right. Uh, that uh, the, um, the we, we would say we're not passing judgment on whether, whether this is valid. I mean, all, if all the electrostatic stuff falls off the page, uh, it's not our problem. Uh, according to library experts, specifically yeah. Norm Schaefer at uh, Photo Duke and uh, Robinson at Preservation, a photocopy is, good as to, is as good as the paper that it is printed on. Now, there's something called, I'm, I'm not clear, you said either permalite or permalite paper, which lasts in excess of 500 years. So, so theoretically, that the certificate's going to outlast the application. Um, I'm having Eric check into the cost of the... It is extremely high. Right. Um, You're saying some photocopying is as good as the paper. Certainly not all of it, because we've si certainly seen this stuff just fade away so that you can't read it at right. all. And I have also, uh, I don't have any with me, but I have put photocopies in these plastic uh, file folders, and it, all the printing just comes <laughs> off on the plastic file folder. Uh, exactly. the, <laughs> the ringer system. 20th century plastic. <laughs> <laughs> that seems the only alternative to having the, the remitter fill out the Look, screen. I'm not knocking it. I think this is probably the way to go. But uh, and, and the fact yeah. that we had to go around with Buddy was in an entirely different context than on a different subject. Uh, I, but uh, obviously, uh, well, maybe we can, we can come down to this point. Uh, that we're not going to have people keyboarding the information. Does anybody differ from that? <laughs> um, would it serve any purpose? Are you talking about the original certificate now or additional? Yeah, the, you, you've got to 
to come to <coughs> fairly soon with the basic idea, are we going to require the applicant to fill out the certificate? And uh, in some way or another, either by providing something that we can photocopy, by doing it themselves as a duplicate, which is what they're requiring them to do now, or um, I guess those would be the only three. possibility would be if it could come out of the Kofi system where they are keyboarding in, and you would have to enlarge the catalog, the catalog in order to do that dual purpose. You'd have to include and, and addresses. Yeah. And there would be the delay. In well, the you realize this is what the office did until the fourth. We made up, up our own certificates from the application. Yeah, but we've got a million things yeah. yeah. coming through. Yeah. I think every one of us who's been an examiner uh, knows the problem of having the applicant do the application and the certificate where you have all kinds of little inconsistencies between the two. And you have to not only examine the application against the copy, but the application against the certificate. And the certificate. And the certificate, make, and the certificate yeah. And you well, make all kinds of adjustments and annotations. And I think there's much to be said for just having the applicant do the application and are finding some way of preparing a certificate for them. One of the solutions to that, of course, is uh, to have CARB and all that. What is that paper called? Uh, NCR. NCR. Yeah, NCR. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't work. Right. It, doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't work. It doesn't hold up. But, but at least CARB between that and the instructions is the snap last out. thing. All right. A snap out. Brilliant <laughs> idea, right? Just like our, our uh, stationary. Okay. With a, uh uh. <laughs> as soon as side. we go, huh? Well, that's, I mean, that's one problem. But as soon as we move away from anything, uh, move away from the standard design that we have now, which is two pieces of paper folded and scored down the middle, we void our contract with Purple Press, and we have to put the whole thing out for bids again. Well, um, I think we're going to have to do that. Uh, uh, the reason I was talking to Ed and Bob, and we were worrying about what we're going to do with the little IPN label, uh, and thinking of having this snap off, I mean, the, the sheets would be either on the side or on the top or in the bottom, whatever. Yeah. What the, the snap off strip, you know what I'm talking about, the IPN label would go on that strip, which would follow around with the application until it, it had been registered and gone through the entire system, then it could simply be torn off and disposed of, which is much easier than they're talking about now removing the label. Well, let's. I, I I can't see our bothering to worry about what Merkel Press is going to do or not do. We've got a, a much more basic uh, problem here. Joe Ross and I and Vince are going to talk to GPO, who handles the contract, of course, on Monday, so that we'll have some information about. We'll it. get information, but i we're nowhere near a decision on this yet. Well, I I, I feel like I need to know now what our options are and what are the disadvantages in each case and what we, I mean, I want to do what, what we want to do, but I want to know what the disadvantages are before we go ahead with it. Well, although it, it, uh, I, I understand, I think you have to do it too. Uh, you had, I remember years ago, thought about an application form design that would involve um, not having the lines, the instructions written into the lines, but have, uh, something that you could spread right. out so exactly. that you would key directly That's into right. it and you right. wouldn't have to go to a pe separate piece of paper. Everything right. would be right. hooked together. Be hooked. And that has always appealed to me. This was your basic thinking. You forget about having the certificate as a copy. You, you, uh, what Penny is suggesting, I think, has a lot of merit. But somehow or another, you, they submit the application, you provide the certificate, and you use machinery to do it if yeah. you can. Um, I, think, I think I would agree. We can't. We just the amount of keyboarding that to duplicate that information would be uh, uh, wasteful. Um, you could, I think, have a, a fold-out like our present thing, where you, you uh, could conceivably mix and match in a way that the instructions would jump right out at you. And people seeing date of publication, see page three of instruction book, they're not going to look at page three. And many, many people who have once looked at page three are never going to look at it again. I think you've got to have it right there in front of them. You've got to provide a format to do that. That's my own feeling. That's right. Also, the majority of applications stay right on the typewriter. That's right. Um, uh, we've checked that out. Yeah. And, uh, well, the way it is now, the, the instructions are obliterated anyway when the thing's in the typewriter. So you really have to do a draft and then do the typewriter thing. And if you could have the thing, as you say, keyed, the lines keyed carefully to one another person could mm -hmm. more nearly fill it out. 
This is so full of subtleties you just would not believe. I had a lot to do with our present application, and uh, so did Waldo and others. And uh, uh, the simplest thing can create 20,000 letters, just like that. And uh, I, I look here at yes, no boxes. Uh, you know, in Europe, they're not used to that. That's and right. they'll they scratch out the wrong, wrong one, one. Right. inevitably. German you have to be there. very careful with <coughs> any little thing. Have you looked at the Canadian system? No. Do you have any? Oh, you have some someplace. Yeah. We have, we have some around. Uh, that's right. the question I'd like to yeah. ask. Uh, we came through Mary and Penny that uh, um, we were to check into English speaking, other forms of English speaking countries. Well, how far should we go? I can't think of any that have such a system of so well, well I, you don't want to use the Philippines. <laughs> no, no. Because it's all form essentially which is Well the Canadians do have a form. Canadians have yeah. well many classification systems. It's right. very simple, isn't it? Yes, it's right. Not. It's a small system. I wasn't thinking so I wasn't thinking of copy, copy right. forms either. Well, Just what? Any, any form. Mm -hmm. Immigration. Uh, anything. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And we we did dig up a man who's supposed to be the world's greatest consultant or something like that on forms. The, um, the man you gave me. Yeah. Um, I held off on even contacting sure. him until we had some oh, clear sure. idea. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Isn't there sure. a basic question of whether the certificate needs all the information that the application has? The law says so. Well, no. It, it says it has, that the same, it has that the same information, but the question is not the identical same form. information. <coughs> well, no, not the form. The identical information. Well, we're in trouble on that already because the catalog, the CC, the catalog cards sometimes paraphrase. Yeah. Uh, and Arthur Levine, amongst others, and other applicants have complained about the, the paraphrasing of certain statements on the application, on the catalog card, the idea being they don't follow literally. And you get, you're one more step into that. Uh, well, the, the, the catalog isn't given from facial weight any longer. The no, certificate is. Right. Yeah. And uh, I think that, that was the intention. I think it has to pretty, be pretty much uh, That's my own I take it one avenue we ought to explore is, is the, the the technical side of making good photocopy that will hold up with time. In other words, um, we do know that standard xerography, unless the machine is set perfectly, does fade out. Uh, but there must be some other means like laminating by a spraying process, some something, something. You want to take on the workman's compensation for the people? Well, no, no. I'm, it'd have to be a, it'd have to be a subtle thing. It couldn't be <laughs> a little guy with us. No, but but this is this does appeal to me as one of the most fruitful avenues here is is taking the thing and photocopying it, putting the seal on the photocopy, and sending it out. The problem with that being the permanence. But if this could be overcome, it would seem the best of possible it's world. Than the carbon copy of the oh yeah. No, it isn't. I think, I think it would be best, but uh, it's not really what it's yet. Is to have. Uh, have the capability of reading this all in through an uh, optical character yeah. reader. And I'm hoping that that will eventually. The problem is we have to have we have to have our uh, remitters or our applicants send everything in in a, in a designated type font. No, not necessarily. Or, or, or so you, you get, uh, I think, uh, CDS is something like 50 type fonts or something like that. That recognition. Some range. <coughs> yeah, yeah. There's a range. It, it is getting better. I think we, th this is great, Gail, yeah, yeah. as, as a first cut. I think it's all the questions that we've got to ask are, are embodied in this. It's uh, very good. Um, do, you need, do you need more right now? Because we do have to move on. No, 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 no. Don't forget me. <laughs> well, never fear. Um, do you want to come I want As soon as Gail gets something up to us, I want to get it out to the whole staff. And outside, people like Buddy Well, I can do, I can do uh, numbering system. I can do a proposal for a numbering system and classification right away. I can do possibilities for the application form right away. Would that, is that, yeah, would that make sense? Do yeah, we want to go that. outside yet? I don't know, to Buddy. But it could company. generate within, inside. Let's go outside, let's go outside. Yeah, there's more I guess people there's more That's right. Even for the numbers. Go well, outside and use room. Yeah, you don't have to. You, you, can, you can make some reasonable degree of informal contact, Bob and I can step in a little bit, but you've got to be a little bit careful. Mm -hmm. Just some very quick questions, Gail. First, Dick mentioned the question about, which is essentially the visibility is applied to registration. We're going to handle that by an assignment, so you'll get 
hopefully the answer from our committee for the policy decision group. I don't think you have to look for the answer. The second, uh, a lot of the questions you, you, you raise, there may be answers in the quote legislative history, but legislative history going all the way back to starting with the 1961 uh, registers report. Well, Are you having John, somebody go through that list I gave you? Yeah, me. And uh, <coughs> I'm finding material, but nothing that I consider really gives me the definitive answers. But it is, answers, but it is being looked, checked. That, that's yeah. the only thing What, do you need more legal support than you have? Right now you've only oh, got no. Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you do. On so, the task yes, force. Yes, you do. I mean, that's a specific task that you just mentioned that someone should be doing for that. Well, that didn't require an attorney. But a lot of the questions we get <laughs> coming up with, the, the ones we haven't discussed today, do have legal. We have decided, I take it, that we will not have separate form, kind of forms for the things published under the old law and registered. We haven't really uh, well, decided that. Well, I think that's there's a pretty whole other transition, mm -hmm. a conversation on transitional considerations, okay. and I just summarize what I think. And I think we have to. Uh, treat works uh, well we'll start the registration system there's going to be a certain amount of overlap and we're going to be dealing with two different things for enormously in the first six months yeah um, but I think we cannot concern ourselves with continuing old classification and old forms simultaneously indefinitely with new classification and new forms we've just got to make some Gail, two quick questions addressed to that, and not for answers, only to confirm some assumptions. First of all, my assumption is if works published before January 8, January 178, but registered afterwards, we will still require an affidavit of domestic manufacturing. Oh, yeah. So provision will have to be made. But not if the work is published after January 178. So there will be that difference. Second, the thing you mentioned before about works published before the registration applied for afterwards and not requiring same information. I think it's entirely within our authority to demand the same information under the transitional supplementary provisions. We might not want to because they might not have records of creation, for example, but I don't think we're prohibited from, from demanding. Will people be able to demand that their claim be registered in Class D or something like that? No, I don't think they can. Under the statute, they think it's for our convenience. The, uh, the danger is we have to give concerns to what we do because no matter what the statute says, the courts and the an area of doubt will look for the class that's registered in. What, that's what they do today. What I'm fishing for is what can they disregard in their future planning? Can they disregard anything about continuing the present uh, uh, class system January 1, even though they may have to have a special application for them? I don't think we know the answer to that yet, but we'll decide what the class I think uh, what comes out of all this is uh, a necessity for a very early decision with respect to the numbering and classification. A lot of stuff is riding on that, including the application form and the whole registration process in question. And shall we come back and end this with some discussion of deadlines? Are we ready to talk about deadlines on this so that people will have well, some I, kind of I idea? I think we would need to get Gail's we, feeling on this. So. Well, I think we can. That. Well, we can talk about stages, though, is what you just said. I think you can devote all your attention to one stage, like numbering and classification, or worry about applications. Yeah. Uh, Gail indicated that she could get these documents up to you all fairly quickly. I would think that we could set a, uh, a deadline for consideration that ought to be hopefully I mean, after the after they after are in the Mary hands has received it and, oh, yeah, and right. sent it out that's and, fair enough. and say unless we get a uh, response from you within a week we assume you don't have one uh, yeah. <laughs> the uh, don't say well though uh, <laughs> if you don't do something like that you have a problem uh, I don't know what you do if, uh, if we do go to the outside of the numbering scheme uh, whether that I guess John would rather we didn't because I'm not. Well, all I'm saying is if we go to the outside, do it in a fair manner. Well, well, we, um, yeah, we can't just go to Buddy, obviously. We'd have to go the whole route if we were going to do uh, it at all. Penny made an informal contact with the music publishers already. And they, who was it, Penny? I, uh, 
McCullen had leaved of uh, MCA. And apparently uh, he had no problems one way or another with the numbering system or with classification. As I'm not sure how much detail. The, the, the impression I have is that people do regard this as what I'm not talking about is largely an internal matter. I think that there is interest in the continuation of the, the uh, catalogs in, in, to some extent, the same format now. now. But beyond that, I, there's a great deal of interest in the application form. Right. But I don't think that there's nearly that much. And in fact, it's hardly been mentioned at all. Yeah. I'd like to make a point of, of priorities. And I think uh, from talking to uh, people in BSO, there are certain things that uh, they don't even know about the application. They probably don't even need to know which class, which, what the classes are, just the fact that there are classes. But whether the numbers are going to be uh, completely sequential or just sequential within the class, that kind of thing is extremely important mm -hmm. that, yes, uh, that's to, true. That's to their development effort. And I would encourage uh, Gail and uh, Mary and Penny to try to pull out a few of these things and maybe try to decide them early. Um, I understand that we're, we're having some difficulty getting our uh, SOSA system up on time. As now, and uh, if we can pull, it, if we lump key things like that and we let them wait, I think we may be jeopardizing ourselves. Well, now what I'm saying is that I can I can get up something on the numbering system and on classification, get that in, get a decision made on that. We'll be finished with that, and then we can deal with these other problems. I think that's important. That's I, I, think I mean, I will I will propose yeah. tentative application problems, but what I give to you will be what all I intend to do. I mean, Okay. Well, it seems to me, and I'm getting a little ahead of the game, but we, we at, at some point, we should have another sit down of the same sort on just that. And, uh, right. yeah. and in, the, mean, that in, and in the meantime, I assume you would like comments on all of your questions from all of these people. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah please. Okay. Okay, let's leave uh, registration at this point, and uh, we're only an hour and a half behind schedule. And uh, But I, this is exactly what I expected. And maybe we can make it up in some of the other areas. Um, let's go on for another half hour, shall we? I think the later we, we go, the, the less crowded the restaurants will be. Uh, next is um, now. Now we're, we're through with with uh, the, the first subcommittee. I mean, the third subcommittee, and we're into the fourth. And now we, we pick up deposit copies acquisitions. And Mike show. Okay, I will try to be as brief as I can. We uh, are concerned really with more than just deposit copies acquisition. That's, that's a nice catchword. We are also com uh, concerned with compliance, which is in a way an acquisitions thing, but not purely. And uh, we're also concerned with fair use and uh, library photocopying as they relate to the Library of Congress at large. Okay, I'd like to talk about each one of these in turn. Uh, our basic approach uh, has been that, that we're trying to serve the library because we're trying to acquire copies for the library's collections largely. And because of this, we are trying to establish what the library's wants and needs are right up front, and then see what the Copyright Office wants, needs, and requirements are, and reconcile the two, uh, giving wherever possible uh, primacy to what the library wants. Uh, and by that, I mean that if uh, we need only one copy for examination purposes and the library would like to have two, then we can establish a requirement for two copies, that sort of thing. Since we are working with the library at large, we have established uh, liaison uh, relationships with the new planning office of the library. We have met with uh, people from them, uh, from that office on several occasions. We have uh, specific liaison person designated, Helen Dalrymple, uh, and we're keeping them advised of all of our efforts. And they've been a help to us in, in figuring out exactly what some of the contact points need to be. Uh, as an aside, the, uh, the staff of the planning office visited the deposit copies facility. Uh, in our exploratory discussions, they were so intrigued by uh, our descriptions of conditions that they had to go out there. And uh, they were not just intrigued, but dismayed when they left because of the, problem, because of the problems we do have. Uh, I would also uh, mention that we have made, uh, Luth Wax and I made presentations to the Reference Roundtable, which is an ad hoc group of frontline reference professionals. Uh, it's a long-standing ad hoc group represents uh, virtually every reference activity within the Library of Congress. Uh, we spoke to them to explain briefly uh, the impact of the new law, uh, to describe to them this whole revision planning effort. Uh, we spoke with them uh, about compliance and about fair use in library photocopying. And we have, uh, 
We did this to inform them what was going on on an informal basis and also to solicit their views and opinions. And we're going over to meet with an ad hoc group from that ad hoc group to discuss these issues next Wednesday morning to get some of their input. Okay, in, in the sense of uh, the Library of Congress requirements for deposit copies, we, uh, we have prepared two documents, uh, one derivative from the first. Uh, basically, what these documents are is a description of all classes of material that we receive and for each class, the number of copies, the form of required deposits, uh, permissible uh, substitutions, uh, where they are received, how they are handled within the Copyright Office in terms of selection or automatic dispatch to the Library of Congress, and what's the ultimate disposition of the copies. To my knowledge, this information has never been pulled together in one place before. And it's very illuminating. We found out, just as an aside, for instance, in the investigation, uh, that we're sending quite a number of uh, computer-related materials to ISO, of all places. And I have some serious reservations about whether or not this should continue, because a good bit of it, I suspect, is proprietary material that was copyrighted uh, as an extra precaution, uh, and whose this existence is, is not otherwise known. When did this stop? I don't it's know, but it, it's a long time. for a long time. They used to have a library, and then they came over and selected, and then it's died down. I didn't know it's been picked up. It, can, it is continuing to be done. It was second, our reference material. Second copies of, uh, of computer-related reference material. In some cases, I understand also operating manuals and things yes. of this nature. And I have I don't know about the ethics of this, and we're going to be looking into this question too. Mm -hmm. I have some serious doubts about it. Well, at any rate, uh, we prepared then an abbreviated version of that document which listed the essentials and dispatch, uh, dispensed with uh, our internal handling procedures. And uh, I met with the Acquisitions Committee a couple of weeks ago, the full Acquisitions Committee for the library, and uh, described to them our efforts and uh, solicited their assistance. I passed out copies of this document and asked them to have all their custodial divisions and everybody else who's concerned with acquisitions review the present arrangements and make any recommendations to us as to whether or not we should continue, we should modify, or so forth. I've also asked them to consider uh, what they want to do in terms of unpublished deposits and in terms of new types of material that we're going to be receiving that we do not now register. Uh, their responses are due back to me by about the 11th of April. Uh, they're going to respond to me directly. Each department will respond to me directly, and they will also uh, respond to the Acquisitions Committee so they can all take a look at the joint product. I know the Research Department has gone out with additional copies of this to all of the custodial divisions, and I'm sure the others will as well. So this will, will represent the input from the library as far as what they would like to have. Okay, we have also started an effort to obtain a comprehensive and very precise statement of what the Copyright Office needs for purposes of examination for all classes and types of material. Uh, we expect to have this list uh, completed since it is to be uh, rather exhaustive, no, not later than <coughs> the 13th of May. And uh, we're then going to uh, try and reconcile the two documents. I'm not, uh, I understand the first. Okay. Uh, you, you said two documents. In the, in the first, okay, you've got I'm a sorry. long document and a short document. I'm sorry. The, which uh, is really I, meant, I meant the, re the returns, the results. The first result is going, is going to be what I get back from the custodial division of the library. So okay. we want these materials. Okay. All right, that's the first result. The second result will be what we get back from our consultations with examining division, uh, John's office, and, uh, and other people in regard to what the Copyright Office must have for examination purposes. And we will then attempt to merge these. We hope to have the, uh, the merge completed no later than about the 1st of June. Okay. This is term in, in terms of classes of material, uh, format of material, number of copies, and alternatives to... Uh, to the original item. Yeah, right. Yes. Okay. Anything else? No, not really, although we have asked them to, uh, to comment on certain aspects of selection. Are you, are you satisfied you're hitting the right people in both yes, places? Yes, I, I don't have any, any concerns about that. Uh, Do we need copies of your documents? Do you have them? I've, I've, got passed, them. I've okay. passed out all copies right. of all the documentation okay. we've been that I haven't doing in our, in our task group, but yeah. I've passed it all. Over. What you gave out in the library was a shorter version of the two. That's right. Yeah. The other, the other was rough. We never did do a smooth version of it. We do have typed copies of it. Now, as I say, by about the 1st of June, we hope to have the merge completed. And uh, there are obviously going to be some points that need uh, reconciliation between what the library wants and, uh, and what the Copyright Office needs. Uh, governing, of course, the bedrock of this is going to be what we need for purposes of examination. And then what the library wants beyond that. Uh, I 
think we should be able to give them. Um, one of the things that, uh, that we pr we're proceeding with also is the assumption that wherever possible we should demand the minimum of the public so that under Section 407, for instance, mandatory deposit, uh, we should exempt as much material as we possibly can. And then under uh, 408, when we're talking about deposit for registration, if we do not need two copies and the library doesn't want two copies, we should not ask <coughs> for it. Uh, one notable thing that's going to come out of this is the motion picture payments, which are going to have to be overhauled, I think. Yeah. Um, in, in 2000, the, 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 the only criteria that you, criterion that you mentioned with respect to what the Copyright Office needs is examination purposes. But what about uh, storage? In, in terms of, uh, I mean, there is an assumption that we will be keeping a fairly substantial record uh, here in addition to what the library takes. Uh, is this a criterion that we're plugging into? Pres this? Preservation considerations, yeah. yes. Okay. Very much so. And size. Yes. Yeah. Shape the whole bit. Well, that's part of it, too. The examining, examining division, for instance, doesn't want to get the 1,500 pound bird bath right. moving through the offices. Well, that can that's, the, that's the most obvious case. Yes. But, uh, well, let me give you one example. Uh, which is live. I've talked at length with a woman from Xerox uh, and uh, University Microfilms. They are perfectly willing, and I've expressed a similar willingness on our part, to try to sit down and work something out in a way that would benefit the office, would benefit them, and would benefit the library. And my get my what triggered this in part, well, they had made the overture to me, but about simultaneously. The uh, library is asking for processing, or uh, yeah, process is asking for 130,000 or something, amounts more, I think, for fiscal 78, because Xerox University of Microfilms has stopped uh, giving us a free copy of all of the uh, dissertations that are not copyright. So that there did seem to be fairly major opportunities here to work something out, and they were most receptive. Indeed, and I have talked to them about it. One thing I thought was that they could send some people out there and uh, to Ann Arbor and see what uh, um, would be feasible in a way that would get for the Library of Congress everything that they publish would not uh, and could very well ease our examination burdens. The ex handling and examining of university microfilms is obviously one of my more beastly problems. And it seemed to me that there are probably a dozen opportunities to make our job easier that would probably benefit them, too, if we just sat down. Now, this, this thing just happened to arise. It's kind of an obvious one. But aren't there other areas in which, and I'm now talking about going outside the library and the copyright office before we get too deep into this and you get locked into something? Well, Part of the question, I think, is, is what we're going we're gonna to have at the end. I don't know how much, uh, how much we're going to have to go out to in, this, in the sense of rulemaking or anything of that sort. Publishing uh, proposals and regulations. We've also talked about, uh, I don't know if you've been in touch with Jeff, about a bunch of content and questions that IAA and others have raised in the context of both software and uh, and databases, how do you register mm -hmm. those things. And has Jeff been of any help to you? He hasn't come over yet, and I haven't gotten around to calling him. So. Yeah, this is another area. Another example would be daily newspapers. That's I'm right. sure the library would love to have the microfilms, but they're, yeah. not going to micro, they're not going to get to the, keep the paper copies except in a few instances. Um, but it'd have to tie in with registration on a timely basis. I think so in some ways we're, we're uh, it's a little premature for us to be going out. On the other hand, it worries me a little bit that we're going to be frozen into something that would not allow us to do the kind of flexible case-by-case uh, -case adjustments that uh, I think would be beneficial. We're certainly intended <coughs> under this law. I think that's uh, I think that sort of <coughs> approach needs to be made to the outside. What what we're looking at for a finished product here is a proposal <coughs> that will reconcile the minimum requirements for examination All purposes right. with the library's want list. And th those are two two uh, sides of what I think is a triangle, and the third is obviously what the public wants yeah. and it, it's very uh, or needs, and it's 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 a very adjustable situation. And I think we need to keep the size and uh, dimensions of those the other two sides that you're now working on at least flexible within certain limits in order to accommodate the third side. 
But we will have this package finished by the 20th of June and be ready to uh, to make uh, overtures to people on the outside. Does anybody feel that's too late? Um, by June 20th, did you say? Yes. Well, that may be too late for the application form designing. Are we, wait a minute, you're including in what you're talking about the copies we'll be using for registration, right? Right. If, if certain application problems are, this will dictate certain application setup, then it may be. I mean, I need to know something before that. Yeah. Also, with us, I, I have told the people on my task group the recommendations I would like that by May 15th, certain decisions as to the alternative deposits could have an effect on the storage requirements, and it might shorten the length of time when we would have to consider our requirements to make sure. I'm not saying we would need as your final recommendations, but we have some idea. Here. Well, we're going to have a statement of the kind of red office requirements by the 13th of May. Well, that's uh, an important step forward. Does this seem agreeable to you? Uh, what's being caused with you? It's hard to say. I know. I can't yeah. comment on it. Yeah. I um, something that, that occurs to me, I talked about it yesterday, uh, just before <coughs> Tim, Mark, and myself, uh, where the applicant pays for full term storage. Uh, I assume you're addressing that in connection with the library's request for the copy. we're going to accept the fee for storing these things, then uh, we're going to have to keep them. And we can't give them to the library. See, we're not... I don't know where that falls in your bail or well, not. It does, it doesn't. But for purposes of this consideration, not really. Because the library is saying, of the Class A materials, for instance, that come in, we would like the following things to be done. We'd like to have this made available for selection. We would like to be able to choose one or both copies. We need you to be receiving as many as two so that we can take that many if we want them. Uh, we're not guaranteeing the library any particular, any specific title. And we realize, and I have told the Acquisitions Committee, uh, about 704E, and that this is, I think, really overriding, and it's going to deny the library. Well, the basic thought was to give, make the fee high enough, first exactly. of all, to pay for it, and also to get the, to get the library a, uh, to the money enough to buy. That's what we so, yeah. And in many cases, of course, they don't want sure. the copies, so that, uh, sure. yeah. Okay. It can. Uh, go on, I, because well, you haven't gotten into the compliance. Is that no, the no, other I've, big I've area? No, no, I've yeah. got some other things here, okay. definitely, that I want to get into. Uh, compliance is a very big one, and uh, we're proceeding really based on, uh, on two assumptions. Number one, that the compliance activity exists primarily to build the con collections of the Library of Congress rather than to ensure absolute compliance with the law. That's number one. And the second is that uh, compliance should and will remain an organizational entity. It will not be diffuse in any way. Oh, and, I'm not ready we're to not make that decision. Well, well I say we're proceeding. We're proceeding on, on this basis in, in the planning. Because uh, if we don't, then we don't have anything to plan on. And, and when I talk about the procedures in a minute, I think you'll understand. All right, good. Um, we're don't, not, don't we're assume not, uh, that that is decided because okay. it definitely is not. But we're not, uh, we're not making any My assumptions about... My tendency is the other way, as you very well know. I know, I know. Okay. We're not making any assumptions uh, as to what the subordination of compliance will be, whether, whether or not it would uh, be in any given division or whether it be staff function or what. We're not addressing right. that question. Uh, we're going to make speci very specific recommendations in, in four areas uh, regarding compliance. Goals, internal organization, and staffing of compliance to meet those goals. What the operating procedures... Uh, Compliance will be in general terms, and uh, recommendations for a program of education of the Library of Congress staff and of the public generally as regards compliance. We have received some oral input, as I mentioned, from the Acquisitions Committee. We're going to meet with the Reference Roundtable subgroup on the 23rd of March. Uh, we will also be consulting directly with key people in order division, serial records, serial division, and other parts uh, of the library to get their input and to, uh, to get their reactions to certain things we may be thinking. We are developing the basic organization on the premise of specialization. That, that people within the I'm very troubled by this, and I'm not going to kid you around. Okay. Uh, my whole tendency is the other way, and I'm afraid you're going off in a path well, that you're going to have to retrace. Okay, let, let, me, right. let me say this, because I know we've talked about it yeah. before. When I say we're developing it on the premise of specialization, I mean that within the compliance activity, whatever it is, we will have certain individuals who will concentrate certain categories of publication. One person may be the trade, yeah, another that's person part of arts, and so forth. I, I know that, yeah. but mm -hmm. 
aside from that, I think even within an organization, if it remains an entity, then we still would have this sort of specialization because as we see it, the compliance activity will be interfacing with corresponding people within the library and as well as, as uh, the world outside. And so one person who's really up on music publication, for instance, would be the right person to interface with music division as well as the industry. Well, that's certainly part of my thinking, and we agree on that, but we obviously don't agree on the rest of it. And uh, I think what I've got to warn you about is that uh, I'm not going to be frozen into something unless, uh, and the fact you've gone ahead and done something on a certain assumption, this goes for everybody, doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be that way. We realize that. Uh, uh, and I say these are recommendations. Yeah. Also, there is another task force yes, group. That's right. really does duplicate what, uh, our, we've had discussions on this very thing, and it's foolish to not interact. Uh, haven't you haven't been anything. interacting in yeah, this. No. Yeah. We haven't yeah. had anything in paper from them. I've seen nothing. We don't well, have we anything. we got a problem, and this isn't the only one of this right. kind. Okay. Mm -hmm. in, order to, in order to talk about organization, you have to think of the functions of the, of the industry. Are you really, should you be in on the, uh, into this kind of thing? I'm, they I'm, need I'm to know wondering. what LC wants in the way of compliance. I've, but I absolutely. don't see why they have to go beyond that. I don't have any problem with that, but in terms of the structure that around is surrounded, I'm I really don't know that that is within your in your mandate. I don't know. I mean, I don't mind you considering it, but I think it has to. The main mandate of this kind is in the other task group. I I've, I mean I've participated in those discussions with respect to compliance, and I I think just as bearing witness that uh, the assumption that uh, Mike is making is precisely that. And oh, it, I don't, and I don't, I don't and it is an assumption, and it is an assumption that does not involve planning based on that assumption, that is, filling out the actual organizational structure of compliance. But that assumption does seem to be very useful in at least identifying the compliance needs and relationship to the library and the special skills that will be required, whatever the organizational decision. And uh, I, I do think it's going to be very useful and almost necessary thing for the limited substantive uh, okay. study that he's doing. I, don't, that, but I wouldn't attach too much Couldn't to you use the other assumption as a, one of your hypotheses? Do you mean the, the uh, dispersion? Yeah. Certainly. All right. I mean, there's, there's no question, there's no problem with that either. All right. We can just prepare a, a double set of recommendations, really. When we get to that point, certainly, we're, we're, just, we're just not really into that well, chat. I have thought that the work that Mike's doing would be useful to our, our organization group, and uh, he, he would be one of the people having a good input into this. Absolutely, no question yeah. about it. But at, at the same time, uh, we, you know, it's here we are in the we're getting on toward the end of March. We're going to have a gigantic crunch later on. And at some point, uh, there's going to be very, very sad people if they all the work they've done suddenly is thrown aside and you're going forward on another assumption. That's why we've got to have consultation from right now on. And without any, uh, we can't go off on our own directions because otherwise we're going to find a lot of very, very unhappy people who will have done unproductive work. And uh, I, I would like to avoid that if possible. I'm not saying that, that it will be the case here. We could come out your way, but I don't think that uh, you can assume anything at this stage of the game. And uh, if you've got working hypotheses, you better check them out before you go forward and get too deep into them. And this applies to everybody here with that exception. Okay? Okay. Okay, well, let me go on. Right. One of the things that, that we're looking at uh, pretty seriously now, I think, is an, is an activist role for compliance. And uh, I'll explain this briefly. I think that. Uh, compliance as an acquisitions activity uh, needs to do more than just sit back and wait for people to come to it and say, get me this. Uh, we're not saying we're going to make a recommendation, but we are looking at, at, the, I at the idea that uh, compliance ought to some degree to, uh, to have an effort to identify current publication, certainly in, uh, in some area, uh, to track that publication, to determine when, it's over, when the receipt is overdue, and then to take some kind of action to encourage deposit uh, on its own without waiting for the library or, or some other Absolutely. agency to say anything about so we're that, is a, that, that, is, that is something that is built into this law. I think that is the intention. Yes. Very clear. Good. Okay. Uh, this, is, this is one reason, as an aside, that I, that I think we wanted to look 
a little bit at organization because when we talk about an activist role of this sort, uh, it might not be possible without uh, without a certain unity of effort. Because I'm not saying let's, let's, let's not have a unity of effort, but okay. Uh, okay. Uh, we intend also to specify the procedures uh, for compliance activities, both uh, the use of the library uh, in requesting action and uh, for our own use uh, in uh, taking action. Uh, we intend to take this all the way down to the level of detail of including the general content of communications we would have with outsiders, but not getting into specific wording. Just to say that we will send a letter of a certain type yeah. saying so and so. And of course, I mentioned we do need, uh, once we get our ducks in a row, we understand which way we're going on this. We need to develop some sort of a program to educate the library uh, as regards to the procedures and the public as regards to the requirements of the law. Now, what uh, have what considerations been given to law enforcement? In other words, should we be making contacts with the uh, Justice Department or the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, at this stage or at a fairly early stage so that we'll know that they will back us before we have we, to? We haven't considered that. That's that's the last step, yeah, I guess. Right. We really haven't. Well, I, I, my basic that. question is: Do we wait till we've got a problem and then go to them, uh, or do we get some kind of policy and indication from them in advance? I would say the form, the latter. I would say that uh, we ha we are not at this point now with the law. But if we can go forward, if we could get a letter from somebody like Silbert or somebody who would say yes, we will. If, if, if there is a scoff law attitude, if people, if, if this is this is what you're going to do, if you get to this point, we will help you. Then I think we'd be a hell of a lot better off than we have been for the last 20 years. And it seems to me at an appropriate time we could do that. Do you differ from that? No, I was going to suggest something along a rather low level, but it may be one of the ways to approach it now. Is uh, Bob Weiner's been wanting to have lunch with me for the last couple of weeks and had a postponed lunch. Yes, I could broach it with Bob over lunch. And start it that way. Who is Have you, he's with the criminal division of justice, very much involved in record piracy, but he is with the division that, that would be involved in this type of thing. So one part of the Justice Department that says they're happy about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any thoughts on this? No, I, I think it might not be a bad idea to take it up with right now. Well, it brings up a related question, which I'll, I'll just throw it out here because we're talking about outside agencies, and that is. is do you know if Don has done anything about contacting the Postal Service or Treasury about the regulations they're supposed to trade since Chapter 6? I thought Don told me at one point he was planning to talk to them. I think he's talked some to Atwood about the, the customer side of it, yeah. But I don't know who he's called. that is completely far. off the subject. Yeah. It just well, let's the rage get together. <laughs> You're out of order. order. <laughs> point of personal okay. Press on. Let me say then uh, that we have we have established target dates. We hope to have our completion of the recommendations with what the compliance goals ought to be, and the tentative ideas in both directions uh, uh, regarding organization. And Marlene, we hope to have this done by the 15th of April. Fine. Uh, we want to uh, finish the uh, procedures. Our own attitude for how, right. how uh, hard nosed we're going to be in certain cases. We are going to have to have regulations in yeah. that area. Uh, for simultaneous deposits. Well, I'm going to come to that, believe me. Okay. Uh, I want to talk about a couple All of right. things within the task group area. Uh, will there be uh, large staffing additions or something, do you think? Do you mean under compliance? I, I foresee a substantial increase, uh, in, at least. I've, the goals that we're, going to, that we're going to postulate for compliance would require us. Whether, whether we say anything about it, whether we leave that to you. Well, you, you must recommend okay. participate in our discussion if you want to. Uh, huh. The other big area that, that we're working with uh, with the library uh, is fair use and library photocopying, which is, is a really amorphous thing from our standpoint at this point. Uh, our basic approach uh, to this is, as regards to libraries, to be an instigator to get them to take action. Consultant. I'm really puzzled. What is our role? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what what we're trying to do the way the way we see it uh, is that we will that we will contact specific people, specific agencies within the library that are that are very concerned with this, like Photo Duplication Service, CRS, maybe one or two other other agencies, uh, not agencies but offices, mm -hmm. 
and tell them, you know, just in brief, that uh, time is getting short. Well, we they know. take a look at your procedures <laughs> to make an offer to them to provide uh, consultant services to, uh, uh, to review. CRS has already have. sent over a, a, a pretty good document. Uh, and uh, this, is, uh, this is fraud. <coughs> uh, this is not something we're compelled to do under the law. Um, the thrust of the document was conservative in the sense of if you're in doubt, don't do it or ask for permission, which has been their traditional posture. I know you had some feelings that it was more conservative than it needed to be, but I talked to them over that. And their feeling was that if you take any kind of uh, uh, wraps or off attitude, they'll just, the, the, the people at the working level will just photocopy like mad. And the, the feeling was there, be cautious, be conservative. And I, from that point of view, the document seemed to be pretty good. Um, what troubled me about it, we haven't gotten back to them. Do you know about this document? I haven't seen it. I know that it You know it exists. exists. Okay. I think it was mentioned in the Registrar's Conference, actually. Uh, we're published. <laughs> um, the date is 1977, not 1976. <laughs> I sincerely trust. <laughs> okay. Um, under 111F, the, the office has an oversight and reporting function. 108, did I, what did I say? 111. 111. Uh, yeah, we got that too. 111. 111F. And for us to be participating in making library policy is a mixture of roles. Now, it's not necessarily out of the question, but uh, it's, it's a little troublesome. And I, let me say, on this ties into what Mary Beth is doing. Later on, we're going to be going out with a dog and pony show, uh, putting together information for libraries, generally, as to uh, the guidelines, particularly the systematic guidelines and the operational 108. And I refuse to do this alone. Uh, the, the basic idea of the dog and pony show is that the dogs are the, the publishers and the ponies are the librarians, or in the case of classroom, the educators. So that we were not put in the position of having to explain what the uh, law means, why it developed, uh, defend it in other words so that the two sides would be there and they could speak to the policy questions and we would be simply there for technical support and actually the sponsor of the meetings. And if we did something different, fundamentally different, with respect to the Library of Congress, I would have some problems, if you follow me. I'd rather, because of the role that we've been singled out to play in library photocopying, uh, which is an arbitral role, basically, for us to take a position as a library uh, up beyond a certain point gives me some heartburn. Uh, do you have any thoughts on this, Mary Jane? Uh, no, not really. I, I had the same kind of inquiry until the other day. The Music Library Association wanted us to do something like what Veterans Book Carol was saying, and I said, you know, that's not our role. We think it's what you do. Uh, I see this like a problem. Um, Should I have talked to the... Uh, Library Resources Planning Council in California? You know, uh, I'm not trying to put anybody under wraps, but this is this is a basic problem, sure, of course. And I go out and talk to these groups. And you get questions, you've got to give some kind of answer, or you, you sound stupid. On the other hand, I have tried to make this point whenever I spoke, that uh, we are not in a position to support libraries or support publishers and authors or, in, or support uh, the NEA or whatever. Uh, what we're trying to do is to uh, provide some kind of assistance and framework under which people can work out their own salvation. And uh, I'm not sure that this has been explored in the library itself. Bob? It's, uh, it would seem to me that your relationship with LC is peculiar. It is and, indeed. Uh, There's no question about it. Yeah. That you, to think of it in terms of relationships to outside libraries is not the way to do it. Uh, well, let me go one step further. Uh, and I think this may be partly where you're, you're leading. Uh, it has been a kind of a, a dream of mine 
that LC would take a leading role in trying uh, in trying to uh, work this out and establish precedence in a way that it didn't just uh, ignore copyright owners' rights. That it would recognize its own uh, position and the, the fact that the Copyright Office is in the Library of Congress in trying to work support and even sponsor these blank licensing arrangements and so forth that are now being talked about. You and then you. I just want to make the point that one of the things that we found out in our preliminary uh, approaches on this is that there is no, within the library, there is no single authority who is considering the problem. People are going off in, diff in different okay. directions, and certain groups are left completely without guidance, and therefore have to play everything extremely close to the Well, chair. it's not only that, it's horrifying, because this concert program is going lickety-split down the, the pike, and the, they will make noises about supporting copyright, but nobody's done a thing to, uh, to try to do it. Do you want to comment on this at all, or is this in your bailiwick anyway? Well, it's a little out of it, but, uh, but yet... Uh, we're talking about the oneness and the, and the relationship between the Copyright Office and the rest of the library. And, and I think it, it's something that we, uh, uh, we in effect, have to have our own house in order. And uh, I, think that's, I think that's pretty much imperative. Uh, we cannot be uh, above uh, the law, so to speak. Uh, so we must recognize the peculiar uh, organizational relationships, but we also must recognize our own uh, our own responsibilities in this area as, as as a library just as any other library um, yeah um, I think we need to uh, be talking about two steps Barbara, I think. the first one and the immediate one being to help them understand what the limitations of the law are <coughs> and to frame lead them into framing policy. I'm talking to both Duke now. Mm -hmm. Framing policies that, that are within that law. And then maybe an ultimate second step is the uh, licensing agreements, uh, which ought to be considered separately. I think they have to operate uh, some of what they're doing within the uh, code of guidelines. If, if they don't, libraries on the outside can well, get from LC. Tell me something I don't really know. To what extent does the Library of Congress go outside to supply reader requests? Do we, do we, are we a requesting library, a borrowing library, to any extent? We are. We are. We well, are, then to that extent, we certainly are obliged to follow the Constitution. Not you. Uh, and we're obliged to follow the country guidelines in that Photo Duke must receive from the requested okay, library that's right. a statement. Yeah, that's right. They won't honor that. And uh, we are yeah, obliged yeah. to uh, have a statement on our Photo Duke uh, order forms, which says, "Watch out for copyright." One of the uh, one of the rules that we're now in the process of getting comments on is is on that subject. All right. Uh, you have uh, undertaken some discussion so far. Uh, it's, been, it's been very preliminary, but we right. do have the first the first real big meeting set up for next Monday morning with Photo Duke. Well, I'm a little troubled by this, frankly. Um, do you think what we did in the past was wrong when they go and help them to draft uh, the set of no. regulations? No. Uh, I am not convinced they're following those now. And, uh, well, we get two stories. Don't yeah. We? Uh, uh, I'm not sure that that uh, that is. We're in a different phase now. They, I, I do believe they really tried to follow those yeah. Barbara. Uh, I think Charlie got the rascal in the middle of an interim meeting, and, and, uh, and maybe Joe did. But I honestly think they do try to follow. Them. Uh, do you want to say we, anything about Masano's idea? Why don't you? Uh, Paul Masala has written to Barbara suggesting that uh, the Copyright Office consider uh, working with uh, other librarians and getting a grant to explore the possibility of setting up uh, regional centers uh, that would guide libraries and work with them in developing further rules on the basis of the Council Guidelines. Uh, he had hoped that we would move very fast. I talked to him about this. We've not answered that letter. I know. But I talked to him about this that when he was here for ALA, and I told him that he seemed a little bit premature. We were working on our own uh, problems now. But he thinks we should be getting a grant and moving with the library. 
questions and they need to have a central place to send them that, that's and get answers. A valid point. And that this would be helpful to the register in her five-year report. Yeah, I think it would. And the assumptions of the copyright office would be giving the answers. No, 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 helping no, to get a grant no. to set up. The librarians would help each other, and that their help would then help the register. I don't say uh, there's no harm in your meeting with Fuller do, but it, as long as nothing de definite is decided. Uh, but I, it, 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 it frightens me to think of something coming out of this that would be coded around as the register said this or the copyright office said that and so forth. We're not well, in certainly a position to do that. Intent. I realize. On the other hand, stuff gets misunderstood very easily. They've been overly scrupulous, in fact, in what they've done with the previous guidelines. One problem is the rest of the library doesn't know what they are because they regard those as confidential documents. Mm -hmm. So I think we can put some trust in them. I'm not sure that uh, Photoduke is the, is the real place to go to, to set policy here. What about uh, the administrative? Uh, obviously, uh, Applebaum is the, the key, not the uh, hood. We do have to do some preliminary with them. We do. I think to understand to understand what they are specific the specifics of their problems are as they see them. Or would you depend on an apple box? No, I think that's probably valid. Um, Barbara, wouldn't you say that in the past they felt the responsibility of uh, warning people because the copyright office was here? That has Oh, I'm, I'm not talking about warnings on machines. I think one thing we have to accept is the fact that they, they can put phone coin operated machines around the library and note that they have no obligation about what's done with them. It's the request that they get themselves, and particularly what they do on both ends of this yeah. in, uh, interlibrary quote loan unquote arrangement. Is, uh, Do they have a special uh, responsibility on the coin operated machine? No. no. I think that point is something we can make. This is spelled out in section 108, and uh, uh, it clearly reads in salutations. Uh, you're here for the afternoon session. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah, uh, they, they will have to put warnings on, just like every other library. Are we going to tell librarians what to say in that warning? Mm -hmm. I've interpreted no. We have to. No. 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 I've interpreted no. our only regulatory authority under that to be the warning notices on the order forms. They and, uh, and, and at the place where the orders are accepted. And at the place where the orders are accepted. Well, will each library uh, make its own wording? or? Uh, I suspect they'll follow the warnings we come out with for the order forms. They, they want to have some help to have a uniform wording. Yeah, I, th I think it would be very helpful that way. if. Uh, there would be uniformity. Look, this is something, whether the library is interested in it or not, my observations is, are exactly the same as yours, that the problem hasn't been addressed at any high level. Uh, they've got to. I mean, this is something they're, they're going to have to do. I have tried to interest people in this, not recently, but over the years. Um, I had a long talk with John Lorenz about it before he left the library. But... Um, hit or miss ad hoc uh, contacts of the kind we've had so far with CRS and with that photo deep are just not enough. Um, is there some way we could set up a, a structure in the Mr. library? Mr. Applebaum has uh, uh, interested in my meeting with some people here. Would this be a subject for that agenda of meeting with him? I think it's too important. He's interested in coming, or he's guilty about not having over here and toured around because he is the administrative department. That's his. That's his problem. But uh, I would say no. I think this shouldn't be just Applebaum. I think okay, this should he be. He has also invited us to suggest agenda items for you to meet with his people yeah. at any time. Yeah. At, this uh, would be a we have a Tuesday a morning meeting. Well, this special is special meeting on that. Well, it could be uh, <coughs> the way we've done it uh, so far. We've had a couple people. Um, from the process department and uh, I think uh, research department. But uh, if there's something that uh, you want to put on the ag uh, the agenda at Ed's meeting, and of course, uh, photo dupe and preservation mm -hmm. and some of these other areas are there, uh, I think he'd be very receptive to that. Yeah. Uh, 
I think what we need is an entry to part metal roof here. That's what you're saying. It really is. And lacking in librarians, the regular conference. Uh, maybe we need to set up a meeting with the department. Do you think we could get away with that? Well, a couple forms. I said, Don, I'll talk to Don about it, but that we were supposed to have that bi weekly uh, meeting. That would do. That would probably And uh, where, the, where you, it, it uh, with the executive session perhaps taking on a little bit different uh, tone or, or, or continuing pretty much the same tone it has now. But the bi weekly meetings, that would be the, in a sense the, uh, the informational and the problem solving. Get around a table and uh, and looking at it from the whole uh, point of view of the library rather than just departmentally. My problem with that is that um, he, well, he's pr approaching it very, very cautiously, obviously. And um, as I interpreted what Don was saying, uh, this was strictly just for exchanges of information. This was not problem solving. I thought uh, that came through pretty clear to me. I think he was concerned about uh, setting up a subgroup that would kind of preempt. Uh, well, Okay, it's I'll, a problem. I'll I know. Talk, yeah, I'll talk to Don about it. But I, I, if we don't, the last meeting we had was December 9th, wasn't it? December 13th, and uh, that's going on three months, and uh, it presents some real uh, grave problems if you want to involve all of management and and, took, and take a look at the um, the oneness of the library. It's a little difficult to work that way. Uh, if the bi-weekly meeting, if we get those established and they and they start evolving at least to the point that. Uh, uh, the blood has been let, and uh, some there have been some, uh, uh, at least some tentative agreements among the department on courses of action, and then take at a higher uh, take that high level decision making, uh, not really decision making, mm -hmm. take that high level of thought rather to uh, the executive session, then, and then saying, okay, uh, we've just, we've discussed all this, and then and then make, and then get the decision making. Be fine if you were having these meetings regularly. Well, is that, that really presents let, a problem. Let me suggest, Barbara, <laughs> that we think about going to Chuck Liberman, in the planning office, and say, "Here's an overall library planning problem. Uh, would you help us set up?" That would certainly be How does that go? Take it from there. Would, would you want to undertake to do that and try to set up something that would involve meetings and dates or something? Yeah. All right. I think we have to do that. Go ahead and have your meeting. But let it just be a preliminary and ex an information exchange type of thing. So it's all me. Right, I understand. Okay. Yeah, moving, moving right, right along. along. Uh, try, I hope these will these will be brief. There are three areas of, of major concern to, to my group and I think to a number of other people um, where a decision will have to be made at some time in the future. I'll go no further than that. Uh, the first of these is what is to be the ultimate disposition of the non-selected section 407 copies. Oh, that's that separate now. Yeah. Yes. I would I would recommend that after the library has had a chance to look at the 407 copies, after we have recorded their receipt adequately within the copyright office, that the non-selected copies be sent to exchange and gift. And I see that we have no responsibility and no need to retain them. Well, off the top of my head, I would agree. And. Uh, uh, but you're not asking for answers. No, I'm not. I'm right. just okay. pointing this out yeah. as, as a problem. Okay. The second problem, and this is this is a real biggie, <laughs> is uh, under Section 408, there is a requirement that the, the copy submitted for registration be accompanied by the application and requisite fees. The committee reports speak of simultaneous receipt as well as accompanied and simultaneous. The question is how strictly do we interpret this? There are some uh, obvious problems with this. I could I could state a long list of uh, pros uh, one direction and, and mm -hmm. maybe two cons in the other direction, so I think that's what you know how I feel. Uh, but I don't want to take everybody's time on that right now. But well, does everybody a, understand this problem? This is a, this is a big problem, <coughs> where you get, you get uh, copies and you don't get the application. Well, this is one typical situation. There are many others. And what do you do? Uh, do you wait? Do you write? Do you have a regulation? We'll have to have a regulation, yes. no question about it. And there are big uh, automation implications for this, too. We were assuming under the uh, in-process automation plan that we'd have some form of a time limit, and maybe two or three weeks, when these would age, and if they, we did not get the accompanying material, we would uh, switch it over and, and to uh, 
bang, came in four four oh seven. We just make that assumption for them. I can I can counter that by saying that if we do that, we're establishing a cutoff date date that is largely arbitrary. And so we can go by, by the law and have the law and, and all hearings and everything behind us to say simultaneous means simultaneous. We make a determination upon a receipt and say this is four oh seven, this is four oh eight. And, and leave now, union now, simultaneous <laughs> doesn't mean simultaneous. <laughs> 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 all right, prompt, <laughs> yeah. prompt, prompt doesn't mean prompt and so forth. Now, there, there's, there's a little bit of middle ground that we could fly on this. We could say that we would accept unaccompanied copies for registration if they were accompanied by a notice that they were intended for registration, on, you know, using mm -hmm. form that we, that we prescribed. And anything that arrived without that form, we would declare upon receipt to be 407 and, and, and get out of the stream. We would, we would hold these other items. Well, we uh, haven't got time to, to, okay. to really that's come it. to grips with this. I think everybody understands the problem, and I think this is something we need to address directly and uh, And it, it does affect us soon. quite a number of things. Oh, I know. Uh, but you are not, down to you're not making any assumptions in your planning, are you? <laughs> I'm not planning on that one at all. It's just a question that has to be answered, believe me. Well, even in automation, I think Ed would agree with me that we would agree with you, but we were trying to be practical. We thought we would be forced into dealing with a large submission of unaccompanied copies. But this would depend on how carefully we plan for it this year. Right. That's a lot of problems. The third, the third big question area that I have is uh, relates to our <coughs> responsibilities for preserving deposits. We are required to preserve unpublished deposits for the full term unless we make tax and labor <coughs> reductions. We're also required to preserve uh, 704E paid full term deposits. The law in, in this particular section makes no mention of the preservation of the intellectual content. It, it makes no mention. It makes no mention of the preservation of the intellectual content. It addresses only the retention of the item itself. Uh, there is a presumption, though, since we can make facsimile mm -hmm. copies, that intellectual content is important. Now we may have to make a decision sometime this year as to whether or not we're going to assume responsibility for intellectual content on all unpublished items. And if so, we may have to begin to. Uh, to make preservation copies soon after we receive them. Yeah. I so hope that the law is flexible enough to allow that. It was certainly intended to be. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, uh, I, well, I'd be very interested to hear your proposals in this area. Uh, I could see a situation in which, uh, if we begin to get a great many um, manuscripts of more than two or three pages, that we would set up a regular micro facsimile facility and uh, store everything that way. Uh, and I, that was certainly one of the possibilities that was mentioned when the, uh, the law was banned. Uh, I, my own feeling is that in music, for example, where the bulk of the unpublished material isn't that bulky, uh, that uh, it probably wouldn't be necessary, although maybe there are different well, views on that. Bulk is not, is not really my, my consideration. It's, it's really physical, a matter of physical preservation. Physical preservation. Physical preservation. Because we're talking about such long mm -hmm. terms of protection. Yeah. Um, and we do get an enormous amount of serographic material in the EU. Uh, but we mm -hmm. you're, uh, despite what Gail was saying, yeah. that she was told, you're, you're really very doubtful whether this stuff is permanent uh, copy. Well, I just know from experience a lot of us not. I, I really do get very conflicting messages about the permanence of xerographic copies. Does some less? Is it, some is it inappropriate um, <coughs> to, uh, to contact the manufacturers? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you a big line. <laughs> the, there are problems with uh, xerographic copies. It varies from machine to machine, right? And we have no control over that at all. Has preservation done any studies in the only uh, Well, yeah, I mean, I've talked to them about the durability of the, uh, the copies, and Norm Schaefer explained to me quite a bit yesterday about there has to be a certain degree of heat applied, but could we not look into the possibility of getting a machine that would, as, uh, would ensure as firm a guarantee as possible that we would have. I thought we were talking about receipts from the outside. Well, but yes, but she was exploring uh, in terms of our making records that would be permanent. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, obviously there is a difference. Uh, well, we, we understand the problem. 
and uh, it does have various facets, and at some point we're going to have to sit down and make decisions on this, too. Now, are you through? Yes, Is I this am. it? Okay. Um, what should we do with this batch of problems? Should we uh, try to single some out for immediate detention, or uh, have another meeting and, and go into them in more depth, or what? What do you think? Well, I would ask Mike to uh, go ahead and get some of these proposals in writing, and we'll react to them. Is that enough for now? Sure. All right. Okay. Mike, a couple of quick questions. So we had a meeting a couple of weeks ago. Many of the people here were there. And uh, we discussed that checklist at that time. And between you, Tim, and Lou, we agreed that most of it was covered. And all of it was covered in your three subcommittees. Has that changed as a result of any further thought? And not all of it was spelled out in here. It didn't have to be, but everything there was covered. Is it relevant at all? Should we look to the legal deposit systems in foreign countries? Is it very common? Or should we just be concerned about all experience? This type of library deposit is not unusual. Well, as you know, we had one of the revision studies was on this. And I'm not that sure that it's, Yeah, but I don't think the systems have changed that much. That's not been my observation. The, the British have just gotten the report out um, on their whole copyright system. The Whitlam Report is finally published, and they do have a, a chapter in their own legal deposit that I think would be useful to look at. Uh, uh, there's another uh, internet. <coughs> excuse me. There's another international aspect too. The man the British Embassy uh, phoned up Mr. Robinson, and he was asking what, whether a lot of the British things that bear the Crown copyright notices also has a, a regular UCC mm -hmm. copyright notice, and it is published in the British Center Information Center in New York and elsewhere. His question was whether he would be, they would be subject to the legal deposit, which raises the question whether there is any international comity on governments forgiving one another for legal deposit and this sort of thing. Not only governments, but for example, under many, in the, under the British deposit system, as I recall, an American publisher isn't required to deposit unless it bears a co, uh, an interest with a co-British publisher. And I think the same is true in Canada. Uh, are you planning to exclude categories on the basis of where they originate from or only on the basis of the nature of the material? The nature of the material is all we thought about. So you would think that we'd be requiring the same type of deposits no matter where the work originated, even if it was never imported into or otherwise exploited in this country? I think oh, no, that no. Well, no, no, no. Uh, under 407, I think there's... Oh, it has to be published in the United States. I'm sorry, I confused that with 408. Yeah, but right. it, it doesn't have to be printed here. No, it, no it, published. Uh, yeah. yeah. Published. I'm not sure what the trust of your question is. Well, no, that, you, that, that clarification answers the question right, of my right, question. Okay. I hadn't drawn that distinction between the mm -hmm. But the question was, wasn't it, whether we ought to study the, the, the depot legal systems in other countries? Other countries. Yeah. Which is a good question. There may be some study <laughs> on that, so what is done. Well, I'm, I'm saying Betty Dunn did one. And, oh, uh, yeah, well, and uh, I, did, I think it could be brought up to date. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's changed that material. There are some proposals floating. Well, the yeah. systems might not have changed, but the nature of the material that's published, microform as opposed to mm -hmm. print, for example, has certainly changed as a study. Good the point. That is a good point, Michael. Okay. The, uh, the one other thing we, we just we agreed in that meeting, I just wonder if anybody here has objections to it or weren't at that meeting, was it? We are expecting any day or any week now a legal brief from the testing industry. The attorney who's been in contact with me who was retained. And our, our agreement was that we would ship that right over the U.S. subcommittee, and it would become your concern, at least for the present, and not in the basis of any legal study, or indeed not even the basis of a response. Right? This ties in with the sort of thing that we're now sending to ISO, where we're looking at proprietary and other sort of limited access uh -huh. materials. And just finally, one, one point for Gail, I forgot to mention while Mark's here, is that you'll have to leave room on your application form for a uh, statement required by the Privacy Act when you leave solicit information from individuals. <laughs> okay. Is that it? Yep. All right. Um, well, we're way behind, and I think we, we should try to decide what we're going to do. We will return in uh, really, really. But uh, should we return about 1.30? Does that give us time enough, or do we need to a quarter of two? We may need an hour. We can try to get back in 45 minutes. I guess the restrooms are too crowded now. <coughs> Does anybody need an hour? Can we try it in 45 minutes? Let's do it in, uh, in uh, 45 minutes.
we'll, we'll, we'll receive it shortly after. Shortly after. I'd rather have two meetings and have a free discussion. That's my own feeling. Is there any? Yeah. Uh, I've detected that. Okay. I was going to make a suggestion. Maybe Marlene disagrees with me, but it seems like the records area ties in a lot with what we've been doing before. We might switch the order. All right. What is your, what is your suggestion? Go on, go straight to records. Go, no, we'll go straight to what we're doing now, but <clears throat> put your... I think, well, speaking for myself on the organization things, I don't have a lot to cover. I think the jukebox and uh, cable area don't touch a lot of areas. What would you like to hear about? Well, my feeling was, and this was based on discussions uh, with uh, Mary and Penny, that uh, we probably ought to have a separate meeting a little later on, entirely on organization, or reorganization. And uh, uh, we could kind of go over that rather fast. And then, well, I, but I, that didn't include the jukebox and cable. And the other thing, what was it? Well, the, the pr pr production control and the administrative support. These things I think we could probably deal with this afternoon, maybe. But uh, is your suggestion that when we come back, instead of going to, to Lou, that we go straight to, Ma to Mark? Uh, Mark no, no, I would suggest we go to Lou and keep going in the uh, area we're in. All right. Could I use some more to put on the road? Because I think I might be going to uh, his, uh, he got a message from his wife that it's snowing in New Jersey and she wants him to leave her. <laughs> she suggested. Uh, <laughs> she suggested. It. She ordered it. Ordered it. Okay. Uh, let's 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 break this up. Yeah. Uh, okay. So we'll go with you when we're starting. I feel that way too. Some of these proposals. Right. So, uh, I think my groups are prepared to cut their presentation, but they would like to make a choice. By all means, okay, fine. Uh, it's been suggested that since uh, Mike has to leave early and he wants to hear Tim, and uh, <coughs> since Joan has to leave early, that we uh, reshuffle a little bit and have Tim now, then Joan, and then we'll go on to Lou. How's that? Okay. So go ahead. Are, are we shooting for a say shortly after five? Yeah, we'll, we, I'll, I'll, I'll make I'll make a know. promise. We won't go beyond five. Okay. okay. I, I have I need to leave. Fine. Five okay. fifteen. Fine. Probably. Okay. Leave we won't go beyond five. Okay. Whatever. Uh, go ahead. Tim. Okay. Uh, well, as you notice from looking through the outline, that Mike Shelley had, we overlap in a lot of the states. A lot of decisions made by his staff not going to have an effect on us. He's a member of my task group also, so we've got a good kind of communication going between us. And I've kept pretty close contact with him. I've asked people, for, one person from my task group to sit on the curves so he can relay to me information. And uh, my main concern was making sure that everybody that made any decisions that would affect the surgery deposit office could be anybody, would at least consider us and contact me so I can put them in contact with the proper person. I'm just going to basically go down this outline. I think it's probably quicker, and let you know what we've done so far. Where we're, we're aiming towards some decisions, as we study. Uh, the first area in space, that's something that we put off for the time being because we can draw most information from already, from already published sources and from uh, information that Vince and Neil Boyd can have on the present space department and what's happening out there right now. Uh, First area where we come towards where we arrive at a conclusion is the disposition of the record keeping requirement for section 407 copies. Uh, I gave an assignment which I got back last week, and a recommendation uh, this I haven't distributed yet to the task group members for their comments. But they have suggested that if we are responsible for keeping those copies, and it's not been determined yet that we are, uh, they've recommended holding them for a period holding them for a period of time. Uh, they haven't determined a time limit yet. And uh, then we'll have to consult with the acquisitions task group if it's determined they are going to be our responsibility to see if the library will eventually want a selection process of these non selected materials again or not. Of course, also we're going to have to consider the possibility of holding them to see if we're going to get a 408 application. Well, this is the this is the question we were talking about just before the break, yeah. and it's 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 just we're looking at it from the other end. Okay, okay, fine. Okay. Uh, D, we 
had several uh, discussions about the possibility of establishing our own records center. And I called it the Federal Records Center because that was what was used in the, in the law. The, the title itself is necessarily important. The uh, thought seems to be basically, from what we've been able to determine through looking at the hearings that were held, the comments made by various officers of the library and the comments made by the library's task group about the preservation of copyright deposits, that the copyright office should have an archival function of some sort. And the basic idea seems to be to hold the items as long as we possibly can. And we were throwing around the possibility of having our own record center so that we maintain the proper control over them as far as security, climate control, all these various items that have to do with preservation. We haven't reached a, deci a decision on that yet. Mike was meeting with GSA people to see about their requirements and their possibilities of assisting us. And I, I just this mic, not this yeah. mic. Yeah, this right. mic, right. Shelly. Okay. Actually, both mics did. Right. Okay. Confused them, too. And I, haven't ha I don't have a, uh, any, I don't know if you have anything finalized on that yet. That, but I yeah, we're, we're still working on that. Okay, well, but we are considering that problem. Uh, now, E, the need for these definitions. We've sort of come to the conclusion, which we're, unless we uh, hear from other people that they don't think it's a good idea, we're just going to recommend in our position paper that this definition of identifying portions of reproductions might be put off for the future because it seems like the law was written so that this is a possibility if it's ever necessary. And we feel like there's no need to make an inflexible statement right now, rather uh, make an indication in our position paper that we're aware of this problem, that sometime in the future these decisions <coughs> may be made, rather than, than binding us right now to a decision we might regret 30 or 40 years from now. I've got a, a uh, paper just Monday, uh, a study that was done, concerned this for the longest period, considerable, considered practical, cool, and desirable. <coughs> and this basically comes to the same conclusion. Again, looking at the whole history of the hearings and the basic attitudes that we've uncovered through statements and documents. Uh, I think I've got a quote written out there somewhere. In the yeah, uh, this study feels that the spirit of the law tends to keeping our deposit copies as long as possible. It would be inappropriate to make recommendations at this time what practical and desirable is. That's something that we've done in the future. Well, this, this was addressed to both the identifying portions and the practical and desirable, right. or just uh, the, both? The, the identifying portion was not that this was reached a consensus, just a discussion. I see, the I table. see. Okay. The, uh, the uh, practical and desirable. There was a, uh, Vince did a study on that, and he's got supporting documents from Senate and House hearings and reports. Right. And when he came to that conclusion on the, on the basis of that. Plus, I think it was a statement by you made at one time, and he had a copy of a memo that uh, Mr. Stevens had sent to you. We have a copy of the Librarian's Task Group report uh, pertaining to copyright deposits. Right. And it all seems to have a pretty strong case for maintaining control of the Well, certainly for not uh, setting right. uh, arbitrary dates now. I think that's undoubtedly right. Now, are these papers flowing in somewhere, or are they going to? They will. I've got them both okay. now, and I haven't. Right. I distributed one to some of the task group members, but I haven't. They're coming to me, and I have to run down and xerox them, and then put them together, and ship them out, and wait for them for the replies. And the second paper, business paper, I haven't had a chance to do that yet. Fair enough. Okay. And we're waiting for replies and comments on that. And now I will also send them up to the coordinating committee as a result of our discussion this morning. <laughs> um, is that agreeable? And then I don't. I don't think we have to make a decision now as to whether or not anybody else should see them, or do we? Uh, I would rather not make that decision myself. I would prefer yeah, to we'll, wait. You'll make yeah, it. We'll, all right, we'll fine. That that's okay. done. All right. Fair I think we really do need to have all the working papers, though, that you're sending to your committee members. I'm not sure that we're getting all of those. And if our function is to see that other uh, <coughs> task groups concerned get the benefit of what's going on in your committee, we really need to see those. So if you've sent anything, if any task group has <coughs> sent anything to your members that you haven't sent to us, we'd appreciate getting some copies of those. Okay. Well, as far as F1 goes for the page full term deposits, we've tossed this around in meetings, and we've come to the conclusion that a separate storage and security and preservation requirements are probably going to be necessary for page full term deposits. Uh, what, what does that mean? The paid full term deposit. No, I mean the separate. Uh... Uh, well, the, the basic attitude was that if they're paying for storage, they're entitled to expect a higher degree of control and security over the materials. And also, the uh, certain preservation policies might have to be instituted. We haven't, we haven't 
gone into that too yeah. deeply and we're sort of waiting to see if we were on the right track. Well, I certainly wouldn't say you weren't. Uh, it seems to me that there's a great deal to be said for what you are now proposing or hypothesizing. But uh, it has to tie in, obviously, with what we charge and right. uh, so forth and so on. And it's uh, well, it may get into a very complicated area just as far as the actual physical storage goes. And we have to separate paid full term from non paid full term. And how we make the charge is periodical. We might have to pull this out of paid full term and put it into regular. So it might be possible that we're going to come up with a recommendation that because of all the variables involved, it might be better just to go ahead and store it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if we do that and people find out about it, nobody's going to ask for paid full term storage. <laughs> if they know that we're storing it anyway. True. That's right. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. Um, I asked uh, some members of my group to do a study on red files that exist and possible uses of it under the, under the new bill. And I got the response from that at the end of last week. And they have come up with specific recommendations. I didn't bring a copy of them here, but I sort of briefly got into my notes. They recommended that the no replies and uh, published copies for which registration has been refused, that are presently in the red file, when they get these more than five years old, they'd be transferred to the Library of Congress or made accessible to Library of Congress for selection if there are no legal aspects involved. We haven't investigated the legal aspects that may involve Wait a minute. No replies and what was the other? No replies and the published copies which have been deposited for which registration has been refused. And rejections. And rejections, yeah. Published rejections. <laughs> okay. Uh, also, they of all classes, no matter what. Of all classes, of what's what they, they brought out the point that there could be a problem because we have no time limit for appeals right now. And if we dispose of these in some manner or they get this selected by the library, and two years later we have an appeal coming in, there might be a very strong problem to satisfy them until we don't have a copy any longer. They felt also that the unpublished, all unpublished copies in the red file, unpublished material should be retained, should not be disposed of, because very often that's the only copy extant, or the only copy we're ever going to get a hold of. And they asked for the possibility of getting a policy decision as to what the red file should contain and disposal program if that's necessary. Let me, get, let me make sure I've got this straight. Uh, someone would read the file. Uh, presumably, after five, after years. five years, and we're transferred to the library. Any uh, no replies and any rejections in a uh, published or ostensibly published. Right. Obviously, there are borderline cases. That may be the reason we didn't register. It wasn't there was it's published. Uh, are there any thoughts on this? Well, I presume that if the library doesn't want them, that we're saying get rid of them through E and G. Yeah, because we certainly can't force them down the library's throat. Do we have to preserve something in case it rejects it clearly to show what the nature of Yeah, that's why I'm surprised nobody is picking up on this. I would have thought there would be more uh, feeling along that one. That's my feeling. <laughs> well, that's the biggest problem, I think. I don't agree with you. One area I don't think we've covered is this rejection index or catalog that we've discussed ever so briefly, and maybe it should be tied in with that as a special assignment. Well, now, whose who's, uh, task group does that fall on? We're considering that also. You, that's under oh, yours, too. Uh, an we're index. considering, I don't know if we're tying with okay. anybody else. Okay, I didn't know what it, I, okay, fine. Isn't there a separate group that's doing yeah. indexes for records? Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, right, right. Yeah, as I understand it, we're going to come up with suggestions, ideas, and recommendations and give them to uh, Jim's, or to Jim for his task group, since they're going to be tying all the indexes and records together. Well, yeah, the two, two are closely related. I'm inclined to agree with Pat, but we have to be very careful about um, disposing of something that would be a, a fundamental part of a record that we're supposed to make. Oh. We don't do that now. We don't do that now. Of course, we got a, the, the, the red file is bulky in many cases. I think that was well, what they were concerned about. Yeah. In a way, we do, it, it's not all that important whether we do it now because, in, at least recently, uh, it, it's under our control until the mandamus action is filed uh, and a rejection. Um, but there aren't going to be any mandamus actions. Uh, <laughs> the fact is that um, if, if we rejected something for registration, uh, we have the opportunity to join an infringement action on the issue of registrability, and we, and we may not have the record. 
Yeah. It wouldn't have sold mm-hmm. somebody bumping there. They might oh, yeah, not right. want to wait until they have a right. defender. Well, you know, the question will be whether they still need it. The that's motivations exactly. for the recommendation are really just bulk, isn't that I it? think that's yeah. what it was. Well, we and have I, to be careful. I yeah. think the possible, this is something that had come to my mind when I was going to bring it up today, is that that's what they're concerned with out there. We're also, I, I we mentioned it later, to discuss the possibility of having a ready and a dead storage. Right? There's a certain number of years transferring material to a dead storage. And Neil has figures on the, the frequency with, with which deposits are requested after a certain length of time. And if that's what is the big concern, it might be a better idea to consider the possibility of putting all this red file material into a dead storage somewhere, maintaining control over it. Well, you posed the problem, and we've had a little discussion right. on it. Let's, let's move on, okay. but fine. Okay. Oh, I'll, now, that Mike Shelley mentioned this problem, the 407 copies that are selected, mm-hmm. and not, uh, it, if 407 copies are selected by the LC and not automatically transferred to them, what do we do with them? Is there our responsibility? As, as deposit copies, and as deposit copies and storage copies, we're going to have to be concerned with that. And I'm, I suppose he'll be in contact with us once the decision is reached as to what to do with those copies. He mentioned I think the very end of his talk. Right. Um, it, well, let me <coughs> ask: Is there anyone here who feels that uh, we should uh, retain 407 deposits? Now, this is not something that's coming in as part of the registration. I mean, it, presumably is something that we know is a 407 deposit. And the library, as it turns out, uh, doesn't want it. I guess this would probably fall into categories like, uh, well, I suspect we, we will be registering uh, Vanity Press stuff, but library doesn't want it, although it would fall into a category that they would say they did, I guess. Uh, does anybody feel that we should retain that? For record purposes. Well, well n- not particularly retain it, but I, I do think we have to address some, at some time the, the, how it's going to be indexed, and two, who's going to look at it and see if the copies are bounding upside down or if it states on its face that it's a paperback and states on its face that it's a hardback edition and this kind of thing. In other words, what's going to be done to examine these copies as they come in, if anything? <coughs> Now, you're talking about everything, not just uh, well, yeah. stuff that the library doesn't That's have. right, yeah. Yeah, well, that's a much bigger problem if you haven't really addressed yeah. it. Yeah. But uh, it, it, obviously, this would you know, tie into that. Any other thoughts on this? You've made your feelings. I think the better the catalog, the less retention necessity of retention would be. Of under what circumstances? <laughs> assuming you assuming did have a catalog, assuming under what circumstances? Well, su- suppose the guy at a, some later date, uh, he, he sent a compliance action and he says, I've already deposited this particular work. Oh, yeah, well, if we don't, if we don't have it and the library doesn't have it, and if it's not cataloged properly in some yeah. identifying way, then it's... Um, is that's not the question. Catalog, do you have to do any of it? Well, that's the question. But we're not thinking really in terms of cataloging the sense of cataloging anything under 407, I didn't think. Um, well, we're going we're to have to make an accurate bibliographic exactly. record of the items. Otherwise, it would be asking for some other reference. Otherwise, it's a catalog. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> to call it that, yes. Um, but the cataloging data, and uh, as far as extent, need not be as great as, as some other types of catalog. Well, I've what is emerging here is an issue. We're going to have to, to, to come to grips with how far we go. And what you're saying, I think it's true, is that if we go pretty far, then we don't need to worry so much about retaining. Okay. Yeah. One brief point. If we if we get in the habit of, of holding on to 407 items for any length of time, then I wonder if we would be able to resist someone who came in later and seeking registration and would say, well, I've already given you the copies. You've got them on hand. Why don't you apply those for registration? The answer is that they, they did not accompany. Yeah. Well, that's another issue, isn't it? <laughs> Right. We, uh, Mike and I briefly discussed the possibility of having a kind of application form that would be in, we would encourage it, but it would be entirely optional, containing the name of the remitter, the title of the work, and minimum other bit of information. And on that form, we would ask the remitter to sign a statement to the effect that I understand I am submitting these copies for deposit only, not for registration, and that the Copyright Office has the authority to dispense with them. Mm-hmm. 
one problem with that is, of course, that I, I believe 407 really makes no provision for us to require well, anything other than the copies. There's, we can't require any company in forms or anything else. Uh, Waldo suggested the need for some examination of this material. I would suggest that that's the function of LC. It may be. There it may be. It may be. Okay, uh, that's a val very valid point. It may be. Yeah. If it's right. defective, then the Right. Come back to us and say, get us a replacement. Yeah. Pages are missing in this. That's right. In fact, this happens that way sometimes. You know. They're the ones that discover it. Is it? I don't know. Yeah. Well, I Compendium has some yeah. data. Uh, Mark. Yeah. What about the requirement that it be a best, the best edition? <coughs> Uh, I was in direct contention with what the, with, with the library, what the best edition is. Sure. No. But it's still a case of, of identifying, uh, Mark's question, I think somebody has to identify that those copies received under 407 were in fact best edition. Sometimes the copies contain statements on them themselves that indicate they're not the best edition. Mm -hmm. no. Again, I would say let LC make that determination. It's for them. And the notice requirements, too, are involved there. Are they not? Yes, they yeah. are. Only to the extent that it has the notice if we take compliance action. Mm -hmm. If they care to give us copies that don't bear a notice, then they're gift copies rather than legal yeah, deposit I'm copies. And we do get a good number of those now. I guess I'm suggesting we. I raised this question in the register at another meeting a while ago, and everybody got very excited about it. But just for the purpose of 407, you're not suggesting we correspond about a notice. Just for now, 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 this does raise an interesting question because if there are cases <laughs> where today we register claims and send people a letter saying, next time you ought to put the notice some, somewhere else, et cetera, et cetera, well, I understand, to try to help them. I understand we want to do that under 408. Yeah. But is anybody suggesting now that we're going to do that under 407? <laughs> are we going to have a separate All exam? Right. Individual? <laughs> <laughs> not, not personally, though. <laughs> I could somebody else do that. That would constitute a receipt. <laughs> well, there is some examination. Mark pointed out about whether it is the best edition. Correct. You must not see. by us, Joe. Well, uh, well, it deposited with us. We are. Uh, I would. Conflict? I'd be happier if we could say we are the receiving agency. These are by law for LC. It's up it, to them to determine. Question. Uh, and then we, if it's not the best edition and it was so, we would. Uh, we would take the action. Write the letter. What's your, what the, the logical extension of what you're saying is that the LC would take care of all the compliance actions. No. Why not? Well, oh, you mean on 407? Yeah. No. Well, that's the only compliance action is 407. But the question well, is, if we, if we, I'm sorry, go on. No, it is not a logical extension of that. Well, okay. <laughs> well, the, the statutory language is the required copies of phone records shall be deposited in the copyright office for the use or disposition of the Library of Congress. And there's no question that we are the agent that receives it. Uh, but, but it's not, I mean, it is for discussion and uh, decision as between the copyright office and the <laughs> Library of Congress proper as to who does what once we've gotten the copies. I think we're obliged to do the the getting of the copies. That's all our, our responsibility. Beyond that, I think it's a little fuzzy, and I think we should do it in the most efficient way possible. If we don't leave it up to LC, we're going to have to set up an examination process for every single submission. But are they going to set up an examination process, or is the public going to be diddled out of you know what? good copies? Look at the well, of good copies. That's, that's it. Look at the motion picture agreement the operation has. <coughs> we don't have much compliance operation in motion pictures. But we are responsible for administering it with the best edition requirement as defined in the library's regulations for requiring a motion picture. And that's one aspect of the broad problem of compliance. Yeah. But the question of good copy is administered through E and G. Yeah, but that's a kind of a special case of very yeah, valuable copies. They're not going to do that with books. What you're talking about now comes pretty close to yeah. Any response we make to a depositor saying this is not the best edition, I would think should be done as timely. Oh, it's what possible. <laughs> and if we if we pass on the paper paper bound uh, copies to the library, it might be months before they discover that, that they don't you know that they have that. And it's been hard bound by that time. They've already spent binding fees anyhow. Um, the library doesn't really have a mechanism for I think for ex 
examining best copy down the answer will end up us as we indicated. Yeah. And uh, if we decide we are going to be in the, in the business of uh, cataloging to whatever extent these 407 copies here, maybe that would be the time in which to make a determination of best edition. I'm really interested to yeah. refer to and try to put that burden on the Alsi Selection Office. I would disagree. Uh, I think on balance. Uh, yeah. Now the issue of, of a person, in fact, is not sent in the best edition. Is that is he in compliance with 407? If he sent in a you know upside down printed copy paper bound or a, a different motion picture, I mean, is he is he in compliance with 407? Uh, we have a, a strong compliance function that we talked about earlier this morning. Uh, 407 so says compliance action by the registry. Yeah. So uh, <coughs> we couldn't wait for the library. To it's just, I don't think it would work efficiently, Bob. I think we'd have a big mess. And furthermore, I'm assuming that in many of these cases we're going to write and say, don't you really want to go on and register anyway? If we have to write at all, um, we would have to write in the case of best edition. Somebody would have to write. Well, we're hoping we won't have to write. You're answering the question about what does the company mean if we're going to write. We're going to well, if, <coughs> if, 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 I would say that this is not going to arise all that often. But uh, to the extent that it does, it would seem to me that we're, there are going to be a certain percentage that we have to write about. Right. And uh, that sounds like a function of compliance for the people could do it. That's all that's my point. Yeah, <laughs> well, the compliance people would also have all the indexes and records of what has been received. <laughs> so it seems to me it would be the most mm -hmm. place for it. And getting to that, we had also as soon as anybody else have any comments. I was wondering if this is what Waldo calls examination. It could be some sort of a technician review, maybe perhaps even done in, in service in the search and connect area, or not called assembly. You wouldn't have to. It doesn't sound like it's real examination. That might work pretty well. For I think you could do it that way. Well, one question Bob does raise is what is the, how is is this going to interface with s the selection officer's operations? Because the selection officer, when she selects the thing. Is not going to know which one it is, 407 or 408, or, or, or I don't know whether she's going to care or not. Oh, she is going to know. I, we, we've got to make sure she knows that, and, and, and that they know that, that these copies are not going to be available for selection in the future. Because they, when they go down the table, they know that if they don't select it, it's going to deposit copies facility for a number of years under 408. But 407 is a whole different ballgame. Mm -hmm. If but, things but, go the way they But yeah. if they have two weeks to, to in which to submit the application, to, to make it sure it's a 408, then you're not going to submit it to selection officer until the application comes and joins it. Is that right? We, yeah, we're not going to put it up on the table, I wouldn't think, until we knew what we were putting up on the table. Then you're going to withhold from the library things for a And that's, weeks. of course, Waldo, one of my, one of my arguments for, for interpreting uh, okay. Thank you. a company <laughs> very strictly. Isn't this at variance of what we do now? Don't we, when we have copies come by themselves before we even connect them? Exactly. Have that's one right. to the library? Yeah. That's right. right. We, we do that now, but we cause it only requirements. Right. It's, it's going to be different. Why does it matter? So they get one and they find out later whether it's 407 or 408. They don't do anything different with it, do they? No, the, the, the point is, though, that uh, they're doing the selecting according to a bunch of guidelines, and they're doing it really on an ad hoc basis. So, you know, they don't look up at everything. And uh, they know when they don't select something, they know in the back of their mind, well, if I make a mistake on this, it's going to be available at deposit copies. We can always call it back. But they won't have that on 407s because if they make a mistake, it's gone. Bob. Good point. What, uh, what troubles me in all this is our trying to, uh, to perform a selection process that really is essentially the library's handling it. <coughs> No, no, it's a best edition as it's laid period. out in our regulations. And uh, it's, a, it's based on criteria, but it's our regulations that are going to determine. Um, we're talking about a fraction of the cases, I hope. I hope so, too. Um, they, they have to look at the material anyway from a variety of viewpoints. They will have these. There may be times when they can make the decision right then and there. All right, this may not be quite the best, but this is this is a piece of junk. Uh, we'll take the next best, or they'll throw it out, and the question never comes up anyway. Uh, 
assuming they throw a, a large a por point. proportion of it, we would be stuck with making a lot of decisions that were were not useful. At all. You'd like the, they might like the next to best edition right now, as against a better edition three weeks from now because congressmen are howling for the thing or something. Yeah, they might take a paperback yeah. to gladly use some of these. Okay, um, let me just ask, and we've got to move on, but. Uh, in, in regard to the whole selections process, is this being addressed? It's pretty unsatisfactory. This is, it, it's in your We're favor. talking, we're talking with them. Yeah. Now, to say that it, that it is satisfactory or is not, we have to, I have to ask from, his, from whose viewpoint. <coughs> from, the, from the library's viewpoint, uh, many, of the, many of the professional people within the library think it's a, it's a very shaky operation. Well, that's what I'm really reflecting. No, as far as the copyright office yeah, is concerned, it's no sweat. I don't know how much we can. Policy does not select a lot of material they should. Yes, yeah, really. And the standards don't seem to be. It's they're kind of hit or miss. In many cases. I am not too clear as to what criteria they use. And I'm, I'm wondering whether this is something we should worry about at all or just let nature take its course. Well, I think the way to express your trouble mind on that would be through your representative on the acquisition committee, which said that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like you guys. So. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure we'll win on well, obviously, in the um, in the compliance activity, we will be able to open up new areas of acquisition for the library that have not existed before. I mean, we can go out and get them, <coughs> but if unless unless there's a corresponding improvement in the in the selections process, so that uh, the library knows what it wants and goes ahead and gets it, uh, and for example, doesn't discriminate against certain types of works as against others. Uh, and I think you all know what I'm talking about. Uh, the uh, there is an effect on us, no question about it, because we do we end up keeping a lot of other of stuff that they <coughs> might very well be taking. Will the public have any right of recourse or uh, against anyone if we request things under 407 and the library specifically request particular items under 407 and the library doesn't take them? No, we, we I get, don't think We get so. a lot of flack on that. I think it would be very like unfortunate. Newspapers. Yeah. Daily newspapers, we'd send a compliance action to a daily newspaper. And they say, well, I know for a fact, because my congressman tells me so, that you don't keep them in Minneapolis, mm -hmm. so-and-so. Um, why the, the hell do you want it? You want well, this is there's no legal problem. Uh, but there certainly is uh, political, moral, and yeah. politics. Okay. Well, I guess we've exhausted this. Uh, go on. Right. Um, in connection with all of this, whether or not we're going to be responsible for the storage of the 407 copies that aren't selected, we're responsible for sending out a receipt that's provided under 407B, the receipt for the uh, a receipt for the receipt of the deposit copies. So there's going to have to be some sort of record kept, and that's being considered now. As I understand it, we had a meeting about two weeks ago and. Uh, Bob Long from Automation was there, and Vince and, and Mike Shelley, and it was discussed in connection with this whole question of, of boxing the storage, boxing the deposit copies for storage. Uh, that also has to do with cataloging. I've got one of the members of my task group sitting on the cataloging task group to bring things like this to their attention. Uh, whatever system they come up with cataloging, if these deposit copies are going to be cataloged, we'll have to tie in with it so we can send this receipt, this receipt out, because apparently we can't require them to ask for a receipt at the time they submit their copies, we feel like that they should be entitled to ask for a receipt at any time. We have to have the records of the receipt. And consequently, the uh, recommendation was made that if, the suggestion was made, that if we are responsible for the storage of the copies, it would be nice to have some sort of a number assigned to these 407 copies that we are responsible for so that we can have access to them for a period of time. And as far as the time limit goes, I think a three-year period just came up off the as an arbitrary figure to keep the 407 copies waiting for a 408 application or waiting to determine if the library wants it again. I see Mike shaking his head. Three years? 
three years, they said. And I, I, haven't, I, I haven't had a chance to talk to them as to why they want to keep it that long. They recommended keeping it a little longer than three years. <laughs> well, I think what they were aiming at was not the, if there's, if there's a determination made that we're not responsible for those seven copies, then a short period of time, like two or three weeks, would be the appropriate sure. time to keep it to wait to see if a parole application comes in. But if we are responsible for storing the 408, the 407 copies also, in other words, if they don't go directly to the library and the library disposes of them, then a determination will be have to made as to how long we're going to be responsible for those 407 copies. And I think that was the, where the three-year figure came in. It would be much nicer if we came to a determination that we aren't going to be responsible for those copies. Well, I suspect that's what will come to right here. Uh, let's press on. Okay. Uh, Section 302E, presumption of death, that's been assigned. That could create a problem for the storage if we have to store the different types of materials that we have and tie the storage to the term of copyright protection. And the uh, study has come out, again, utilizing this background material on the idea that it's the archival function of the office to keep all this material. There's nothing in the law that specifically ties the length of storage to the term of copyright protection. So uh, if we follow that line of thinking, we aren't going to be tied to a three or four tier storage area so that these items can be withdrawn from storage at the termination of 50 or 75 or 100 years. You're saying that, well, there is a, there is a provision that requires us to keep uh, uh, unpublished material right. for the life of the copyright. Um, you're saying there isn't anything that requires us to dispose of it at that mm -hmm. point. That's what you're saying. That's right. So that uh, we don't need to have any kind of... Uh, tie-in between the death dates and the, uh, and the deposit copies. On the other hand, uh, the, the question, and I, this was, I don't think it's in this, but I, it was in something I saw uh, that you're asking is whether or not we could, if we wanted to dispose of it, we could use the presumptions. Mm, right. It's in here. Somewhere. It is in there somewhere. somewhere. Okay. Um, but my first reaction was that we're not going to have to worry about this for 50 years. That's right. So, um, <laughs> this, this is somebody else is, however, I think it might be an area that the public, this is an area that yeah. has an effect on the public specifically when it's tied into the paid full term storage. So, uh, the public might want to know when they make their payment for the paid full term storage how much they're going to get it stored. And this, I'm going to bring this up later. This, it, it might be appropriate when we determine what the fee for this paid full term storage is going to be and when we want to receive a request for it. If we notify these people that if we don't receive a notification of death or a statement of still living, within that yeah, statutory period, it's going to be removed from storage okay. if necessary. And I think they should know at the time they make the payment. That's my personal view on it. Okay, now the ultimate system of storage. This is a legal question. So right. It's a, a first determination will have to be made, I think, of whether we want to notify these people that are making their pay full term request at what the consequences are. And the alternate systems of storage, that's still being worked on. I was talking to Michael, again, this was Michael Shelley. Uh, there have been some suggestions and proposals made as to the storage of the copies by Bob Long and some, and they're working on that. That, of course, has a strong effect on whatever we initially do. And the cost of different types of storage systems is going to be tied in with every area. Once we get into the area where we can study the actual suggestions, I presume that the cost is going to have some effect on decisions made between Mike and, and uh, Bob Long. All right. I've got an assignment out on this preservation security on all of the items except C. And that's sort of continuing consultation. And basically, I understand that the uh, acquisitions people are meeting with the library on alternative deposits that would be acceptable. This assignment was just the was given out a week and a half, but I haven't gotten any kind of response on it. As far as records and access, this uh, 407B receipt request, the task group's du uh, duties of the people I've given that assignment to are to, they include the, the design of the request, such as it's going to be, I foresee it being much more important than just a little, a little not, not the, excuse me, not the design of the request, it's something the design of the receipt. Mm -hmm. But it's necessary that we keep a file of it for ourselves and just send them, them the receipt, also the routing of it and the storage of it. Uh, I presume they're still working on that. That assignment was given out last week also. 
request for full-term storage that was covered up. I love the American, uh, well, it's, it's being covered by the same person who's doing the study on the 302 exemption that have sent it back to within a few years. The, this full-term storage creates a lot of problems, the request for full-term storage, because uh, the law says the register may, the, the cost of providing the service may be used as the basis for, for the charges. It's 711E, I think. 708.11, Such cases the register may fix on the basis of the cost of providing the service. We had discussions as to whether this cost should be so high as to discourage people from requesting full pay, full term pay yes. <laughs> uh, Whether it should be a fee that's based on the actual cost of providing the service, that would include personnel, security, climate control, indexes to the material, the, the whole area that's connected with the special type of storage would also involve uh, how this cost is to be determined. We have some figures from GSA on the per annum cost in today's dollars of storage by GSA per cubic foot and storage and under regular office conditions per cubic foot. Ranged from 54 cents to six dollars and 57 cents. 54 cents for GSA storage is over six dollars for office storage. The determination is going to have to be made if we follow this cost basis. Uh, what is going to be the cost over a period of 75 years or 100 years? And then is the fee to be paid all at once or periodically? If it's paid all periodically, once. we uh, have to have some sort of a system for removing it from storage if the, pay if the payment's not made. The, uh, <coughs> the, the, the framework of this is entirely regulatory. We don't have to grant the request in the first right. place. And, uh, we're going to have to have hearings on this or some kind of consultation. He's doing a very good job of hitting the alternatives. Absolutely. I think all the questions yeah. you're, a you're asking have to be uh, addressed in the... Well, now, would you prefer uh, us to just, since regulations are going to have to are going to have to be hearings, just to send you a list of areas that we think are a consideration and let the hearings go on first or make some recommendations? Make, recommend, make recommendations. I think recommendations, yeah. yeah. Make recommendations. It's entirely probable that we should put out a proposed rulemaking on this and get comments okay. on what we're proposing rather than just asking for suggestions out of the right. blue. Don't you agree? Okay. Tim, where do you see the pressure for paid full-term storage coming from? So any particular industry or group? Well, I mentioned in the meeting I think we had yesterday that I I don't really know where it's going to come from, especially if we don't have the same, if we provide the same type of storage for paid full-term and non-paid full-term, <coughs> the public's aware of that. There's not going to be much need for requesting the paid full-term. So and if, if the cost is so high, if it's actually based on a cost basis, you can't rent a safety deposit box for $25 a year. We're talking about a 75-year period. Uh, and I, but apparently some people think there are. Well, why is this provision in the law? I mean, yeah. Where did it come from? May I? And you know, of course, all about this. But but the first I ever heard of it, John, was a man named Mr. Cannon, who was at Paul and Paul in Philadelphia. He represented Bloomcraft, and there was some big litigation involving a product catalog, a line of products. And we had tossed the catalog, and he, he said, I would have been willing to pay for this. He wrote letters to Mr. This was Bar Association yeah. stuff. Right. There, was a, there was a lot of support right. for that at the exactly. time. And that was at a time when we were tossing a great deal more than we That's are right. now. That's I right. think this, there's been less, you're not as aware of this as you, we were back in the right. 60s when we tossed a gigantic amount. It still comes up, but right. not nearly as often. You don't see this being attributed to any particular industry or particular field? Or this like was greeting cards, or no. the catalogs. Catalogs, catalogs. product catalogs. Yeah, I remember the case. Yeah. <coughs> I think you finally won a case anyway. Well, that's just it. People can frequently muddle through even yeah. without the uh, records, but it does put an off lawyer in an awful position, yeah. especially when they've had successive versions yeah. and it's hard to tell what was in right. what version. Sometimes it puts lawyers in a very excellent position, not to have a side they're on. <laughs> <laughs> even the plate. <laughs> well, uh, there. Well, it's in the law anyway, right. and uh, <laughs> I think. Uh, <laughs> I just wonder where we can spend. <laughs> I don't think we're going to get that much request. Uh, I could see that uh, in areas where uh, I can see unpublished people wanting to do it in some cases, mm -hmm. where uh, there's an e ego matter involved and they want it preserved for all time. They know it's going to be tossed otherwise. Yeah. But um, I don't think it's going to be a major workload either. 
I don't think so, but we, got, we have to consider it. Oh, yeah, we have yeah. to have And I would like to ask everybody here that has any ideas on that to send those up to me, because it's very hard for us to be objective. When, when we're looking at the possibilities that it's going to have on just the flow of material down there and everything, we have, our, we have some ideas, and we're trying to keep a balance. But I'm sure everybody else can come up with some pros and cons for it. And we'd like to have all of those to at least present up to John to have some regulation. Uh, okay. I would emphasize that. The request for copies of deposit copies, which is 3A3, has to be assigned yet. We haven't gotten into this in yet. And then this number four, the number 302 A, B, and C to determine which are storage. As I mentioned, this ties in with the report that I just got back early part of this week. Saying this is there's no indication in the law that there's a requirement. That's fine. Look at the heading, John. Is the heading yeah. what you that's, want? That's what I was going to say. Just to give us a prior answer. Oh, this is impressive, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> we saw the thing. We don't no, have this a, is all on tape, you understand. We don't have it printed yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't say it. You ruined everything. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you can, you, can, you, can you excise <laughs> that? Can you outtake that? <laughs> no, I can't edit that. No way. Thanks, Joe. <laughs> um, while we're talking about requests for copies of deposit copies, um, maybe in your discussions with the photo Duke, uh, you could range a little bit beyond the parochial questions of library photocopy and uh, discuss a little bit about the, you know, the possibility of them setting up a facility here, here in Pistol City, or here in the Copyright Office, or having our own and that type of thing, which does turn them green, I know. But uh, nevertheless, uh, we are now in, in, in an era where we're going to have to make a lot of copies of copies, uh, and not just records, but the actual deposit copies. And uh, when we are physically separated from photo, this was just murder. Uh, and uh, it does seem to me we're on the, on the verge of having to think of, in terms of having our own and not machine just, here, whether they're right. running it or not. Right, because yeah. that man's trouble is just beginning. Uh, oh, yeah, that's uh, right. You might want to break this up in a friendly way. If we do, if we do get into the situation where we decide that we are responsible for the intellectual content, then we should film things as soon as possible after we after we record them here, before they're dispersed and sent to facilities. So oh yeah. We would have to have the equipment. Okay, I just mentioned this. In fact. Okay, under this records and access area, also the uh, last five and six. The file of rejected material. Again, that's going to be determined. That, that type of file is going to be determined on how we're going to index it <coughs> and how we're going to store it. If, if the rejected material is going to be assigned a number, or if it's going to the access is going to be gotten to it for retrieval through the title or the author or something like that, and we're going to be after our meeting yesterday, we're going to be in consultation with Jim Roberts to me because he has a basic record problems there. The same way with the showing the location of deposits, if we determine that we can't have a ready and dead storage. We'll have to know whether it's in transit between the two, whether it's in ready or it's, or it's in dead. Um, alternative to use of history cards, we discussed that in our test meetings. I've talked around with some other people also, and I think this still ties in with the, uh, with the question of how we're going to store the material that Mike Shelley is carrying on, the discussion that he's carrying on with uh, Bob Long, because if uh, some sort of a system that they were suggesting, suggesting does develop, it's possible that we could use the automated system as a location guide to the, instead of using the green history card. I don't want to. I don't know if it would be worthwhile going into the whole development of that now because I don't know where it's I would. I would only say that, that what we're talking about would would in no way supplant the history. It card. would not. It, it's we're talking about something much more abbreviated. History cards would have to continue at least until the end process okay. system is fully well, operational. In that sense, we've also discussed having history cards for every class of materials and just books and materials because they are important. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. And of course, the cost of the very record, record keeping systems that has to be done in conjunction with Jim Roberts and his committee. Uh, the other considerations is the possible need for a time limit when requests for the copy of the deposit and the full assembly. We feel like it should be 
forever. Because we're going to have the records here and we're going to have indexes to them. Any, the only question would be who would be allowed to ask for a, a receipt for copies of the deposit. And I don't, we haven't discussed that too completely, but we, don't, we haven't had any indication from anybody that we shouldn't honor such a request from anyone. I don't know if anybody has any ideas or thoughts on that. I'm not, I'm not. Would it be like a search report, a request for a search report in the 407 file? I don't understand. Suppose someone, Mary, wanted to give somebody else a hard time and uh, wanted to know whether certain copies were deposited mm -hmm. of somebody of his competitor's works mm -hmm. under 407. He's saying, I'm having to deposit, mm -hmm. and uh, is, he gonna, is he having to do it? And he would want a, a, a copies of the receipts, or he would want a receipt or a search report right, or something right. like that. Yeah. Also, yeah, somebody might be trying to pull something on the treble damages provisions. Well, well, the question, well I, think, I think your your question is not just the depositor. He can request at any time, too, presumably. Right. Yeah. Right. But that's, yeah. that's a very, is it going to be subject to a search, an actual search or a paid search of the record? It depends on how the records are made. Yeah. You know, which is not a receipt. I mean, it, it would serve. Service. Possibly serve same, as, a, as a report. Cost more than two, you know, it's going to cost more than $2, obviously. Uh, but do, you know, do these other people have the right, and that's a question I need to know, really, you know, is do, the, do other people have the right to, to that information? Sir. Can they just write in and say, I want to know if there's a registration or if there's, uh, if you have a record of receipt? And as a matter of course, if we search anything that we search, uh, do we also have to see if and make a report on whether the copies have been received? Because there are people who are checking the works of their ancestors and this kind of thing. I heard my grandfather published a pamphlet, and they're not really interested in the copyright facts. They're interested in whether such a work exists. Well. 7083 calls for the issuance of a receipt for a deposit under section 407, two dollars. I can't see any need for restricting that to the to the person who deposited it. I, I realize that was probably what was intended. But well, can we take that as and go forward from that instead of putting a lot of things in the alternative? Can they just well, take that as deciding? Why? Because that has reference to 407. 407 says the register of copyright shall, when requested by the depositor, yeah. and upon payment no, of the fee. Right. Yeah, so I, it would be a copy of the Yeah, receipt, well, okay. He <laughs> <laughs> gets a copy of the copy. By the way, <laughs> would we. Uh, what kind of paper and how long? <laughs> yeah. this, is a, this is a question. Well, it gets down to Jim's question. It's, it's a matter of search. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. This, just as a, as a practical matter, I would think that the, that the request for a receipt should be made simultaneously with the uh, with the deposit of the copies, because right. often, often you know, we, we receive them, they have no return address on the wrapper, we don't know from whom they have come, and we might issue a receipt to the wrong party, you know, because we wouldn't have any information to the contrary. But under the law, you can require that. Well, it's unclear. It does say when, but it, I'm, I'm sorry. It uses the word when, but it doesn't say when. <laughs> Uh, this is a question uh, relating to that in the spirit of the 1909 law. Uh, if we have a cutoff point for um, deposits that are received where it's unclear where it's a four, whether it's a 408 or a 407 deposit, and we choose after a period of time or simultaneously to treat it as a 407 <coughs> deposit, would we honor a request for a receipt <coughs> for a 407? <laughs> I wish that camera was turned <laughs> on. <laughs> I just I assume that that that, that that's on your agenda. <laughs> I think a person can get a receipt even though they made the deposit in 408. I think so. Yeah. Let's go on. Let's go on. Yeah. Okay. 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 Uh, the last one is the biggest one. Recommending fees and conditions under which requests to pay full term storage should be made and granted because the register has the authority to grant that grant these requests were not granted. And we were just discussing that earlier. We were just like anybody's suggestions that they may have because we've got a, that's a huge area. Yeah, it is. I realize that. I have two or three notes that I put down in the course of the meeting. And mainly they're areas that I saw that would require decisions or regulations that affect your relations with the public and not 
within the office itself. Relations with the office can be taken care of as, as they come up. The person is accompanied by provision of money, which we already covered that. Paid full term, we, we covered that one. Uh, possible regulation regarding the quality control over unpublished material. We're required to keep unpublished material for the full term. And we're also required to uh, make photocopy, to make facsimile reproductions of it, just transferred to the Library of Congress. So uh, the quality control over the material itself, we presume we're going to keep it for the full term, or to, to facilitate copying of it if it's to be transferred to the Library of Congress. Uh, finally, let me see. Oh, 704B provides this possibility for a regulation regarding selection by the Library of Congress of unpublished material. It provides for the uh, making facsimile reproductions. And I was one, this is a thought that came up, the possibility of requiring the library to pay for the cost of making those reproductions instead of us, since the unpublished material is going to the library. Especially if we're not going to have our own reproduction system here, making the response, making it their responsibility. Well, it's a question. Um, Those that just things that arose during the course of the year. Yeah, right. them out. You, you're saying make a transfer a condition. Pardon? You uh, making making a reimbursement or something a condition. Thanks, but I don't know whether we ever. Since we are responsible that. for for making the reproduction. Yeah. Um, Barbara, one of the things that we're going to be talking with the custodial divisions about is their responsibilities for un for retaining unpublished mm -hmm. materials for full term, at, at least. And uh, I see it, that it's going to be likely that we execute an individual memoranda of understanding between you and uh, certainly the department, if not the divisions, uh, under which they would agree to meet certain conditions before we could. Before well, we let me let, let's, let's probe that for a moment. Uh, I had the notion that if they did want something that was a valuable manuscript or something like that that they wanted, um, that we would, we are obliged to make a full, a complete uh, facsimile reproduction for retention here and that we would do that in all cases. Isn't that right? Uh, I, don't, I don't read that. Why? Before, before transferring to the library, I don't, I don't believe that we have to make any no, it's, a, it's at the end of, of 704D. Maybe I'm wrong about that. In the case of unpublished uh, works, no deposit shall be. Yeah, you're right. Knowingly or intentionally be destroyed or otherwise disposed of. And I guess that didn't include cases where they'd gone to the library on the assumption that there would be some control. All right. Um, it's even clear that the library can transfer them into certain other facilities as well. Unpublished. Well, this is the, uh, yeah. Well, it's it's this. Uh, it was the it was the live uh, videotapes of live uh, television programs that brought that. On. I'm a little vague on this now. I don't think 108B applies to copyright deposits. No. No, no, no. What if it's been transferred to the collection of the library? In the case of unpublished works, the library is entitled under regulations that the Register of Copyright shall prescribe. It's, it's, it's not just a memorandum of understanding, it's got to be regulation. Okay. Um, <coughs> to select any deposits for its collections or for transfer to national archives or to a federal records center. And there, <coughs> the intention was strictly uh, to, to allow news to go into the national archives if they wanted. That was all that was intended there. I don't think that there was anything beyond that. Uh, obviously, it allows that, but it doesn't. It doesn't require it. And I, uh, under this, the Register of Copyrights has the total regulatory authority. Nothing has to be done unless we agree to. Uh, I I come back to what I think was my notion that we would retain a copy here in all cases. And they, they, can, they can take it. The regulations would say that they couldn't allow photocopying and this and that. That was what I think was intended. 
Well, we, you know, we transfer a lot of unpublished material. I know it. And I, it bothers me a great deal. I think we're going to have to stop have that. To start copying immediately if, if that's your interpretation. No, it's next year. Well, well that's yeah. really right. what I mean. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's all right. Sorry. It does mean that the copies are going to have to bear any indicia as to whether they are published or unpublished, too, by, or by the number in the system some way. Well, it's, it's troubled me a great deal. Of course, the library's gotten into awful trouble on occasion of, of, of just treating unpublished stuff that had been transferred as if it were published and uh, so forth. Uh, this is, was very clearly intended to be stopped under this. There's no question about that. Gail, your system of numbering and so forth does indicate some you're going to keep the P and the U or something in the number in the numbering system? Um, in some way. I'm okay. not okay. Yes, there will be an indicator Thank on you. the, uh, not necessarily as part of the classification. Okay. But on on, on the number of things some way. Thank you. Can I mention one other thing? Sure. I noticed when I put it on the back of Gail's suggested application. Uh, in our discussion yesterday, we have basically come to the conclusion that this fee for full, page, full term paid storage if it's based on the cost of providing the service, it can't be determined until we receive the copy. Oh, that's right. Consequently, there, we, there won't be possibility of having the a fee determined on the application. And we've also got to consider the possibility that when people find out what the fee is going to be, they're going to say, forget it, I don't want to store it. I think we also talked yesterday about putting a place on the application where you say if you are interested in an estimate of the cost, you should right. Let me throw in, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. No, I said our only concern in including something is to allow for information on the application. Yeah. One other thought that uh, may or may not have bearing here, I think it does. The Supreme Court has recently addressed the question of fees in the FCC, and they held uh, cable and uh, broadcast licensing fees invalid, unconstitutional, on the ground that they were not based strictly on cost. I don't think we can, constitutionally, under those decisions, uh, use this as a deterrent. We just can't do that. We have to have it based on cost, but I think that we have to uh, have more than just some kind of arbitrary thing. Uh, we obviously, uh, well, this is, has a good deal of bearing, more I think about it. It'll be something like Jim Roberts' uh, estimates of search fees. The yeah. guy says, yeah. sends us something, we and then you, you, you respond. And you, you, you bill them uh, for exactly. more. Just well, the 1,500-pound birdbath that was mentioned earlier is obviously going to take more space than the paper. We're not going to get any more 1,500-pound birdbath. That day is gone. We'll reject the one with most several more. Just a delta. Write that into the regulations. Yes, both of you have Okay. Yeah. Is, is there any feeling that it might be advantageous to try to have a, a very broad, an average kind of cost, and like we do for some registrations cost more than others, but they but they still cost the same amount. So the uh, is, is any thought of just having one blanket fee and uh, that's been brought up and suggested, but uh, following the yeah comment from Barbara, it would probably. Uh, would it be possible to do that if that's based on the actual Well, cost? the point, if, if, yeah. if we're going under uh, 708A11, I think we have to have some some cost estimate, which had some relation to reality. But couldn't it be, but couldn't it be, couldn't be based on the average? It wouldn't have to be yeah. specific for that's a word. Certainly, I think that's certainly wrong. Yeah. Uh, but it couldn't be used for other purposes, like soaking an industry as against another industry or something like that. And uh, it has to have some kind of rational basis. That's where you. That's where you'd want about five or six hundred of those fifteen hundred pound bird baths. Right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> to soak the uh, industry, right? <laughs> bird baths. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. Okay. Any other? Okay. Any other questions on this? I'm glad you explained the plan to me. I won't talk about cemetery uh, monuments and groundbreaking <laughs> decisions. <today. laughs> no. um, okay, shall we, shall we press on? Uh, Subcommittee 5, Organization Task Group 3, Organization of New Functions. Uh, we're skipping around rather radically here, but I think the group we're in. The momentum is not going to be broken, so go ahead. 
new functions include jukebox and cable TV. And I could easily say that when I talk about new functions, I'm talking about new problems and old problems. I'd like to summarize the law very briefly. I assume all of you have read it, but there are certain parts of the law that are very dependent on how we're going to approach the processing of jukebox. And I'll start with jukebox. Uh, 116 requires basically during the month of January that the operator shall file an application in the Copyright Office. The regulations would be determined by the Register of the Copyright Office after consultation with the Royalty Tribunal. <coughs> this application would contain the name and address of the operator, the manufacturer, serial number, or some other explicit identification of the jukebox. The operator would submit $8 or possibly $4, and this is spelled out in the law and we'll go into it. Within 20 days after the Copyright Office receives the application and the fee, we must issue a certificate. It's a 20-day requirement. It's important. And then on or before March 1st or within 10 days after the date of issue of our certificate, the operator has to affix this certificate to the jukebox. The register receives all fees deposited under this section, and after deducting reasonable costs incurred by the Copyright Office, deposit the balance in the Treasury of the United States. The register would submit on an annual basis a detailed statement of account covering all fees received for this period. So right there, I think you can see problems. The task of determining and recommending procedures and organizational patterns for jukebox licensing must be dependent on several important factors. First factor, volume. We are estimating 400,000 applications from about 4,000 operators. During the hearings, the number went up as high as 750,000 cheap boxes with as many as 7,000 operators. We are working with the 400,000 figure, but not forgetting the high figure. The second factor would be time. Since the law requires the Copyright Office to issue a certificate within 20 days of receipt of the application of fee, we are talking about a colossal task of sending out 400,000 certificates in a very short period of time. And we are now interpreting that 20-day period to be calendar days, not working days, unless we hear otherwise. Third factor, cost. The law permits the Copyright Office to deduct reasonable operating costs and thus the entire licensing operation and organizational pattern must be economical. Four, reliability. With the vast number of applications and the time limita limitation, we must have an operational pattern that ensures control and reliability. Other considerations of staff, organizational impact have been studied and we're still studying them. We're also thinking about the space problem and the transitional effects on a second year of operation. A word here about that second year. We view that second year with, with, uh, with great optimism. We see it being much easier in the first year, and we envision an, opera, uh, an operation that would be very much like uh, the operation that is currently going on in the metropolitan area for your renewal for your tags, where we would send each operator machine-readable cards of current licenses on record. The operator would <coughs> update, verify this information. Machine-readable or machine-produced? Machine-readable. The operator would be able to read this, but it would also be machine-readable. I see. I see. Okay. 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 In other words, what we got from the D.C. Bureau of Vehicles is machine-readable as well as visually. Yes. Okay. I didn't realize okay. that. Okay. I'm not sure whether all three jurisdictions work that mm -hmm. way, but that's the way we envision it, that we have all the information on record the first year, the second, the future years. We send the information to the operator, and he validates, he or she validates or updates that information. And we would also send blank cards or some other kind of application form. And if there are any new jukeboxes that have been added, the cards would be filled out. The cards would be returned to the Copyright Office for processing, and we see this as easy processing because the cards would be machine readable. We would have to add in the new ones. We see this as a reliable, rapid, and economic method of operation for future years. But. <laughs> but back to the first year. Yes. 
how do we process this voluminous number of applications in January and get out these certificates in 20 days? We are studying two basic approaches. First is contracting out data entry to key punch operators, and the second approach would be a computer system approach. I will summarize these approaches very briefly for you. First is key punch. When we talk about contracting out key punch, it really goes into two more possibilities. Contracting out the key punch with BSO doing the programming. Contracting out the key punch and also contracting out the programming. Uh, we're not enthusiastic about this idea of contracting out both the programming and the key punch, so I will skip the reasons why. And if you want to ask me about that, ladies can. We are more enthusiastic about contracting out the data entry key punch, but doing the programming by BSO. Um, we see some real advantages. We would have control with BSO doing the programming, with the ongoing software, and we see some space and say um, space savings and some staff savings. However, the other side is that you do have the risk of failure. The contractor will not deliver promptly or will not deliver the kind of work that you want. We do lose some control if the contractor is not on site. However, we see this as a viable method of operation, especially if we could house the contractor in the building or in a nearby building. The other alternatives that, that we're considering are all connected with computer systems, and again, these break down into uh, additional possibilities, talking about mainframe batch, mainframe online, or mini computer batch, mini computer online. Uh, the mainframe batch is a proven quantity, and that is very appealing to us. High level languages, and we feel that there would be no additional BSO training needed. However, there are turnaround problems. We are still studying this approach. We think it's a likely candidate, and we want to pursue it. Uh, mainframe online, we are not seriously considering, mainly because of reliability problems. Many computer, that's an interesting one. Um, some of us are taken with it, other people are not. The mini computer is so unknown now that it is frightening, but there are so many positives about it too that we feel that we should continue studying this. Uh, briefly to discuss some of the pros and cons. Mini computer batch, we would have control, control on the environment. We would not have any cable problems uh, as, that we would with mini computer online. But we do have those unknowns of when will it get here, what will it be like, how long, will it take us to, to learn about the mini? Um, and then, of course, there would be staffing problems, space problems. We need lots of bodies to, to enter data into the terminals. Uh, the last possibility is mini computer online offers some of the same good uh, features that I mentioned about mini computer batch in <coughs> that we would have good control. The other good thing about this mini computer, uh, computer online is it's very similar to what we're planning to do for DA in our in-process system. We could pull out some of the programming right out of that, that DA. Uh, same problems, not knowing uh, about the mini, when it's going to be here, not knowing enough about it. And there would be a further problem of cable restriction, that we would have to run cable 2,000 feet from the terminals to the mini. We have the same staff and space problems. It is expensive. We are still <coughs> studying all of the uh, possibilities, and we have not made any recommendations. We hope to make a recommendation at the end of the month. Some of our questions concerning how to decide which one of these methods to pick. First of all, just how important is the cost factor? Will it be economical in the broad sense of the word to rule out an expensive method of operation? Second one, when will we know about the mini computer? Third, uh, when will we find out about space for the licensing and royalty division, section, unit, whatever it turns out to be? And fourth, are we going to have to consider any recommendations or requirements from the Copyright Royalty Tribunal? Uh, let me, let's address some of this. Um, going back to volume, I think 400,000 is not uh, an unreasonable, it's probably as good as you can do. 
Where did you get your four thousand? From the hearing. From the hearing. Forty two hundred yeah. is the exact All right. Um there may be less now, although I don't know. There may be more, although the operators seem to have diversified. They're going more into vending machines. <coughs> and, uh, yeah, pinball. Um Right. <laughs> well, some of them are very musical. Yeah. And yeah. This is what I've heard. He knows all about <laughs> that. That's why he does up New Jersey for the whole weekend. <laughs> okay, that's why he's coming down here. <laughs> um, Bad influence. The, um, the, the, the observation I'd make there is it's very imponderable, but um, the Performing Rights Societies take a very mordant view of all and they are extremely dubious about whether we're going to get 400,000. Uh, that, that, that's maybe what we should be getting. But the feeling is that we're going to actually get quite a lot less and that in that first year they're going to have to go out and beat on them uh, and bring actions and force this and that. And it's entirely possible that we may have to do a lot of reconstituting during the first year and uh, ha we'll have a, a bigger workload the second year than we have the first uh, it, well, not a bigger one, but at least we'll have a fairly substantial first-time input of workload the second year uh, while this is all sorting itself out. We'll see. Uh, it, it may be the 300,000 is, is closer to it, and we, but it, we'll know a great deal more after next, uh, when, when it'll be March, about a year from now. Uh, on, the, on the question of the, uh, whether the 20 days are calendar or not, I don't know. Uh, you reacted to that. Do you want to I comment? reacted by writing it down. So well, it does seem to me that we I ought to... I think it's probably a uh, calendar day basis. I do too. Uh, but, uh, and I think we better assume that for your purposes. But it does seem to me it would be useful there to have a legal study. Of there we go. We'd study. like it to be working day. Yeah. I'm afraid it's not going to be that. Well, it's the reason I don't think it is, I don't think it's it's the other is it fits, it fits in with the other. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 And the other, <laughs> the, the ACMISH talks about periods result, uh, coming out on a Sunday, and there would have been only. Um, now, as to costs, it's a, it's a two edged sword. It, they're only going to get $8 out of this, and uh, it's uh, anything over that. I mean, if, if you ate up the whole $8 and went beyond that, uh, it would uh, be coming out of the taxpayer's pocket, which uh, is hard to justify. Um, the assumption is that the eight dollars will not, I mean, our cost will not eat the, up the eight dollars, and that there will be uh, <laughs> something left over for copyright royalty. And On the other the hand, tribunal will use their cost. Yeah, yeah. Then ASCAP <laughs> takes his part before the guy gets it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and then there's a uh, the publisher <laughs> saying, anyway. Yeah, he gets a hand for it. So I thought, this, this, well, this is, this is exactly what they argue. Well, that's the point. If we used up quite a lot of it, they'd have a much better argument for uh, raising the fee. But they're not going to raise it beyond a certain point. The, the, uh, maybe they can nudge it up a bit, but they're not going to get it up very high because the, the, the jukebox operators are just too hard. And uh, so I think we should do it as, as cheaply as we can. And we should not in any way uh, give ourselves any fat on this. This is my very profound feeling. Does anybody disagree? What about the question of initial investment that first year to get started being possibly higher than, you know? Right. Well, we'll have to look at it over a period of years, though, wouldn't we? Well, I, we're not going to deduct our startup costs. I don't think that that, that that is really pretty, would be pretty dirty pool. Like Furthermore, right. we, the Congress has already given us some of the money to start on this, and they're going to give us more before this is ever in operation. And I cannot see our deducting any costs from that first pool that do not, uh, uh, are not reflected in that particular operation that, that, that starts on January 1, 1978. We can only deduct reasonable costs. That's right. That's right. I think we have to err on the side of, um, yeah, that's my own feeling. Uh, I think we ought to find out as best we can what is the least expensive for, I mean, where we get the most for our money in all of this. Yeah. You know, and of course, one, one thing, uh, you do have the startup costs, and you're talking about uh, the first year, your heavy workload, and presumably uh, after that, uh, some of the work will be done for you, and then the hiring and training and so forth. 
you may want to talk to Cal Publication Division if you haven't already. They went outside uh, with their register of additional locations, I think it was, and found a firm that did a marvelous job with respect to accuracy and cost. And we're talking about literally millions of records uh, on updating. And they were very happy, but Gloria Shaw or Kay Webster could give you some additional very information good. on that. Thank you. But it's uh, it was they found it to be cheaper to go outside on a on the on the contractual basis with the records than to uh, have hire staff and have the staff do it. And I still think well, let's see, I can't recall now. I've been out of touch with it for several months, but uh, uh, they found it to be very very satisfactory. Contact. Well, uh, excuse me. Uh, given the seasonal nature of this work, I would think. Would be cheaper to always go outside for the for the uh, keyboard. keyboard. Yeah. yeah. Uh, otherwise, we've got a problem of keeping staff yeah. available to uh -huh. reassign because what do you do with them all year except for those 20 days? Oh. Did you want to say? I wanted to okay. ask Glenn if you have to uh, go out and bid somewhere. I can't remember what what it was. Uh, I can't remember. It's a minimum. That, but Kate, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. but they said uh, Kay and Gloria would have the figures and, and the procedure and that, but the, the outfit that they got did an extremely good yeah. job. And they're all trained, they have their own equipment, and it was just a price per thousand records. But there is a difference here, um, which is that if we foul up, um, oh, private rights are involved, and it will be the most god-awful mess you can imagine. If they, if they fouled up in what they were doing, it was not happy, but nobody uh, was going to get sued for copyright infringement, and that could very easily Well, that's happen. one thing to, to balance, uh, the, the risk involved in that and the reliability of the firm and uh, yeah. so forth and so on, I am as far very, as that specific question. Yeah. I'm terrified at the idea of just turning our fate over to a, a, a computer. Well, you'd have, you, you know. Could they be bonded in any way to perform? <laughs> I don't know what good that would do. Who would fall uh, back on the bond? Yeah. They, they, would, they would never take a contract if they had to get a full bond yeah. that extended to potential liability of the recipient. Insurers against infringement. Our, uh, uh, our experience here with contractors has been, and uh, we'll find some resistance to that principle, I think. Uh, I would say we, we've talked very seriously about the keyboard, and I think as long as we had some control, <coughs> Uh, at that stage, what well, you just didn't turn it over and let them go. Uh, I would think that uh, some we could think about contracting that out. Yeah, you had that very, software. very, very close to that. We had set aside about seventy seventy thousand dollars for coupon work right. annually, which is a recurring cost. Could you create a mini situation and let them do a dry run on it and see well, what you would? I think yeah. this is inevitably what we're going to do. Mike, you know, I think when we did that 70000 we had location in there, and it added quite a bit. I think if the location isn't there, we'll get down to maybe thirty to $50,000 really? for the yeah. uh, <coughs> keyboarding effort. And that's assuming, that's assuming uh, I, perhaps 400000 I think. Yes, it was. So it might be no, less. I think it was just 75000 yes. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, there's a question, about 50 where, people there's a question of where the cutoff is for going out to bids on that, rather than being able to do it straight away. Okay, let's talk about the mini. Uh, I'm not sure. Oh, go ahead. Oh, well, uh, no, no. I just my question was, you're not. Nobody's thinking at all about uh, manual kinds of crap. Well, it's all manual. I mean, initially you got to enter. You could have no, 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 typing no. the certificates. Is what they're saying, basically. You mean? Well, no, no. It's it is theoretically possible to send out applications which are completed, receive the applications, examine them just to see that all the boxes are filled out. In effect, make a camera copy of the application, put a seal on the application, Besides, laminate yeah. it, and send it out as the certificate. You have to let the uh, music operators do the work. Send them out blank. I'm sorry. To <laughs> we, we were not considering that. Well, maybe, it, maybe there are problems with that. It's possible. Well, we it's El Cheapo. What Except record would the, we have? Of what the, the microfilm, a microfilm of everything that's been passed. 
you'd have some problems in maintaining the microfilms were incomplete. And we'd have to do this every year. Yes. In other every words, the savings that we would uh, be, uh, yeah. I would think well, no, 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 no. You can, you then have, you then have a longer period of time to work out the, to incorporate that material on microfilm into a database, which can be used to produce filled out applications. We may use well, the right. sticker material. Like an order inspection, mm -hmm. like an order sticker on <laughs> Well, let's, let's go back to the mini. Let's go back. Well, I, I, I do want to explore that. Uh, we are um, at a point where we're ordering mini, I guess. We're approaching that point. Thank you. Thank you for coming very much. Um, you're, you said, when will we know about the mini? Well, I think yes. there are people here who can give you some information. Uh, do you want to talk about that? Well, it's auction, uh, it's auction is scheduled for early April. Yeah. So we should know what machine it is then. Uh, and delivery is uh, it's unsure, but it's in the range of uh, mid-June. I think it should be past July. Uh, and at that point, well, well, I guess the fundamental question is, are we assuming that we would, if we went many, we would go with the kind of many that we get uh, for the in-process control? Oh, we have to use the one yes, here. We, we use have the one, to use the one. Use the one here. Yeah. Uh, Bob, Bob Blett and I have talked about that. I, I, I always talk about using the main computer because it's more, more capability there. And, and we just you know, argue among ourselves just for fun. But True. It, if, the, if the MIDI is, is right here and it is working well, uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's quite quick. Generally, you have more software support on a large machine, and generally, you can get more done. There is what Joan said, the turnaround time. I'm not sure it's uh, necessary to make that decision at this time. Uh, we have to decide what kind of we're actually going to do and get the, uh, you know, get a good, good uh, mm -hmm. sample system all laid out. One thing I am a little concerned with is tying it in completely to the deposit accounts. I think that's, uh, you know, if we uh, if we stumble there, we we're in uh, we're in double jeopardy. Say that again. Well, yes. I was a little bit concerned about tying it in, tying it in completely with the deposit account systems that we're uh, now planning for the mini. Yeah, uh, tying it being the, the jukebox, jukebox, right. jukebox software, having it dependent on that. Why would it be? I don't understand. It would come first. Oh, I see what it's I just that we can use some either. of the ideas that are already there. Dennis yeah. seems to think that. Um, I have lots of consultants, as you gather. <laughs> Dennis and Jack Kugler are working on this, and they, I think it's too soon to tell, but they think this has a lot of promise. This being? This being going with the mini and tying it into DA and, and going into this first, the, using some of the DA work that's, that's being done now. And he already has some charts and pulling these charts. Could you explain okay. what you mean by tying in? Yeah. That's what uh, I don't understand what you mean. That's what you mean by DA. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> deposit account. Which is the, is the first phase of our in-process right. control. Let me backtrack a bit. Kind of this is basically <laughs> a report, Jim. Read a record, print a record. I don't see much more to it. I don't see it has to be tied in with anything. Well, they're, they're thinking, uh, I'll tell you what the DSO is thinking, they're thinking of making it uh, that, that an operator is like a deposit account right. holder. And he, he has, has several, uh, and he has many, many different machines, oh. and each one of those is like a ledger item in, in, a, in an account. Well, yeah, it has that vague analogy there. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you wouldn't really be yeah. treating this as a DA. <laughs> You're just being software. able to right. use something that you already have. You mean they perceived a, a similarity through a glass darkly? <laughs> <laughs> well, Mike, you've indicated the programming would probably be so simple that I don't either see why it has to have any relationship between this and the end. Neither. We couldn't. They write two pro no, sets of programs. Is there anything <laughs> to it? More than just reading the operator's name and address and printing it out continuously in the same place on with the ID. Well, you need some accounting records. You, some you, accounting records. Accounting records. Uh, you may want to print out some reports by operator and list things by serial number and manufacturer so you can look them up. It's not, not talking about it's, it's not material. There's been some discussion as to how big it is. And, uh, uh, BSO is going to meet with uh, Joan, myself, and Bob Gillette. Uh, and I guess Dave, too, on, uh, on Tuesday. You're welcome to join us, Mike. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, to see, just really to scope it out to see what we're up against. This is the case with all of BSO work. Really, how much, how much are we up against? And how big a job is this? And uh, I don't know whether have you got any indication what their feeling is on that, John? 
No, but I think they saw this also as a saving mm -hmm. for their time and our cost. We have now, Andrea, a uh, regulation, a, a, a notice for a proposed rulemaking on this. Uh, I don't think you've been consulted at all. Yes. Ha yes. You have been yes. consulted at all. Uh, have you seen the last version? Yes. Yeah. The okay. last version, yes. Yeah. Right. Was it satisfactory in yes. terms of raising the questions you wanted raised? Okay. Fine. Um, well, that, I just want to say one more. I, I will try to remember, remember this, include you in the circularization of the comment letters if I don't remind it. Okay. But have you, yeah, changed, definitely. have you changed my recommendation of that be written comments? No, no. I've so it will seen, be written We talked comments. about that. That seemed all right to me. Okay. I, we, I don't have dates for you yet, but we'll get it. We don't, we're not going to have a hearing on this, though. Just written comments. Just written comments. Okay. Uh, yeah, my This may be a little naive because I don't really understand the system. If it is in, indeed a, a case of putting the information in and then just getting it, storing it and getting it back out, all we're doing is, is processing. We're not computing, not doing any, anything that you normally would associate. Except for some simple accounting. Right? Simple it's eight dollars times the number of a certificate. I wonder if there's, if there's a middle ground, if there's not some, some larger word processing system that, that could be applied to this and keep it still under our control without having to worry about the mini and uh, cost being reasonable. Well, the mini is a larger word processing system. Well, it's, uh, no, it, it's more than that. Well, it has the storage capability that a standalone word processor wouldn't have. We'd have to keep stacks of floppy disks, for example. We want to keep a database, too. I mean, yeah, we want the database for next year. Do you said it was naive, right? We have also got to maintain uh, a, a database. Uh, <laughs> 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 That's English, but that's <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, For the... Uh, the users, the the, 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 uh, the performing rights societies and so forth. We have to make a record of this, which has to be consultable. Um, <coughs> do you envisage two looks at the thing or just one by somebody? In other words, somebody's got to look at the check and see if it's made payable to the right guy and the right amount and this kind of thing. Do you envisage that person doing also whatever visa or examination there is? And yes, I'm getting Oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. Okay, shoot, good. Okay, all right. Um, since one of our uh, strongest possibilities for method of operation is contracting out the data entry, I thought I would run through very briefly how we see this working. First of all, receipt in the copyright office, and it would be the application and the fee at this point are together. We're not talking about any problems with one coming in and not the other. This would be a nice case. And it comes into the copyright office. It is date stamped. And then we see something that we call the physical examination function, which all of you will recognize as ENS examining and scheduling. Different name, basically the same thing. Where the fee would be verified, the applications would be counted, the, the check would be uh, looked over for, um, for various problems, would make sure that it was made out to the proper party, and so on. A cash number would be assigned. The application would be examined basically for blanks, though, or anything that's blaringly wrong, but not a legal examination. Uh, remittance sheets would be prepared in this uh, unit or section, and certificate of deposits would be prepared in this section at the end of the day. From that function, we would go on to the key punch, and the key punch and the verifi verification, uh, submit for computer edit run, we verify and edit the computer information. If there were errors, we have error correction updating. And we see the Copyright Office having its own key punch. Um, we're still studying this, if we went this route. Uh, and in particular, we're studying what to do about the problem applications and or the problem fees. And a fee that had a uh, short fee for uh, example or a blank on the application and blank in one of the areas of the law says we, we need. Um, we we're thinking about using the telephone policy here rather than getting into all that correspondence, uh, telephoning about problems and the possibility of just annotating the application through what's uh, currently being done and maybe following up with a letter necessary or just a memo to the file. Ross, there would be some kind of record. Yes, some yeah. kind of record, but not necessarily a letter and a memo. It might be one or the other. 
um, for speed's sake, we're thinking about mm -hmm. no letter. Mm -hmm. uh, correspondence does present certain problems here. Um, we're also wondering what to do if there is a problem. Whereas most um, of the applications that we coming in go with one operator, and let's say the operator sends in 50 applications and he has a short fee. We decided we don't want to hold up all 50. We would process, let's say, the first 49, make an arbitrary choice. Maybe it worked out he was just short for one. The 50th one would be the problem one. Uh, we're still discussing what to do with the 50th one. Would we stop it right there in physical examination, call or write, leave it there, or would we let it keep on going through the process and then pull it out before the certificate is going to be printed? Uh, still something we're... <laughs> That's coming it's up, yes, there, yeah. mm -hmm. problems. We, we don't have any answer to that. We have more questions, though. Um, but let me move to the application and the certificate. I'll try and do this quickly because Gail fortunately covered lots of her problems, or my problems, and she's on both committees, so there can are I, problems. Can I ask a question? Sure. Does the 20-day thing relate to things that there are problems with? I mean, are we bound by the 20-day we're I, I'm not sure what the consequences are if we don't meet it, but the statute says. You know, if, if, the, if the thing it cannot be processed, mm -hmm. you know, because the, the, the. Within 20 the days of receipt of an application and a royalty fee pursuant to subclause A, it would have to be, right. have to be something that was satisfactory. Mm -hmm. that we, we're yeah. not yeah. obliged to do it unless it's in order. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is it? Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, yeah. that takes away some of your. Mm -hmm. your takes away some of your. Yeah. Your problems when you're trying. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if 15% of it is stuff we receive now, but in that problem, we could get a lot more of that. Yeah. More time. Joe, in the draft that Barbara referred to, the draft that you and I see, we didn't raise any of these detailed questions. You no. want to re rethink that and perhaps add some of these detailed questions to the draft? That you have to I, the questions were pretty broad. I like them being broad, actually. You did. Yeah. Yeah. No. But these questions may not be anticipated. And if you want input, we should ask. This is the time to do it, especially since we're not going to have a hearing. We won't be in a face-to-face -face situation where we can ask them uh, orally. There's <coughs> nothing that in the regulation you want to put out that's going to prohibit the trade association for, say, being the agent for 95% of these or something. It's not, first of all, it's not a regulation. It's an inquiry. So yeah. questions, very, very broad questions. I can tell you what they are. What should be in the application, particularly with respect to identifying the machine, because I think there's a problem there. What should be in the certificate? What should be the format of each? And I think Barbara's probably made some additions. But we didn't go beyond that. Or prohibit anybody filing as an agent or anyone else. But I think the, the question we should resolve, and perhaps resolve now, is whether we do want to get into this detail in this draft. Now is. Well, let's run down what the detail is, just very, very briefly. What, what is. What, if, what has Joan raised that isn't in the draft? In specific terms, none of them are in the None of the are in process problems are in the draft. I'm not so sure they should be. Uh, I well, don't give want me one example. I'm not sure what you're talking bad about. Bad checks. Uh, oh, well, we can't ask patients. the public what to do about no. that. No, 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 no I see what you're saying. Short, no, that's processing. Short fees. No, no. Yeah. Okay. I saw those as a yeah, no, no, decision. No, no. Well, that's I, what you're I, talking about. Just offering you the opportunity. Well, maybe a clarification that uh, if, in fact, uh, you know, the material it has received is not acceptable at the time. Of well, there'll be a second cut. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you use this advanced and other technique, then you go to a proposed regulation, they get the yeah. second cut of comments. I, I think we're going to get some very interesting replies from the Performing Rights Society. Mm -hmm. They're going to want a good deal of. Uh, mm -hmm. Certainly, yeah. Mm -hmm. Could I ask Joan a question uh, about the verify <coughs> and edit? Joan, were you saying that? You had contracted out and you were getting the product back and you were going to verify and edit every item? No, they're going to verify it for us. Okay. We're paying them to do that. I misunderstood. Okay. But um, if in the computer room we still we, we do find errors that we might not go all the way back to the first step. We're trying to fix it with um, the purchase or the renting of the key function machine mm -hmm. and the key function. I think there is one variable here. And, uh, what's done in software development and how much computer editing is, is done after uh, computer verification. Because you could perhaps do a little more and have a little more software development. It may, it may save in the long run if we do something like that. Make sure that I make sure.
sure the name is all uh, you know alphabetic and make sure it looks a little bit like a name, etc. The computer could do that. Oh, many some, many could. Yeah. Yeah. Some of yeah, it too involved. Some of it will be done when we mail out the certificates when they come back as undeliverable because of the address being wrong. <laughs> yeah, but it's 21 days later. <laughs> <laughs> well, did you have a question? Are you anticipating that uh, ASCAP and BMI and those people are going to do a lot of the uh, chopping around? And they're the only ones. That, they're, they're, they're the only ones who'll do it. Are they, are they equipped to do this sort of thing? Yeah. Do it now. Uh, going around and checking people. Yeah. And uh, I think, yes, I think they will. I, it'll be spot checking. But I think uh, it'll be based on some kind of information. That this operator's machines are not licensed, that sort of thing. And they will have to work directly from our records in the first instance. Some of the more interesting regulations here, I mean, we have the tribunal. The tribunal has proposed regulations giving the Performance Rights Society's access to the premises. That's not our job. That may be where I'm losing more of a hassle on anything we do, much less distribution. The, um, you're, you had a question about the regulations needs to do the uh, tribunal. Uh, state it again. Um, I was asking whether the tribunal would give us any recommendations or requirements. You have to consult with the county when they're done. When, <coughs> yeah, we don't have to worry about it until they're actually in existence. Right. It may be a while. We're functioning that way. Yeah, that's right. But there's no, there's no other way to function right an now. An eventual problem. If we can't wait. For right. We're continuing, but yeah. eventually this will continue. At, at the point at which they are constituted, I think probably what we'll go to them with are finished regulations and say, is this, do you want to change these? And at that point, we'll have to consider it. Uh, the final prerogative is ours. Uh, it's after consultation, but we don't have to take what they say. On the other hand, obviously, we would want input from them. And this might involve change. But if we're, if we're into a system, uh, well, I don't think that they can tell us how to run the system. I think that the regulations in terms of what, uh, how names are adduced and the accounting and so forth, may, they may have some input there. This is not something I would worry about at this stage. Worry about it later. Okay, I'll worry about it later. Any other questions? Okay, I'll mention a few things about application. The law does mention application, but we, as a committee, discussed whether we wanted an application and decided an application didn't have to mean a copyright office form. Um, but we decided we wanted one. I think everyone wanted an application. We think it's a necessity. Uh, standard form of uh, information would be useful no matter uh, what method of operation we decide to pick. We have tentatively decided that each operator would fill out a separate application per jukebox rather than some kind of multiple application. Um, my next sentence. Um, <clears throat> it is a problem of our needs versus the needs of the operator. Um, we felt that, first of all, if you have a multiple application, we run into the problem that, I, that we've discussed a minute ago about an incomplete application or a short fee. And if you have it all in one piece of paper, and then you try and process the first 49 and we were going to worry about the 50th one. We run into to big problems there. That idea of trying to process parts of a whole. Um, <coughs> we have had discussions about the hardship that this would place on the operator. And <coughs> the repetition would be of the operator's name and address. Um, the other things that he has to put on that application are the name and address of the remitter, which we've included, in case it's different than the operator. If it's not different than the operator, you only submit the name and address of the operator. Then the operator has to give us the manufacturer name and some sort of serial number. Those are the only items we're talking about. Well, it's excuse me, Tom, don't be surprised if the comment letters from the Performing yeah. Rights Societies want more. more. Mm -hmm. right. And the team people tell us we don't have the authority to ask for more. Mm -hmm. so. We're expecting that. But right now we're working with that. We're, we're trying to keep it simple and uncomplicated until we get the suggestion. Should we put in the regulation a question about separate versus? I, was, I think we maybe that, that one. I think maybe is relevant. 
Now maybe we should ask, should, can, should they be grouped or should they be separate? Um. Let me get back to some of the reasons of it. We were, okay. Some of the pros um, and cons of this grouping. Uh, the hardship would be on the operator, the, the repetition of information. Um, the repetition might be the name and address of the operator. It might be that uh, several <coughs> manufacturers are going to be represented, so there would be no problem there. If you had a multiple application, you'd still have to fill in the name of the manufacturer and the serial number. Um, we thought in this case it was worth giving up this multiple because of the problems to ensure this high volume of applications coming in and getting out the certificate in 20 days. Uh, we're open to arguments that maybe we should reconsider this. It's not a final decision, but we, we're certainly leaning in the direction of the one-on-one. -on -one. Makes it easier. Why does it make it easier? Makes it easier for us uh, because of the incompletes, because of the blanks, I just uh, processing them I don't through. See, I don't see how it makes it easier with incompletes, really. So the whole problem with an incomplete is what to declare incomplete and where all the information is going to repeat except for manufacturer and serial number, the problem dealing with the incomplete hasn't changed because it's on one page as on several others. You take the first one and work until you run out of money or else you take the first thing on top until you run out of money and you have a number of forms left. And from the point of view of key punching, I would just ask, it makes sense you use key punching, whether from, with regard to the security of the material, it pays to have fewer pieces of paper as opposed to more pieces of paper, or whether it is easier in key punch operations to have one sheet of paper in which you can just key in, repeat, 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 and then just add in the other. That's, that's that, exactly what you would do. Yes. But it's much easier if you have a list of right. manufacturers' names and serial numbers to key punch in than to keep turning a form over. Right, that's what I meant. Well, that, that I've gotten both answers on that. To Some people it, tell me that it's you get better accuracy if you have one thing that a key punch operator has to put in, as opposed to a multiple and possibly looking on the front and the back if, if it's a very long application with 50 or 60 or 70 Are there, key punches. Well, no. So they could design the application to take sure. care of that. Are there state or local commissions now which engage in license and jukeboxes and beverage control commissions? I don't recall seeing any certificates of any licensing about you. There are the vending machines. Vending machines have state licenses and they're just a little tag. Uh, there are local ordinances around here. Masonite or something, uh, you know, some kind of confirmation. One advantage of having an in individual in rather than group is if all the, this wonderful business about computers broke down, you could go back to what Lou suggested is of just quickly yes. photocopying the thing and putting the thing on it, sending it out, and say this year that's what it's going to look like. Get a tack and tack it on. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think um, one of the arguments I recall in a meeting one day we were talking about getting rid of the certificate requirement and having the applicant put the certificate in the application form and then they were talking about that being a way to get around considered a small card-like application in numerous parts, we would be able to pull off one part and use that as a cash card. Let me say, uh, in this area, they are not paying for this service. Uh, I don't know whether you know the history of this, but at one point, there was a 50 cent fee in the, in the law, in the bill, that uh, was intended to pay for this processing and that was knocked out. They only paid eight dollars. Mm -hmm. So that I don't have any big strong feelings about accommodating them. I think we should accommodate ourselves in this instance and try to do it in a way that results in the cheapest uh, processing because the, the, the performing rights societies are going to be paying for it. We would, we would accept minimal inconveniences in processing if it met substantial or, or maybe minimal and substantial the wrong thing. Maybe. Yeah. John, I would think that the rekeying name and address and sometimes rekeying your letter would have to triple our uh, data entry cost. Well, we wouldn't have to rekey no, even would. if they had to. Yeah. That's not what she wants. Yeah. No. You would just, you would just see it there once and you would. <coughs> but why make the uh, entry operator type the name, his name and <coughs> address in the 400 applications? 
Oh, four thousand operators, four hundred thousand boxes. Hundred. That's a hundred per yeah. operator on the average, and that's an awful, awful lot of burden. And actually, we're talking about a one hundred, uh, or rather, a reduction by a factor of one hundred in the pieces of paper we have to handle yeah. if we put them all. An in operator, um, T punch operator, is very uh, cheap, petty tail. Yeah. And um, that's one of their considerations, I think. But maybe it would be easier for an operator to work with just one piece of paper, because if you're thinking about something else, you might repeat this and say some things. You have to have another application to get another number. Whereas if you have all your numbers on one piece, you'll just your eyes will just follow that down. Also, if you have a change of name and address, you will remember to key it in again. And if you That's don't, right. you might continue with the old name and address with maybe a hundred new applications without realizing that you're supposed to have changed. I would think the error rate will be high in this yeah. kind of thing in the beginning. I think you can find this out very easily by talking to a few key, uh, data entry shops. How, how yes. do we pay them? Do we well, pay them on a job basis or uh, do we also pay them on a basis of uh, work hours expended? Because it seems like we, we have work hour savings. Uh, if they we put they usually have a sheet. charge per card if you're doing it. Four cents per a card. card. Depends how many characters on the card, the mm -hmm. density of it. They tend to look at the degree of difficulty in charging them different, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I would be inclined to ask this as a question in the, in the uh, notice of proposed rulemaking and see what we get. Uh, and I think the, the disposition on the part of performing rights societies is to make them do it as hard a way as possible. But uh, <laughs> at that, at the point where we make decisions, then we can decide it on, I think, on whatever ground are most convenient for us. I'm on the base of this discussion. I think most people here feel that it would probably be better to have it on a single sheet. But uh, I say it might be good to ask the uh, of the data entry shops and see what they think. Yeah. I don't think it would be any harm. Right. Let's yeah. press on. Okay. Okay. Um, the application of fee we're planning to cut have it come to a special box office or zip code so it would be separated from regular copyright office mail. Um, that may not be so easy. Maybe you, uh, maybe you can talk the uh, post office into it. Maybe even get a, a separate zip code. A zip code. That's what we were talking about. Oh, it's yeah, box office, office or zip code. Mm -hmm. It would sure be great though if the trade association, the cash box association are, would handle this for the large majority. They're not going to do it, I don't think. Uh, I spoke to their attorney two days ago. That didn't come up, but certainly nothing indicated that they would. He did raise one question. Like, I'll throw it out now. I don't know if I'm not answering now. And that is, uh, whether they were giving any thought to the possibility of license, of actually starting with licensing procedures at the end of this year so that we don't have this big January. Yeah, we could. Yeah. We could. yeah. We should have the form designed and our system ready to go and uh, start sending them. Oh, we have to have the stuff out in their hands before yes. because so, they, they've yeah. got to send it in in January. Yeah, well, this was well, a possibility of even accepting No, that's can we accept them? Accept it. Yes. one of the legal questions. Why is this? It's just accept and then do the key punching. I don't think the literal language. The literal, no, yeah, I with the literal language because yeah. it says eight dollars for the current year, and the current year will not be a royalty-bearing year. But I don't think it's anything. Month of January. January. Well, the certificate state the year or not? That it covers. We'll have it. We'll have the, the date of issue. That we receive it earlier. Okay. No, I don't think Could we have we to make a decision it? now. Okay. I, I don't it's think we're ready questions. to do it anyway. As long as we get the applications out. During the processing of the application, we see other things being added to it besides the information that the uh, operator gives. The date of receipt, I've already mentioned, would be added. The date of issuance of the certificate would be added to it, the record. Some kind of account or cash number, using both terms because we seem to be leaning towards account number if we went with automation. Some kind of unique number that we're calling the copyright office unique number, just not to confuse with anything and fee information. Uh, I think Gail mentioned this before and I'll mention it briefly again. We are still considering the idea of whether we go with a multiple application or not of having some kind of carbon attached to it. And we saw this being especially valuable for a record. If we let our applications leave the office to go deep punch, maybe we could hold on to the original as a record, cash record, and 
that the carbons go on to keep punch down and entering. Um, there has been some discussion about whether to ask for location on the application. Um, we are inclined not to ask for location for the following reasons. First of all, it's not in the law. We wouldn't get it. I mean, we'd have just a big hassle and we wouldn't end it. We'd end it I suspect they'd change. Yeah, but go ahead. Should we just I could move on? Well, I don't see how we can possibly do that. Fine. Um, I understood there was some yeah. discussion of location. There was, so I was and I, was, I think I would. Good. Would an ASCAP uh, uh, person be able to detect whether this license actually belongs to this box? Well, that's the question of identification of the machine, and I think yeah. has some hidden problems in it. That's one of the reasons that I, we highlighted that question in, in the notice. I don't know. I don't know if they all bear serial numbers. Or the serial numbers available in the box. Well, that's that's the serial be numbers vary among manufacturers. <coughs> How many manufacturers are there? <coughs> but that's the information that the performing rights societies are going to have to give us a response to this notice. I think we'll have a position about these things where there's several feeders and only one box. Mm -hmm. I, that sort of thing. I don't know how we can take a position yeah. on that. I, I went around in my own mind whether we could determine where the certificate should be placed on the machine. I came out with the answer no. So. This is not our affair. It may be that the uh, Royalty Tribunal's affair up to a point, but I can't see how it centers into what we do. Do you? Well, if it, it depends on how the question comes up. If it comes up in the questions, for example, in a serial number identification context, maybe it will enter into our considerations. I don't think we can answer it, but we can structure the application in such ways to have a result. If the main unit has one serial number and in the diner, each one has a separate, and then maybe we're talking about a separate machine. Really <coughs> what did they receive? Yeah. Well, that, that we, that is defined. Uh, so what is the machine in this kind? It's like the cable question we asked about local and, and mm -hmm. central head ends. You have the local and multiple things. I think that it'll be a lawsuit, the court will decide. Uh, do we really need the data receipt and data issuance on this kind? Well, it doesn't no, the computer would do that anyway. Well, wouldn't have to, wouldn't it's the date of receipt we, from which we determine the 20 days we have that. I know. You're stamping that on the piece, though. Are you, do you want to input it into the computer? Well, it would be that's basic information the computer would have. The day that you enter, that would be added. It's already there. Okay, by the, so by you the don't system. have the keystroke there. No, I would hope not. So, go. Yeah. And you do need the date of issuance because they have. Um, in the law, March 1st, or within 10 days after the date of issuance of the certificate. So we'd, we'd want a record of that. So we're going to put it on the certificate now. Um, certificate. We see it as being a glossy surface about the size of an auto registration sticker found on a windshield. The certificate would have an adhesive back, which would enable the operator to fix it easily to the jukebox certificate for the time being until we get some comment uh, would contain the name and address of the operator, the manufacturer, the serial number, uh, the date of issuance of the certificate, and the copyright office unique number. We are discussing other things to add to that. Um, we are thinking about adding some sort of information uh, from rephrasing the law covering the term of the license and the time requirements that the law gives to enable the operator to affix the certificate to the jukebox based on the deadlines given in the law. We're still considering those. Uh, I won't go into the problems of the seal and the signature. Gail mentioned we have the same problems. Um, and we are considering all of the same alternatives that Gail is considering. Um, as far as mailing out the certificates, we, we plan to use the open face envelopes and envelope stuffing machines. I did ask whether there's anything you can hook onto the computer that will <coughs> feed. Um, we can mail each one separately? No. Oh. We're planning to try and send them in groups so that we will not have one certificate per operator, which would be a long process. Well, just one small thing. Uh, on recommended design of the certificate, 
consider an expiration date? No, that's what I was. I thought you mentioned that. Yeah. It's not here. That's why. I, it's not on there. We're considering putting a statement on if we have the date of issuance, perhaps adding a sentence or something about the term. We might want to instead put an expiration date. We were thinking of putting the date of issuance and then quoting from the law. But in a way, the, the expiration date is much more important than the date of issuance. Yeah, yeah. Because the date of issuance is irrelevant. No, but the expiration is yeah. Yes. The expiration is not important when it looks on a calendar year basis. Well, it's just a January. January of each year. January of each year. Or why this can't it just say? This is yeah, yeah. yeah. We were it's thinking a general yeah. statement might cover, we might go with the date. Well, why not just 1978? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. This would be printed in this pre preprint. Yes, pre -print. Pre -print. Yeah, but um, it would, it would, it could consider the possibility, though, that if you, you, you would distinguish between a half year and a full year certificate yeah, somehow. Because that yes. would be a four dollar as opposed to a four dollar one. But it would show it on the certificate. Yeah. Yes. I have a, a thought on your, on the certificate, certificate. or whatever it's an that gets attached to the new fire. I had envisioned these things as being something that would, instead of having the sticky stuff on the back, would have it on the face of the thing so that it could be placed inside of the new uh, uh, because Gail has lots to say about <laughs> that. <laughs> okay, you know. The boxes are no longer They're made. They're no longer like that. Though. They don't. <laughs> show in our I there really we go. have to do some research and jute boxes yeah. no longer have translucent covers of any sort. In the same place in New Jersey that has these pre <laughs> <laughs> And it's a very aesthetic looking thing. The big problem oh, is because we register it as a work of art. I know, I know, there's one that I'd love to have in my living room. The Lou Seberg machines are very yeah. nice. Yeah, I know they are, you know. I, I still was thinking there was still <laughs> some area on there where you could see, but you, I guess no, you, you, know. can't, you can't see the records moving around. No. Oh, no. Oh, what a shame if it was a uh, steel disc. So we've got to have something that's going to go flop on the outside. Can they be, you know, are they movable? They self Or do they have to buy a new box? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, well, they self, it's like your, your auto sticker that, uh, have you also yeah, that you can't get off. Color for each year. Oh, they come off, but they self-destruct. <laughs> One other idea we had in regard to the certificates. We were also considering sending along with certificate a card having the same information as a certificate, and this would allow the operator to have a record. <coughs> Wallet size. Wallet size. <laughs> small, it would probably be very small too. You raised a question in there, maybe you haven't gotten to it yet, about the counterfeiting. Are you seeking the assistance of justice or anybody to see how you design a counterfeit proof form, or is it something we're just letting you trouble ourselves? <laughs> you really haven't gotten into that, have we? Gail's working how do you on... Do that, I don't know, I'm just, I, I saw the, the mm -hmm. item in the, in the list, and I was wondering what it meant. We don't impose any penalties for counterfeiting under the law. I, I assume you just meant Trying. counterfeiting considerations in the design of the yes. form itself. To have a, uh, an ornate border or something like that. The man to talk to, <laughs> I know, <laughs> because of Vic Martin did a little thing for the Women's oh, Committee, right, yes. and it was, well, I got him <laughs> the right. name of the right guy in the Justice Department. Was that guy thorough? Is his that name's right? Paul Boucher. Anyway, I'll give you his number. Can we go for the women's committee? Yeah, he designed a dollar bill oh, about this right, big, right, and nobody right. in his right mind would take it for a dollar bill. <laughs> but he was given a negative by yeah, the, yeah. that moment. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Can we um, can we as a committee as a committee member of Joe go through the Justice Department? Oh yeah, see why not? Are you? Sure. You might have a passage. You might have a passage. As long as you stay within the criminal division. <laughs> Do we make any provision for the issuance of replacement certificates? Uh, if these things on the outside of the boxes and if the kind of place that Jan goes to, they're going to get mutilated. Good point. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> you know, the, the counterfeiting, though, isn't in justice. It's in treasury. There's a, there's a liaison there. People that prosecute yeah. over in the criminal they are, division. I see. Okay. And that, but they confer constantly with well, Mike raises a good point. There's no provision within the law, but I guess we could issue duplicate certificates upon request. For how much? Eight dollars. That cost. Eight dollars. Yeah. Uh, I would say we didn't really answer your point about the, the little receipt. I think they'd have to pay for that if they wanted that. And I think we should consider what we would offer and what we would charge. Should we say anything about that in the ruling? Request for receipt. Mm -hmm. I think we can raise some 
possibly the question of receipt and the possibility. I think we should raise the question of the replacement certificates because I think the performing rights societies will have a point of view that that could be used as a way to avoid the eight dollar fee by getting something which is in effect. Yeah, that's a good point. I'd, I'd be inclined to raise the question of receipt. Yeah. Did you have a mind that each one of you has several receipts that you buy a boy and box and you get boy and you get a That would be a different form, too, yeah, from the printer. They'd have that to get the 450 thing. certificates because yeah. each so. box gets yeah. its own certificate. Sure, but but we, kind of we really had not gotten into how we would handle those receipts oh, cool. for one's record, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. You going to be with, the operator would probably want one record for one hundred and fifty. Oh, that's true. Yeah. 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 Y
the connection between the two. Not much. So it's outside of the in-process control system. That's exclusively registration and yeah. recordations other than the compulsory licenses. The only thing we might consider is... So you'd have an accounting system that mm -hmm. might be computer-based, but it would be what, a different program? Or uh, kept it? Kept it, right. possibly. I imagine you said the program. Mm -hmm. I see the same here. But it would be very much like the program would do that. Cable television. Before you get into that, it's four o'clock or almost. Well, it's not o'clock, but um, I think we have half the time to do so, but we're just not going to finish. There are eight more presentations after this, and this is going to take about a half hour probably. No. No? <laughs> <More bad. laughs> I have to leave in 15 minutes. It'll take 15 minutes. All right. Yes. Uh, well, does anybody have any suggestions? This is. Uh, you mean about breaking up? Yeah, we could instead of having the registers conference Monday afternoon, go on with this. I don't know what, so whether we could get this room back, and I'm not sure whether we want this we room back. Perhaps <laughs> we could get the conference on Monday. Mm -hmm. That might not yeah, be. It's bad. much nicer. It's much cooler. Yeah, it's cooler. That's right. I, I, I think a lot of people are perishing, and I think I'm not thinking as clearly as I might, especially since the smoke is not moving. That's the only reason I'm smoking. <laughs> One way then, the meat mix. I went out and bought cigars. Okay. Are you suggesting that John? Uh, um, Why don't we finish up with Joan and oh, okay. uh, uh, maybe we could do one other, but we're obviously not going to get finished. And I was thinking that we we probably could go on and plan instead of and we didn't have anything all that earth shaking on the agenda for the registers conference. I think this is more important, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. John did. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. okay. It's at one o'clock on Monday in the conference. My assistant will be there. That's why I asked if you be. <laughs> on the will of Amtrak. <laughs> right. Okay, why don't, you, why don't you go ahead? Okay. Okay. I really have very little to say about cable. Cable's been in the shadows. It's really been the stepchild. Not done very much work on it. I, we felt that jukebox was the immediate problem and all members of my committee have been working on jukebox mm -hmm. rather than cable. The only thing I'd really like to tell you about is our consultant. We do have a consultant, Mr. Charles Woodard, Chuck Woodard, and he started last week. And if you read the outline, uh, or look it over again. I think you'll see all of his, the two, the two parts of his duties would be to be working with me to help me set up the processing as well as the accounting functions. Uh, we have gone to SCC and I was uh, optimistic about the trip and that it looks as if some of the things that the SEC is doing in their cable TV bureau we can use or we can at least uh, profit from the work they've already done. But I really have no progress report to give you on cable. Let me say something about cable. And there, there is this hearing I mentioned, again, just like the two bucks, you'll have to stay on top of it. So I'd like to read, not some, we asked a list of questions for the people who testified to. And it, I'm not going to go through all of them. Just number eight and nine, I think, and number 10, the ones dealing with the copyright office and its functions rather than the law. To what extent the vendors of the copyright office examine and enter into correspondence concerning the contents of statements of account with respect to A, clerical or mathematical accuracy, B, compliance on their face with the requirements of 111D2, including the appropriate computations, etc. Conformance between the statements of account and the total amount of the accompanying deposit, conformance between the statement of account and the information already filed by the cable system under 111D1, these are the ones that are coming in by April. And e any other matters. That's one. Nine should the copyright office impose a fee under 708A11 for the handling and recordation of notices and statements of accounts under paragraphs one and two of 111D. We know from the prior proceedings that the cable companies are going to come down on the grounds A. We should not, and B. Indeed, we have no authority to. If they're going to argue that it's not a service, at least not to them. And ten should the copyright office provide printed forms for the filing of statements of account. If so, should they use by, ca by cable systems be mandatory or optional? Re what record should the copyright office make and maintain on the basis of these statements? And I think 
really, <laughs> the fact that you haven't done anything yet is immaterial, but because without this input, there's really not a heck of a lot for you to do. But uh, mm -hmm. I think this is a good illustration of, of the regulatory process going pretty much beyond our substantive regulations and really giving us input on the, on the procedural side as well. I think that... This uh, will, I'm sorry, no, go I, ahead. The, my last phone call was to tell me this would probably be published Wednesday instead of Tuesday. Uh, I really do have a question here as to whether or not we would benefit or actually uh, impaired by the use of the computer. Uh, there are well, about 3,500, uh, between 3,500 and 4,000 systems. And that will, be, that will be our workload. I mean, it's not multiplied by the number of channels or anything like that. We will be getting presumably that many uh, applications or whatever you want to call them. But we will have a rather, I would say, uh, sophisticated examination process. It's not something a machine could possibly do. Um, and I'm, I'm uh, unsettled in my mind the extent to which a computer would actually help us or burden us. And I would, this is a, one of the main things I'd want you to look at first. Uh, I just don't know. And maybe maybe there are things that computers can do for us here that If we verify the uh, money that comes in on, along with the line of these, these comp uh, comp complicated formulas in here, it might be some program that we can verify. The application form, or whatever, the statement of account it is, is going to be very complicated to grasp. So this is, assuming that we do put out a, a printed form, uh, it's going to have to be very carefully devised. I'd say in some ways more subtle than the, the uh, IRS form. Does anyone have any questions on this? Well, you were right. It took uh, <laughs> maybe five minutes. So. No questions. Okay, shall we go on then? Who's next? Me? Yes, okay. okay. Barely. <laughs> this is uh, Subcommittee 4, Task Group 2 of the American Television and Radio Archives. I've had relatively little success in convincing people to call it ATRA. Mm -hmm. Oh, you will. I know. Hang on. <laughs> the Archives. Um, the uh, scope paper which you have for this task group identifies eight, that's not eight <coughs> topics for study and to uh, report on. That's not exhaustive. That was a, a first listing. At this point, uh, the activities are still preliminary and mostly organizational. We're assembling information on Office and Library of Congress practices with respect to television, acquisition, preservation, cataloging, registration, and deposit from the point of view of the Office. Uh, updating what was a series of memoranda fired off between uh, Dorothy Schrader and myself about a year ago on the impact of the then revision bill, which did not have Section 113, or the uh, unpublished transmission program's uh, provision in 407, what its impact would be on uh, registration and deposit practices of the industries. Uh, updating will be required. 407 does, and 113 does, does change a great deal. As well as a general analysis of the language and the ambiguities, if any, of Section 113, 407, 408. There's some interest in the library on information about uh, Section 108, the, as far as the Vanderbilt Amendment is concerned. I think that interest probably is, is more academic than anything else <coughs> at the moment. Most of the issues of importance really involve going to the Library of Congress and uh, sorting out the terms and subjects of cooperation with the library. Bob Stevens and I met uh, uh, with uh, John Finley and uh, Alan Fern, and uh, both Finzi and Fern. 
were anxious to set up some form of reference-based group to assist in coordination of the planning effort. And they accepted the principle that the Copyright Office, largely because we are intimately involved in the acquisitions activities under 407, um, that the acquisitions activities that we build up the archive, that we should, in effect, prepare a very large briefing document. Alan likes short documents, uh, but <laughs> yeah, uh, but I, I think I think he accepts the notion that what we can do for the library is not only to provide some interpretation of the law, but to successfully raise for the library a wide variety of issues that might not otherwise be raised since they don't have any form of existing collegial group drawn from across departmental lines to meet all the issues about cataloging and publications and reference and security and space. Anyway, um, I have I've talked with the motion picture section, which is willing to cooperate and collect all the information we need for these eight topics. Uh, I have not yet talked with uh, John Kuiper, and uh, I discovered the last week, much to my surprise, that uh, we actually did hire Eric Barno. I didn't yeah, realize he's, that. He's on there. Yes. <laughs> His name never came up, and he has several responsibilities uh, directly from the librarian, one of which relates to the archive. So I think before uh, we get turned loose on the motion picture section, I'm going to have to go talk to Eric Barno and find out what he's doing. According to the motion picture section, people he has not been actively involved in setting up the archive right now. There are other issues that relate to specific television archive questions that he's been involved in. Uh, largely concerning public television. Um, not all of the subjects that are identified here are going to be uh, exhaustively treated, but uh, just sufficiently treated, particularly in the areas where the responsibility for making decisions rests primarily with the library. Um, other than that, it, there really is relatively little to say. Uh, it's, it's, it is largely preliminary. Fortunately, the people on my task group show why ranging independence, uh, work well without supervision, they are self-starters, uh, and um, self-finishers. Um, I think we're going to finish, hopefully, by the middle of next week, gouging e everything of relevance from uh, uh, our own records uh, and uh, the records of central services. And I've already begun writing on the two uh, legal issues. The, well, the two legal sections, uh, analyzing 113.407.408 and updating the memoranda that Dorothy and I wrote some time ago. The issues that uh, I think a fair amount of work has to be done on because uh, <coughs> I haven't set up a firm program and touch on um, cataloging and identifying the uh, current state of radio and television archiving in the United States. Uh, there are some special problems with radio, and uh, I'm supposed to hear from a rather socialist-sounding organization called Broadcast Pioneers, but is actually uh, an NAD-funded uh, museum of radio. In any event, are there any questions? Is there any indication that the Central Library will rely on both the air recording of the 407? Every indication is that they won't have the money or the equipment to do that for a substantial period <coughs> of space. But CBS has uh, talked with uh, Alan Fern, and I'm not quite sure exactly what the, the full range of the conversation was, whether it involved a donation of equipment. But they indicated that they were willing to run a, a line straight to the library to facilitate off the air station. They're the only network that's been forthcoming in that respect. Again, the, the archive was not provided for in, in, in the budget, and it probably will not be able to get cranked in uh, until the 79 budget. And the figures that the library have uh, assembled on the cost of an off-the-air taping facility for news alone well, was rather high. That's more of a second. No, 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 this was some time ago when there was, uh, when the, the Vanderbilt operation was supposed to be transferred to us under the the original thing. I'm perfectly satisfied with the way this is going, but uh, I would very much like to hook onto this person. Uh, 
When is your next meeting with anybody in the line there? Mm, I would be Barnum, and I would like to present the motion. Could we have a meeting with Kaiser and, and Barnum both? And Parton, who is the new deputy or assistant librarian, he's in charge of this whole area. All right. He wants to be, and I want to be. Could we have a sit down? And I would want you on this problem too. Um, okay. Shortly. Barno phoned me. And remember, he had talked to us one time yes, I know. about getting some representatives to deposits. And uh, uh, Rhinus is supposed to get in touch with him on what he has in mind. On what? On, on, pulling, on identifying and pulling some representative deposits in our collection. I see. Okay. Remember, he showed an interest in that when he came oh, yeah. over and talked oh, yeah. to him. Okay. Barnum. Oh, Barnum. All right, I'll check his schedule. Okay, I'll be in St. Louis Tuesday and Wednesday. Um, we'll just work it out. We can work it out. Um, maybe Friday afternoon. Are there any questions on any of this? It, let me, let me. Barno. B A R N O U W. Uh, he's very famous. Mm -hmm. He's uh, famous. The, the leading authority <laughs> on television, uh, and he's written books uh, in all aspects. Of it. He must be. He, mu he must be very famous because no one mentioned him. <laughs> <laughs> he's like a lot of famous people, but worse than his hire, nobody ever sees him again. Anyway. Um, He's a very nice man. The, the point I want to make here, though, is that this does tie in, le leaving aside the archive and uh, the uh, 407 113 special provisions, um, the library does have a mandate to use the copyright deposit system to build up an archive. You don't need uh, funding for that. And I would say that without any question, this is a compliance problem too. It's not just uh, the archive and what the library does. It is something that we have to support from a compliance point of view. I think we've been pretty good in the motion picture area, but I think we're going to have to mount something a great deal more forceful. Um, it is clear that the motion picture, some, some motion picture companies were not registering there for a while. And I made inquiries, and I got the very puzzled remarks from the from the office. But it's perfectly clear; it's well known in the industry that they have just stopped registering. And I don't understand why we didn't know this, and why we weren't doing something about it. I, I'm terribly puzzled by this, and I obviously we can't afford to let that happen. This uh, this this whole issue probably is, from the point of view of the library, particularly considering its budget problems. Uh, maybe the most important thing that we can contribute to them. That's why it's number two right. uh, on, on this agenda. Right. Uh, except isn't, isn't, yeah. Right. right. Okay. And then that no. No further questions. Okay, let's go on then. Oh, Gloria isn't here. No, she got ill and left. Did she really? Yeah. From the smoke? <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh really? I'm I'm sorry. Okay. Well, Pat's not going to be here Monday. Oh, you're not? Well, go, go. Pat. <laughs> <laughs> so I can get away. Yeah, you're not going to be here for the residence conference either. Okay. Provision seven ten uh, right to uh, the uh, copyright owner to grant exclusive license to library library hires specifically the vision plan for the handicap. To reproduce certain specified categories of non dramatic literary material. The first big question is what are those specified categories of non dramatic literary material? And uh, partial answer, of course, I would think would obviously include books, periodicals, contributions to both, and uh, possibly work prepared for oral delivery. That immediately would lead you into the next question. In fact, unpublished material was covered uh, by, was intended to be covered by this grant. That we would have to have a clarification in regulation to explain that the uh, subsequent distribution by the 
be in compliance with my handicap is not amount to publication. And we have a number of other legal mm -hmm. questions that are, that are small in those. Uh, I might say we've done a lot of this work in the past. Uh, it was in, of course, in a different framework. It was only limited to published work. It was only dealt with books. We have certain understandings in the past with division of blind and with handicap. Uh, in relation to books, we knew in in the past that they only did about 4,000 titles. According to their projection, they only do about 2,500 titles in 77, that was their plan. And of those, uh, some were cassettes and some were uh, sound recordings. Or some were uh, braille or tactile copies. Now, the, the point has been, uh, if, for instance, we got 50,000 uh, out of 100,000 registrations in any group, we got 50,000 waivers, they certainly would not want to receive those waivers because, again, they will be operating separately under, a, under their own system. They have their own form, which would allow them to uh, arrange for special terms. If, in fact, a person wanted to only uh, grant or a right to reproduce uh, Braille copies and not the sound recording device for a limited number of copies, this, this sort of thing. That wouldn't be possible if we attached the waiver form as a part of a for registration. So uh, we have this problem of, of uh, as, I, as I perceive it, of maintaining a database. I perceive the problem is produce, or maintaining or building up a database and uh, setting up a system uh, by which the division of blind and physical handicap can inquire of us about a specific work that they're interested in. And we've, uh, we've made assignments based on that, on that sort of contention. Uh, we would want to capture this information um, during the in-process record Add, uh, add the information that if we uh, to the manual records that presently exist, such as title cards, uh, the certain areas in periodical visible files, or uh, other issues in terms of maintaining the record, uh, adding it to the catalog entry has been, been explored in the past, and we were working along with the same, same assumptions we made earlier. And that was uh, that we would add it to the catalog record. We queried the blind division about whether or not they wanted to receive uh, these cards, and they do not. And so it would appear they that do not. they do <coughs> not. And maybe that this is some, certainly something I'm going to explore again. The idea being that we would uh, add the entry, and it would they would be, become special subscribers and would not be on the published card. In the absence of that, it would have to appear there, and <coughs> we would have to have any published catalog, some sort of disclaimer. That explains it is only applied to the uh, blind division. We've made uh, uh, a number of assignments, and we expect to have our first set of working papers in, in two weeks. And at that point, I expect to, uh, we've collected a background material on the division. expect to uh, set up a meeting after we deliver this material to the blind division and uh, go from there. That's pretty much it. Fine. Does anybody have any questions uh, on this? The um, the application form that Gail uh, drafted or it was drafted and handed out this morning, obviously just a first cut, but it, it does just have a check off. Yeah, well, uh, that's not that that's certainly not what we contemplate. No, that's obvious. That's obvious from yeah. what you just said. And uh, okay, I can go into. Well, are, are you coordinating with her? And yeah, well, this was done uh, This was done by one person. And yeah. Of course, uh, certainly when we did this before, when an A application, there are potential problems. We, we had a positive statement. You hereby grant, I hereby grant the mm -hmm. statement. That follows what the, the license that the uh, line division uses. And we had a yes, no response. Well, what, is a, what does a no mean? Is it a no to all the terms? Yeah. And uh, that's we possibly see that as, uh, as doing it, uh, only giving a, a yes response. 
leaving the blind division free to negotiate or seek a license on, 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 on their own, rather than having to deal with the, the potential conflicts. Right. You know, we've got now on a consultant basis, uh, Susan Beislein, who was very much involved with uh, this when she was working for the Publishers Association, and she's committed to it uh, personally, and she does have a lot of contacts in the publishing industry. Would you want to bring her into this? Because I think Certainly. she'd be willing to be brought. You know, uh, and we'll pay her to do the work. They, uh, the blind division feels that, uh, at first they felt it was Uh, they are free to negotiate special terms. And, uh, mm -hmm. For instance, well, there's no provision here to uh, allow uh, a waiver for large print copies. And that wasn't intended. Yeah. Clearly, that's in their way of form, free form. Uh, and, they, and, uh, and they also have blanket licenses from certain publishers. They don't want to interfere with that by, by using this system. So there will be a more or less a dual system. They were concerned about uh, the goodwill that they had built up already with publishers in yeah. terms of filling out the applications and making it create as little as version possible. These are all issues. Could you talk to her? Betty Burke has interviewed five people today that we've got from, from the uh, Virginia Employment Office. So we might be hiring people very quickly. But, yeah, yeah that's your so question. This pool Pray will be available. To, I say this pool that you're talking about would be available to help with that. Of course it would be. Are you talking about a pool or one person? Several people, about four people. Yeah. Oh. It, it strikes me that uh, what we're doing in a number of these uh, task groups is trying to get people out of their normal jobs to some extent and focus on something that they wouldn't normally have time to do. And I would think it would be a question in your area, Mike, whether you had enough staff. It, it, if the, if the administrative support was so large that you might, that group could essentially encompass more and take people from other parts of the office. Well, that's what I was assuming. If it's needed. If it's needed. It, it is needed. now. At but this uh, time, I don't think it's needed. That would seem the sole function. You should be the person to identify sure. when it's it. I mean, to, to pick, to go someplace and ask if it's still mm -hmm. has it. Well, let's leave it this way if it's agreeable. Uh, we'll, we'll leave it on paper. Uh, don't feel that you need to do anything. Uh, I think it can grow as needed, quite yeah, okay. frankly. All right. And I would hope, though, that at meetings like this and where, where we are kind of having the general, I'll be here that you'll be part of it. Exactly. Okay. Okay. And maybe more than one. I'm okay. Okay. Fine. Okay. Go okay. ahead. Uh, do your thing. Good luck. Thank you. Shall we resume? And let's let's try to move along okay. because uh, okay. I don't want to run so far. Um. Of course, cataloging the uh, cataloging rules, we have also tentatively said recommend including all the dates in an entry such as state of creation, registration, publication, but uh, this will depend on what's on the application. Um, we've also made some uh, very definite plans about how to catalog um, notices of termination, cable, cable TV documents because we don't think they would be too different from other documents like that. Uh, I have brackets around this. We recommend this other, some other division index section 407 deposit <laughs> copies, but <laughs> Friday <laughs> we said maybe uh, we, we have to do that. Um, we were working on recommendations for Gail's group uh, as far as suggestions for the application, but I don't know if she still wants them. What? Recommendations for the, the design of the application. Do you want to? Yeah. Do you want to? Yeah. Sure. Sure. More than ever, I guess, on the yeah. basis of our discussions. Okay. okay. That's about all we can do right now until we find out about the application as far as writing cataloging rules. We can work on the document as 
specific things like document rules and mm -hmm. stuff like that. For co-picks and retrieval uh, considerations, uh, Bob Long um, is on our task group, and he's also uh, worked with other task groups, so he knows a lot about what's going on in, in <coughs> task groups that will involve co-picks, such as the filing, which is not one of our tasks. Um, I think he was on Gail's group for numbering. And um, actually, it's not really much he can go forward on until he gets some definite answers. So he's really been pushing us for decisions. And um, we can't make Thank you too. Yeah. Let's make our decisions and then let him worry about it. Okay. Um, the only thing further I have to. Um, one thing I want to ask is, do you think we should go ahead with the questionnaire to the paid subscribers? Because that's going to take time to get answers back. The only reason that you gave for not doing it was that you might stir up their hopes. I wouldn't yeah. worry about that. Uh, let's, I think we might learn something okay. from it. If you've got the questionnaire, why not go ahead and send it out and see what you get? Is there any difference uh, from that view? You will consult the other that they have been questioned before in okay. times. Okay. Mr. Rogers did it once. It seems to me it was done once by maybe by Mr. Cooney. I'm not sure. Um, but it was probably okay. just for. Okay. <laughs> because if you if you got you know if you got answers that if you want to ask the same questions been asked before and you got vague answers maybe you want to. Okay. Break. Good idea. Uh, I've, got, I've got one sort of general question, Marie, about that retrieval. Um, do you plan uh, later on, before uh, implementation revision, to do some study on retrieval? Yes, we thought this was something that could not be done by January 1978. No, that was the last I heard. I'm not, that was the last I heard from Bob Long. But Dr. Stevens, have you heard any, anything different? Uh, as far as the retrieval. On retrieval? Yeah. Well, it can go in any way, shape, or form in the MARC format, even in the MARC modified form, we would be able to see it. Is that adequate? Is that adequate for our searching purposes? Uh, probably. Waldo is the one who has to look at that. Uh, it does permit a certain degree of browsing. Again, this is just something that's to be seen in detail. By the way, I might mention that ISO and BSO are having quite a to do among themselves about the retrieval system under Mark, the MUMS and the Scorpio, and what their differences are, and which one's best, and whether they really want to, and whether they want to eventually go to a third and drop them both, or whether to combine them. Uh, <coughs> you know, one single one, of course, it is. Well, it is all up in the air. They both went their own ways. Yeah, but if we are in anything like a, a marked format, whatever the library developed is going to have to handle the so marked format. So you wouldn't get hurt. My change what my change that between Scorpio and the uh, mark. Would somebody very briefly explain the difference between Mums and Scorpio? So I understand that they're just uh, two retrieval packages, software packages that do different things and they assume a different structured database and they were uh, made independently and look like two railroad tracks of, of different of different widths and they just don't meet. I see. Mm -hmm. right. One was designed by one person and one by another. Mums is a very limited application relating only to the only to the mark format records. Score, uh, that is a command language, but it also is associated with the system with the mark records. And Scorpio is a command language as well, but it has a much broader application. It can be used for the various CRS databases mm -hmm. and, and other things around the library. It is also a much closer to uh, to English language. It's much much easier to learn and uh, has more internal software to take shortcuts for you. And that that is what, as a matter of fact, was developed to teach the Congress. And if you can teach the Congress the system, it must be simple. <laughs> so then could it be used for purpose? Oh, yeah. I don't know why not. The question of putting the database in that format, that's 
that, that's what the original proposal was. If we have Scorpio, why don't we just put our Cocos database in that format and, and retrieve? And it's not as simple as it sounds. Well, where is the point of conflict between the DSO and ISO? Well, the fact that there are these two different systems and why not consolidate? And they're being maintained separately. I see. And it's a resource problem. But Scorpio isn't used for our national purposes, is it, Bob? No. It's just the mark. Just Scorpio is used just for the it's with NLC, although some other agencies, I think, are use it and adapt it. You know, we're not going to be able to make these decisions and do anything on this by the beginning of next year. It's just out of the question. I don't think we should kid ourselves. It doesn't detract from the office if it postpones uh, action on these till another year. What I'm afraid of is that we'll freeze ourselves into something that will prevent us from uh, evolving in the right direction later on. We've done that before, and I think we should try to know as much as we can about all this and leave ourselves loose, but for the future. I don't think it's in any way realistic to talk about this as of next year. Is it, does anybody differ from that? Bob differs. Well, if you differ, you'd better darn well get cracking and give us good, solid reasons and uh, and recommendations and the program with dates and all that. Uh, we can't just talk about this sort of thing. Okay. I'll tell you what concerns me, too, uh, one of the reasons I brought it up is the idea of resources. We are having a heck of a time within DSO now, trying, wondering how we're going to get jute boxes, copix, and in process done, and uh, much less uh, worry about uh, retrieval considerations at this time. Well, let's do as much as we can, but we have certain things that have to be done and certain things that would be nice to be done but can't be done if other things take first priority. I think we have to accept that. Go on. Uh, that, that's all I That's have. it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Fine. Um, are there any? Yeah. Go ahead. One problem that didn't get mentioned is during, there will be a policy decision that, that will have to be made in connection with the CCC and uh, that probably will come out of, what, line of this committee? And the question of whether we continue with letter by letter or That's coming go up. Go to word by word by That's that will coming up elsewhere, okay. That's in, uh, where, where is it coming? Index is the record, I think. That's down in, down in, in, okay, okay, fair enough. All right, good. Uh, okay, I think we've covered everything in, uh, subcommittees two and three, and we cover two things in five, no, three and four, and we, we, we cover two things in five. Let's go on to you again, Alan. Uh, our presentation at the present time is on work simplification and modification. What we've been doing is setting aside uh, as priorities those areas that we feel are most susceptible to backlogs as well as areas that appear to be in need of better control of their material. We're also involved in attempting to analyze potential backlogs, which is a much more difficult uh, task. But we're relying heavily on monitoring our workflow and looking for trends that might indicate problem areas. Uh, it's a little premature to go into the substance of the recommendations themselves. We've submitted seven recommendations as of this date. One has been successfully implemented in part, and the other six are awaiting review by the Commission Coordinating Committee. Um, as far as I can see, we've uh, gotten a pretty good reaction thus far to the recommendations, and I, I look forward to them being implemented in the near future, uh, if not uh, in total, uh, hopefully on a trial basis within several of the work units involved. You want to give some examples? Uh, sure. Tell us what, what has been done, for example, the one um, that was implemented. I'll give you an example of the one that's been implemented. Um, I'd like to preface it by saying that at the time we originally made this recommendation, uh, the facts were slightly different from the time that it actually was able to be implemented, and that's the reason it was implemented only in part. Uh, the situation that we were presented with was a, a rather severe backlog in the uh, book section uh, correspondence unit, the examining division. Uh, we did not realize that they were going to be working a Saturday of overtime, which more or less alleviated that yeah, problem. Yeah. Uh, the recommendation at that time consisted of a transfer of some of the additional duties from the correspondence clerks in the book section to the correspondence unit supervisor, who I might say at that time was not a first-line supervisor. 
which also uh, became involved. There were certain union implications right, that we had right. to worry about that were not present at the time the recognition was originally written up. But uh, IBM had conducted a study uh, this past summer that uh, strongly suggested that only, I think it was 57% of our time of correspondence clerks was actually spent typing. That uh, the other 43% of that time was spent on additional duties, everything from filing to answering telephone calls to stamping in replies and so forth. So basically the substance of the recommendation was uh, to transfer some of these uh, additional duties and therefore be able to increase the quota somewhat. If we're let me, let me ask you, IBM did a study of us? Of the Examiner yeah. Division Correspondence Units. It was done more I'm or less I'm vaguely aware of that. What, who paid for it? It was, it was free. free. Yeah. It was free. It was a loophole. Yeah. 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 Uh, they <laughs> wanted us to seriously look at some of their equipment, which we did. Yeah. Um, <laughs> as it ended up, uh, this suggestion was implemented in part. The quota, or what we prefer to look at as a minimum system, was uh, raised in the book section successfully. And uh, since that date, we have not had anywhere of the backlog situation. Of course, the Saturday overtime helped. There was double time productivity during that time, and our backlog went all the way down. Uh, we hope if it ever comes up again that we can look at this recommendation for a second time. Uh, to give you an example of uh, some of the recommendations that are being considered. Um, I think it's premature to go into some of them, but I, I think we could take one as an example and look at that. Um, just pull one out here. We took a look at the situation with warning letters in the examining division and looked at the long practice of sending out uh, warning letters referring uh, to informing the remitter that the office has made a registration in a somewhat doubtful case. Um, we relied on your ID back in 1962 or 63 in reference to post-date <laughs> mandate. <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> we realized that in, in those instances, we were attaching warning letters to the certificate by paper clip and mailing it out, thereby bypassing the whole uh, funneling through the correspondence unit. Um, we have several other warning letters within the examining division, however, that are still sent through the examining, uh, through the correspondence units. Uh, we felt that we might be able to take a look at this and make a recommendation along the same lines. Uh, one of the things we've kept in mind at all times were two factors. First of all, we're, we're trying to make recommendations that will not involve much additional cost. And secondly, all of our recommendations keep in mind that the quality and integrity of our work product must remain at the level we've always prided ourselves with so that none of our recommendations will uh, not address you know, the quality of our work. We thought that we might just cut down some of our warning letters in size and have them attached to the certificates and be mailed that way, that way thereby eliminating having to file this additional material through the uh, correspondence units. Um, another problem is that uh, warning letters really aren't being sent as much as we would like to see them sent. And hopefully if we go to a system like this, examiners will get on it a little bit and make sure that, that the warning letters are attached more. We're also looking at a similar situation with guide letters in certain of the examining uh, sections, uh, warning guide letters, and hopefully uh, we're looking for a situation like that with them. Um, there are other recommendations as well. I've discussed um, some of them with, with Mike Shelley as regards the service division. Um, and I think basically those that have been discussed have, have gotten support. Um, I, I think the other ones are probably a little premature to this, this time. Uh, also involved in what we're doing is following up on the recommendations that have been implemented, which of course we really haven't been able to do yet since we're still awaiting their implementation, but hopefully we'll be able to evaluate their effectiveness and uh, amend them if necessary and report as to how effective they have been. Um, we've also consulted with Mike and Ed in reference to word processing hardware which was within the scope of our task group. And a Mac card A has been ordered for multimedia section. Uh, the examining division office will have a Vidac installed. Uh, we sent out a memoranda to, uh, to the staff as a whole on February 7th, soliciting suggestions. And uh, we received a rather good response, uh, some of them in writing. Uh, but basically, we opened up a good line of communication with the staff. And that's really all important to our group. Uh, it's very difficult to work on work simplification without uh, 
meeting with as many people as possible and, and getting all kinds of ideas from all members of the staff. So we felt that was very helpful. Um, either a task group member or myself, I've spoken to most of the supervisory personnel within the office uh, concerning what aid we might be to them. And this brings up the fact that a lot of our work is really of an informal nature, as well as uh, putting our memorandum through Marlene and through the Division Coordinating Committee. Um, an example of this, for instance, would be our working with the multimedia section in helping them set up uh, the content formatting and programming of new guide letters so that they can utilize their new mag card A as efficiently as possible. We've also made ourselves available to sections that are having particular unusual backlog problems and wish to hear our suggestions, uh, problems that may arise just uh, really once in a blue moon that uh, really don't have to be uh, addressed uh, across mm -hmm. the board. Um, where appropriate, and this comes up to what we were discussing uh, with Mike before, we will be somewhat involved in staffing overtime and space considerations, but in such, such instances we've been coordinating with Mike and Eric and so forth so as to avoid a duplication of efforts. Um, there, are, there are certain times when I'm sure our group is going to be duplicating the efforts of what Mike's task group is going to be involved with. However, there are other times where it might be very helpful to have more than one task group looking into these areas. Uh, it depends on the perspective that you're looking at. Uh, oftentimes we might see something that they might, and they might see something that we might not. So we, we're rather having uh, quite a bit of success that way when working with Mike. Um, we uh, just wanted everybody here to know that although we're making recommendations uh, it's not to be taken in any way as an indication that uh, any particular work unit is operating ineffectively or inefficiently. It's really been difficult for us to find areas that uh, need improvement in many of the work units within the office. Uh, really the situation is that many of the practices and procedures have just become slightly outdated over a period of time and we look forward to being able to maintain as much assemblage of currency as we can so that we'll be ready for revision. Uh, we'll also be involved somewhat in some of the effects of the new law. Uh, for instance, uh, Dr. Stevens brought something to uh, Mary and Penny's attention that we'll be looking into in reference to the referral system. And uh, Cynthia Campbell and myself are, are, are looking into that situation. Um, basically what it is is that we're going to be having a new numbering system. And we're going to have to try to close out as many of these old referrals as possible. So this is something that we're looking into at the present time. And uh, I'm just rather happy with, with the rest of the Yeah. Um, you had one recommendation that was implemented? In part. In part. Uh, who did the recommendation go to? OK, well, our recommendations are sort of funneled through. The recommendation first goes to Marlene. Marlene and I discuss it. Then uh, Marlene sends it to Penny and Mary, and Penny and Mary uh, decide so the as to its merit. To the and then it goes to the division right. for, and the reason for the what? Consideration. For consideration and usually discussion. Of I think he's asking why didn't this go to the policy? No, no, I'm, on the contrary, I'm not, because so far nothing that I've heard strikes me as the kind of thing that should be in the revision coordinating structure at all. And the reason only one has been uh, partially implemented is that the revision coordinating committee only received the others on Friday. But it sounds, it sounds like a very desirable activity, um, but because what it amounts to is, is a special committee that's going to troubleshoot problems in the office with respect to work simplification and workflow. Yeah, I'd like to comment on that. It probably is the type of job that, that should be and probably has been uh, you know, addressed uh, you know, across the board within the office. Um, it, you know, it's my hope that when the uh, revision coordinating committee's job ends as of January 1st, that other people you know, take on this duty and continue with it. Uh, you know, it just is very important within the office. Well, if Mike were here, he'd probably say that it is, it's his job, and in some ways it is. Uh, we he couldn't do it to the detail well, that they are. We can't. We can't afford that this year anyway. And well, what, what what comes out of it next year, we'll just have to see. The um, things that they're recommending are done by people who are involved in that work on a day to day basis. I agree, and uh, I I think this is what what you're doing is extremely urgent this year, and it's it's conceivable that we would want to have a, a troubleshooter across the board after this, but. 
we'll, we'll confront that when we come to it. Uh, it seems to me almost unthinkable that we just go ahead business as usual this year when we're facing what we are. My one question was whether or not you're looking at the statistics to see where the the buildups are, if, if any, and sure. so forth. There are increases, and uh, I think it would be very useful to have some kind of scan of the uh, of the actual weekly statistics to see what is happening in the office. You look at the monthly statistics, and it's not too revealing. Uh, yeah, my, I was just going to say I hope they go beyond that to see if there are areas where we do not now teach statistics that we did. Yeah. yeah, we've been doing that. As a matter of fact. Uh, I brought something to Marlene's attention and, and to Mike's attention that, that had to do with a, a form that Mrs. Mike has been using, the Human Service Division, which is basically a, a report of, of time, time mm -hmm. lost due to vacancies, time lost due to um, leave without pay, sick leave annually. And this is, this is very important for, for each division, for each division chief, as well as to my group and to Mike and, and so forth. Um, so that, for instance, Bill Poole, who's a, a member of my group, is looking into a additional statistics uh, that he might be keeping with a master index. Um, we've been you know, monitoring the currency reports and so forth. <laughs> I've been working uh, with Mike. I met with Mike last Wednesday to discuss with him the, the graphs that we're keeping in reference to the backlog and so forth. But I, I think I'm pretty pleased to say that at the present time, the situation has not reached any emergency level. Yeah. Uh, the combination of, of uh, staffing and overtime and extenuating circumstances is tending to keep the uh, whole situation under control. Well, you'll be able to, s to tell if at any point uh, in, in time or in any particular place it gets out of control and mm -hmm. uh, address it right away, which I think is terribly important. Mark? Alan, I just had one small question. <clears throat> On these warning letters, uh, these were letters for which we keep copies, I take it. Mm -hmm. Send the original in this convenient fashion, but the retained or miscellaneous file. Right. This is only kept in the miscellaneous file. The, the, the method uh, of sending it out is not by developing a, a UV envelope, but by attaching what we commonly call the informality sheet and filling that out and having that the copy of the correspondence file and the miscellaneous file. So we do have a record. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say about the um, currency reports, the funding staff puts out is a very gross. Uh, yeah very gross thing on it. We've been given a copy to uh, Ellen, and you can see from that uh, where the larger backlogs are and how we're doing. It looks like we're making good progress. What I would think that the production control group could do is get into things in a lot more detail, like is there a backlog in no replies or, or, or smaller kind of things that don't show up on, on this uh, on this larger yeah. cut. Yeah. And and I think this is where it's useful. Doing. As a matter of fact, there's certain statistics that don't show up, for instance, on the Gantt charts, uh, on the currency reports weekly. Uh, for instance, um, it's very easy to note how many cash dates are on hand within a particular examining section, but there really is no record about how many uh, pieces of foreign material Not might true. be backlogging during that period of time that one may be pushing their cash without mm -hmm. paying attention to some of that. I'm well aware. So we're, we're well aware that also and have been addressing ourselves to those problems. Um, as to the no replies, um, that's one of our recommendations that we put in. So we're, we're really that's, I think, one of your best ones. I have read them. Yeah, I like that. And <laughs> the, uh, the beauty of uh, all of their recommendations is that ne they'll be even more valuable to us next year, I think, than this year. We wouldn't have to change anything if they are adopted. Yeah, I'm very satisfied with uh, the, the, the subcommittee and what you're doing. And, uh, I hope uh, if any of you have any specific uh, suggestions or if... Uh, you, you are aware of backlog problems <coughs> and feel that something should be done about them that should call them to the subcommittee's uh, the task group's attention. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just have a question. Uh, is there any trends uh, toward an uh, increase in receipts? Like toward, I'm thinking, you know, some people try to rush and get things in before they move out. Do you see what um, I mean? Yeah, I was just discussing with a couple people in the office the other week, and I think as of last month, there tended to be about an eight percent increase in registrations, but you have to take into consideration why that is so. Now, some of it may be um, some of this increase may be added to by examiners working overtime, right? Um, but I, I think that it, it is obvious that there are certain people that are wanting to register now 
for several reasons. Either because the benefits are really old or that they're not going to be able to have on the new one. Or in reference to this case of the English dollars, there's several remitters that are sending in large deposits that may want to take advantage of that lower state. There was also some legal misinformation going around. Uh, you better register within three months or you're going to lose all your efforts under the new law. <laughs> and that might have accounted for it. And that was understanding was contributed to by some of the biggest names <laughs> in copyright law courses in the university. <laughs> We're starting to be hit very hard now on deposits of motion pictures. Uh, one, only one uh, outfit, I think it's Columbia, which is not one of the larger registers, is depositing now on the told 100 titles a week and two copies, and we'll be doing so here. And uh, we're going to go out space. This is television stuff. Some more <laughs> <laughs> there must be a reason for that. Yes. Yeah, well, that's Mr. Widener's part. If you remember. FBI. The FBI. Oh, yeah. yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Along the same lines, there are also a lot of commercials that are being registered now that hadn't been before. No, so they're seeing a very large increase in deposits. The registrations are cyclical anyway over the year. I think if you watch the summer months, and if you see a, a continual increase through the summer months, you'll find. Well, we were running 12% uh, 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 ahead of last year. Last year was a, a smallish year, as these things go, so that you could anticipate to, to, to the, the ordinary trend would have called for maybe a 5 or 6% increase this year. We were, we were running 12% in December, no, in November, and it dropped back to 10 in December and back to 8 in January. But that's still a gigantic increase if you translate it into numbers. It's an enormous increase in work. And the fact that we are reasonably current, I think, is a real tribute to the office. And uh, obviously, we have to anticipate the worst. And I suspect that what Gloria is asking will come to pass. That as the year goes on, we'll get more and more. That's the building of the effect of the current state. <laughs> yes, well, <laughs> I'm afraid that's going to get worse before it gets better. <laughs> Are there any other questions on this? No. Okay. Oh, Bob? Yeah. I would suggest that when revision is over, what Ellen has been doing ought to go into TNT, probably. Maybe with additional stamps. It seems like they're <laughs> bag rather than mic. How do you feel about this? As a, uh, in terms of organizational structures? So. Yeah, it's, um, it's a bit of a fuzzy area between uh, TNT and admin. Yeah. And we've been each doing some as it goes on, and uh, nothing as, as thorough as a dedicated group. But uh, um, it, could, it could be in either place. I, I'm willing to do it. I sort of, I sort of enjoy keeping the tabs on things myself. Well, it seems to me that it, <laughs> to have one person who's dedicated just to this, and uh, uh, do, doesn't do it as part of some other larger job that it has a lot to be said for it in a big production operation. There's another possibility too, and um, that is if the uh, office grows in staff, it might be possible to look towards a person that's doing um, what you might call project control for mm -hmm. each division. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think there are a lot of places that it, it could fit, but I think it's really important to continue doing it regardless of whether. I'm inclined to agree with you, and I'm glad that this emerged today because I don't think it had before. Uh, Luke? Yeah, I don't know if we have time for the question, but I, uh, if we do, uh, the question was could you go into a little more detail about what you're doing with respect to use of form letters? Yeah, um, that's going to be a big answer. It's going to be a, bi a big, long answer, okay? Oh, all right. Do you want to shoot? <laughs> do you mind? Well, uh, how long? <laughs> yeah, well, five or six minutes. All right, let's let's keep it at that. <laughs> All right, um, that brings up a larger problem, which is what is the uh, where do word processors put into the office, and should our nature, should our correspondence retain its its original nature, or should it be transformed into form letters? Right. No. <laughs> okay. Um, well, let, let me ask you what you meant by your question, and maybe I misunderstood it. No, no, please. It was just a general inquiry. Sure. I just disagree with what you said. That's all right. I know that there's a form letter and a guide letter. Yes. You trained. 
I think other task groups are working on the actual writing of new form letters and so forth. We're somewhat involved in the generation of new guide letters. What, what we're hoping to do is maintain as much of a personal nature and a correspondence as possible. I imagine that we may be transforming some of our uh, most often frequently used guide letters into form letters, but we're also looking into the possibility of word processors and their places in the office, the faster generation of guide letters, um, and, and not going completely over to the use of form letters in the office. Are, are you generally looking at all the guide letters and form letters in use in the examining division? Yeah. Definitely. And for the revision in light of the new law? Well, this is something that I had discussed with, uh, with a couple of section heads. Um, we've been working in the book section, for instance, and revising our guide letters. Um, we feel that it was a little, it's a little premature at the present time to start writing our new guide letters dealing with the problems that we'll be having uh, during revision. Um, we're waiting for a lot of our people to complete Mary Beth's course. <laughs> gain a, a better knowledge of the new law and so forth until we actually go you know, full speed ahead with writing the new guide letters. But we have been revising the old ones. But you have that on your task list, don't oh, you? Oh, yeah. This is one of the things we're involved in. It is? Yes. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not too clear as to where the, the generation of the new form letters and uh, uh, pattern paragraphs and guide letters is entrusted. Uh, to some of its, to some extent, it's, it's with our, our task, Dick's task group, with my committee, the study number 18 that I mentioned Friday, which was to isolate all grounds of acceptance and of rejection and doubtful acceptance, was supposed to include a review of all form letters and kind of practice. To the extent not picked up in there, I think that falls in the residuary category of, at some point towards the end of this year, sitting actually sitting down with the compendium, guide letters, pattern paragraphs, section memos and all related documents and, and finding what hasn't been covered in one manner or another. Mm -hmm. I think this will have to be done probably maybe by even a, an ad hoc committee of, of committee heads to sit down in September, October and review all of these practices or procedures or what have you. But to a certain extent, some of it is being covered already. Inevitably, some of the form letters are going to be produced by problems with the new application forms, whatever we do. We right? hope not. Well, <laughs> we all hope not. Well, it's a question of looking at the old plus, plus creating. Yeah. Um, inevitably, just as sure as we're, you're sitting here. And what, you just can't predict that. What any recommendations from this group should feed into you, to you then, shouldn't it? Or maybe vice versa. Well, no, I think Mary and Penny will be able to decide where they should fit into I would think to the extent possible where John has made an assignment, that person would carry through all the way to the end in terms of recommending language for the community yeah. and then for That's what I mean. They right they so it would, we would see that that person works very closely with one of the sections. Mm -hmm. I think in that area, though, because it is a matter of, of substance, that um, a more stringent standard of coordination with John's group and decision group would be important. This is something really Mary and I haven't written this last year yet. That's where the problem starts. Well, I don't think you could decide that until. That's right. <laughs> I think that's the point of this residuary end of the yeah, year. Yeah, right. Too early to do that. Before the end of the year. Well, yeah, but not next week. Not next week. Maybe the week after. Okay. If there are no other questions, then let's move on. Ed, you're the last one in task in subcommittee five. Okay. The um, task group is called reorganization of existing functions, <coughs> and it comes to that this is a very propitious time to look at organization as a whole. We're, uh, we're operating in the office now with an organization that was essentially set in, in the 1940s when our total staff was, I mentioned, somewhere in the range of 200 people. Uh, current projections under revision through 1981 call, call for around 700. Uh, these kind of numbers alone make it, uh, make it useful to have a look at, at the organization as a, as a totality. Um, also, there, there are new functions under the new law, and 
their, uh, many of the existing functions have added responsibility. And it was thought that this could both be worked into the organization at some points and in the specific uh, position descriptions uh, to strengthen, strengthen them. Uh, up to now, I guess for the last, the last year or two, we've been thinking of reorganization, some in the office, and we've realized we've had a span of control problem. And this came about when we realized that we had about half the number of supervisors per, uh, well, about twice as many employees per supervisor as the director of the library. And we've, we've looked into it on, um, essentially on a division basis and sections within a division, but nothing further than that has been done. We've had an examining division reorganization where we've made teams um, to have a, have a closer span of control. Uh, we've looked at it also in catalog and done a little bit in some areas of service as, as an office. But it's, uh, it's a good time now to look at it uh, from, a, from a larger sense, not, not just from a, a section end. Let me say a little bit about, about our task group. We're, um, our task group, is only, there's, only, there's only three of us, and we've talked Marley into becoming a working member, so now there's four, which is very not beneficial. But we're not going to unilaterally reorganize the office, obviously. But what we're trying to do is gather information, uh, raise issues, explore alternatives, and, and document the, uh, the pros and cons of of uh, uh, various ways of setting up uh, organization. We want to issue some very tentative recommendations with, uh, with uh, documentation, extensive documentation to the Revision Coordinating Committee. Uh, among our own group, we noticed we've talked this out. We don't have a consensus, and we differ quite a bit on how certain things should be, which, which is an advantage, because when we write the pros and cons, we, we have it right there. It's also proven to be a little more difficult than I might have guessed at the start, it's a little bit like we learned with uh, our in-process system effort. Uh, the, present, the present system's not so bad. It has, <laughs> it has a lot going for it, even though there are, is room for improvement. The, the first idea is, well, we can just change it all around, but it doesn't, it's not quite that easy. Anyway, some of the things that, that we're considering, and I'll, I'll, I'll be general, are the creation of additional divisions. We have, we have four now, and there were four when there were 200 people in the office, and uh, maybe we need uh, eight, ten, something like that. Uh, creation of additional top administrators. Uh, possible reorganization in more, along more functional lines. Trying to bring functional parts of the office together that tend to be apart. Uh, same thing would be moving away from the pool concept. Trying to break pools apart and put them where they where they would work functionally. Uh, might also call this a more decentralized organization. And. I guess I could say a, a little bit some of, some of the specific areas that we're, uh, we're looking at some is the uh, placement of the Royal Game Licensing Division. Should that be separate? Should it be uh, mixed in with our current functions? Uh, compliance functions are a very difficult one. There's a number of ways of doing that. Should it be, should it be, uh, should it be uh, split apart and, and perhaps put into examining? Should it be put together? If it is, where should it go? And we have a lot of difference of opinion on that, but we're writing that all down so it can be dealt with. Um, the creation of a records management division has been talked about for some time, and that uh, we seem to be pretty much in agreement that that's a useful thing. Um, things like decentralization possibilities exist for registering numbering for uh, the open UB file, and that, that's being explored. We don't, we're not at the state where we have specific proposals now, but what we, what we are at the state is we have we have raised some issues and, and some questions and we'd like to go to the division chiefs and we plan to do that over the next uh, over the next two weeks and explore some of these issues and uh, perhaps about four to six weeks get a uh, get a paper into the division coordinating committee with some tentative organization. Um, so anything more on that, or, or Marlene? No, that's covered. Our uh, our questions would be raised in general. This is uh, an informal contact, one by one. Yes, we would just invite a chief to a meeting of the. Department. Don't you think it would be useful to have a meeting like this on just on organization at some point? Could be. Yeah. Could be a different use. I think some interchange you might, in that uh, general mm -hmm. context might. Be you might want to have some alternatives ready to, you know, to yeah. talk about. 
And you, you think that we'd have something concrete to talk about in about six weeks? Yeah. I, would, I, would, I think it would be better as a first cut to meet, meet with the division chiefs by themselves. I, I agree. John? Ed, I don't know if you or Jim would be able to do the video. Is somebody looking at the, the UB system to see if that's a sufficient filing system? Or correspondence of the company's recordations as opposed to registrations? The recordations are put on microfilm. There's ways of finding There's really a way to see correspondence from part of the company. Is somebody looking at that? Some of this, I think that should be in the indexes to records. Some of it's going to be in the unprocessed system uh, later on, but not immediately. What is at the root of your, of your question, John? Just for example, on the interim procedures that Waldo uh, drew up for that ad hoc committee, one question I had each time, as you know, is you put the, the document, be it a termination notice or a public broadcasting agreement or a cable notice uh, on the public record. But there, the possibility was raised of correspondence, either doubtful acceptance or just clarification. What happens to that correspondence? Where is that file? To someone searching for a recordation of a document also have access to correspondence? An equivalent of a UB system for recordations. I, I don't know what the answers are, A, and, and B, I'm wondering if anything, anyone is looking at the I don't system. think that falls in your bailiwick, but uh, whose does it fall? Is the Wild House record? I suppose. I guess so. I suppose. Uh, that, like so many things, we sort of take what we have for granted, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you're right. We're not you're right. lucky. There, there is a, a good point that he raises. We do have a code to show whether it's correspondence in the case of, a, of an application by a little check mark, uh, at least for modern ones. But we don't have, I believe, an equivalent for the docs, uh, which is an interesting point. And probably something I'll be off. We'll go back to the first one. For a is even the UB system sufficient, or have there been problems with that? Well, nothing is perfect <laughs> in this world. <laughs> but when we have a case, uh, somebody wants to see the correspondence about a recordation, uh, we, can we can find it, we hope. Uh, you can find it as readily as you as can. As you can in another case, except that with, with recent registration, there is a check mark on the application That's right. that tells you that you've got to keep looking until you find it. Uh, whereas with with a, a, a recordation, you might give up a little earlier, a little easier. So uh, should we take as a conclusion your subcommittee will also include looking at the uh, yes, and, and this raises the further question about letters of transmittal, disposition, and other things. But uh, your point's very good, and it's taken, and we'll, we'll include it. I think it's a very good point. <laughs> right now, you can't find the document correspondence very easily because the remitter's not on the that's another factor, right? And uh, maybe factor. it should be, and maybe that's where it should be checked. Well, Mark might have to concern about this. This is going to become a, a, a greater problem. Mm -hmm. under, under the, mm -hmm. Not just in these new recording things, but the, uh, the regular recordings. Right. <coughs> Those people will be more readily able to put a stain on somebody else's. Thing. That's right. Our subcommittee would be very glad to have any um, ideas that anybody has on the organization. Well, of course, this is this is one of the, the most crucial uh, things that we are confronted with, and I think it's something everybody has views on, and they, you know, there may very well be some strongly conflicting views. I don't know that we want to get into the substance of this beyond what. It is already suggested. I mean, if they could write their, write us a note on it. I think it is terribly important that we go into any reorganization that we manage to achieve with a certain degree of support from the, the, the staff as a whole, not just the uh, supervisory cadre, but the whole staff. I think they have to understand the reasons if we're going to do this. and. Uh, we can't just reorganize for the sake of reorganizing, yet it does seem obvious that there has to be some, and uh, the extent to which we go remains to be seen. So one of the things we have been looking at is uh, any possibility of a phased approach where we put some, some amount of reorganization into effect by January 178 and uh, defer another part. But that would be a possibility, too. Okay. We don't bite off too much. Obviously, there are space implications with all of this. We've got uh, immediate space problems, middle-range space problems, and the fact we're going to have to move and that the 
contractors already in the building over there, I guess. Uh, I might say in passing here, for the sake of those who are interested, and I guess it's everybody, we have had a turn down on any additional space in this building that I have to accept as final. There's just no way. Uh, it's going to McClellan. And uh, so we're going to have to either squeeze or move somebody out. And I guess we'll move the administrative office out. I made declarations very much opposed to that earlier, but I've been convinced by your arguments that uh, we just can't afford to move any part of the regular processing work processing out, so the only people that can move are the administrative people. And I hate this like the very devil, but I don't know what else to do. But I guess we're going to have to explore this. And again, if you have thoughts or suggestions, pass them on. This is kind of an emergency. We are going to have to do something pretty soon. I assume that would include the planning office and the general counsel? Yes. I think everything that's on the fifth floor now that isn't... Uh, okay. That is a lot. <laughs> Well, let's see what uh, the examining division <laughs> office and uh, what else? Nothing. Library. 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 library would have to go. That's right. The certificates are done. The up certificates. There. That's right. Yeah, I need to receive. Where would you go? <laughs> well, I look out my window and I hope I see why where we'd go. I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> but I mean, they're, they've, they've got the lights on in there now. <laughs> they're beginning to put. Well, they got windows in. And I, Walls up. Uh, I don't know. The city hall in Toronto, as I remember, is, is U shaped like this, and if you're over here in this one building, it has to go down. And <laughs> down. So it's what we're going to be doing, I guess. Well, I'm afraid it's not going to be easy. But uh, what are the choices? Uh, the, 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 you know, EPA got a whole lot more new positions, so they want more space in this building, much less. Did you want to comment on all those modest proposals in the last year? Yes, and uh, we've, th we've talked, and they've been very nice. Um, <laughs> uh, but I think that the way I approached it was that when we move, you, maybe you could move, too, at the same time. And they were agreeable. This is not for publication. But um, that is a drop in the bucket. Yeah. Okay, I didn't, I, I thought I would, this is, we're sort of going into <laughs> registers, comments, although you don't need to worry about it. Okay. Anything else on reorganization? Uh, then let's go on to Mark and the FOIA and the privacy. Our task group uh, is slowly becoming organized. All of us attended the overview presented by the Civil Service Commission <coughs> at the Department of Labor about 10 days ago. And this was very helpful in uh, mm. focusing attention on the, on the basic materials and some of the principal problem areas presented by these two very complicated uh, legislative enactments. And our immediate tasks, <coughs> as this outline indicates, of course, uh, will be to organize the uh, inventory list of existing files in the office, information files. And as best we can to organize them under the uh, FOIA and the PREBA settings, to use the acronym, related to the facts. And in addition to that, to identify added files which are will be called for under the new law. And this will require a detailed and uh, itemized uh, identification of the, of the various systems. And will entail ultimately also consideration by the office as to what systems among these various uh, identified systems it wishes to preserve what new systems it wishes to, to uh, undertake to set up, and what the consequences will be in either event <coughs> under both of these acts. Because <coughs> after January 1, we will, uh, we will be uh, committed formally to, to 
certain record systems. And uh, any changes, uh, such as, for example, conversion of a manual system to an automated system, will have ramifications which will require uh, undertaking formal steps by way of uh, announcing in the Federal Register uh, these changes and uh, proceeding under the Administrative Procedures Act in making such changes or adjustments. The uh, Office of Management and Budget is, stands ready to assist us in the matter of the Privacy Act, implementation of the Privacy Act, which has uh, some interesting uh, side effects, or may have some interesting side effects on our operation. Uh, one of which immediately comes to mind arises from the fact that we, <coughs> uh, which as an office, or who as an office, are subordinate to the library, and uh, on the one hand, yet on the other hand, uh, we are uniquely uh, within the purview of, of the Privacy Act, whereas the library, our parent organization, is not. So the question arises, does that mean that the uh, formally intra-transmission of reports and so forth from the Copyright Office to the library and vice versa, does this become now an inter-agency, have the status of an inter-agency transmission for purposes of the Privacy Act, and therefore uh, would the transmission of, of uh, time and attendance sheets and, and disbursement uh, and information and so forth to other departments in the library uh, require uh, an accounting for that as, as a disclosure within the meaning of the Privacy Act. Because um, in general, under the terms of the Privacy Act, one must account <coughs> for every disclosure of information from files that are accessed by the names of individuals or files which are accessed by symbols or marks or counters or whatever uh, by means of which an, in an individual may be identified. This includes administrative files like yes. Lee records? Yes, it would. Now, tentatively <coughs> and informally, uh, the person at Office of Management of the Budget to whom I spoke uh, indicated that in all probability we would have to treat these uh, transmissions, which had been routine, as disclosures within the meaning of, of the Privacy Act, but that they could be arranged in such a fashion, or accounted for in, in uh, such a fashion, uh, grouped, in other words, <coughs> that uh, a minimal amount of, uh, of accounting and paperwork would be involved. So they would be treated, for example, in the case of the time and attendance sheets, they could be treated as routine uses. And this would in turn require that the office in, in initially setting up the files and announcing them formally in the Federal Registry identify not only the file, but of course its routine use, routine use for which it was intended. And provided we keep the, the uh, transmissions and the uh, other trafficking with a particular file within that routine use, then it will, its, its accounting and so forth will be simplified. Otherwise, <coughs> one is obliged under the privacy terms to maintain a, a, a detailed record, the date, for example, of a disclosure, let us say a, a personnel file of John Smith is transferred for some reason to some other agency, we would have to keep a record of the date on which that was uh, transferred or disclosed, the person to whom it was disclosed, or the officer to whom it was disclosed to the other agency, and the purpose for which it was disclosed, and keep that information for at least five years. All other government agencies have to do that. Yes. And the only question is whether we have to do it when we're, it's internal within the library. Right. And you're saying that as long as it's done in a routine 
basis within the library and it's covered by a general statement in the Federal Register world? Well, it would be probably uh, covered by a, a general statement. And the, the bottom line on that would be whether or not X, the uh, individual inquiring, uh, would be able to, to track the record. So, for example, if we were to say that uh, time and attendance sheets for a certain section were routinely forwarded uh, to the library on the, the, the Monday of every week and so forth, that would suffice rather than yeah. having to, to itemize each date and time and place. Yeah, Bob, you had a question. I'm puzzled by the whole thing. Well, it's, uh, it's a piece it's, of foolishness. It's and, a bunch uh, of foolishness. Uh, I don't understand the dividing line between us and any other agency that's doing internal work. Uh, the, the big that problem is that the library doesn't feel itself policy. bound by this, that's all. Um, yeah. But does any agency normally, when it uh, transmits payroll records from one department to another, have to report this? Not within its own agency. Not within its own department. We're all one department. Yes. Since the library did not. Is there some legal message? Yes, we can get the library to come under the APA too, but they don't want to. But the Administrative Procedures Act specifically excludes the legislative. But couldn't it apply to the copyright work and not to its. Administrative interrelationships with the library. This look, this doesn't bother me. It's a it's a little nothing wrinkle, and I I, I it doesn't bother me. Believe me. I, I think it's not that important. No, it is definitely not that important. Let's talk about things other than personnel records, which uh, So the uh, we will be obliged to disclose. Uh, bases on which we, we take decisions as for it. And according to the, the, general, the general guidelines, uh, so far as they're known at the moment, uh, a member of the public is not bound by any action we take pursuant to a policy or practice that has not been formally published. Incorporated in our, in our published record. There are there are provisions for in the Freedom of Information Act for uh, records which must be uh, published in copies and those which may be divulged by uh, being made available for copying as well. The uh, Formal notices of rulemaking must be published in the Federal Register, and for this purpose, we are assured of assistance from the Federal Registry in the drafting of, of such notices, which are tend to be rather complicated. We're pretty deep into this already, mm -hmm. and uh, it's working all right, wouldn't you say, John? Yeah, there's no problem. And the Office of the Federal Register has been cooperating. And as was uh, Alluded to Friday in the uh, in the solicitation of information from members of the public, we will have to uh, prepare a statement in which the person from whom the information is solicited is advised of the of the Privacy Act of the reasons why the statutory authority for having made the request of, of that person, the purpose um, for which the information is intended. We're querying the subscriber, the present subscribers to the CCE I'm not sure what the question is. Are you asking said. personal questions? No. I mean, like name, address? No. no but they go into the digital. Yeah. No, we're asking them things about, well, I guess you could say, why did they, what do they need to CCE for? Well, I 
the survey is being conducted this year. Right. We're acting Obviously. as if we're not bound by that. One of my very fundamental questions is I want to pinpoint where we're, where we're violating the law now, if we were mm -hmm. under it. And I'd like to, to go on and legitimize ourselves as soon as possible, right away. Well, the Privacy Act only covers individuals. It does, yeah. not, it does not cover uh, proprietary entities, proprietary entities of any kind, partnerships and the like. It does not. would not be covered. Do we have an individual uh, subscriber? Yes. We do have some individual. Yeah. Well, the only problem there would be with, with the ballot would be there's nothing in the Privacy Act or the Freedom of Information Act to preclude us from conducting the survey. The, no. only, the no. only aspects would be A, should we put a statement on it? Well, we don't right. have those statements on oh, the yeah, application right. forms, which go to the individuals. Right. And second, what do we do with the results when we get them in, which may have been put into the way the survey is constructed mm -hmm. on an anonymous or named basis? Mm -hmm. But uh, certainly nothing to prevent us from going ahead with this. As I understand it, executive agencies, I think if they ask more than 10 people the same question, they have to clear the questionnaire through the OMB, Office of Management and Budget. Uh, will we, the library has not done this, uh, but will, is there anything in this act that we'll be subject to that will require us to clear the, these, any questionnaires that we send out through them. These are ad hoc. I, I think, if things. I recall correctly, that's that's an executive directive. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. I, I wouldn't think so, but the, the OIB will be happy to. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah.
we're not going to be doing that much different under the new law. Uh, I don't think we're, the, the, the executive agencies have been deluged with requests for stuff that had been squirreled away and have very, have been very unavailable. And I think we've been making practically everything. We're trying to lean over backwards uh, in that direction. Does uh, this law mean that uh, any individual can go to an executive agency and ask to see material that they have classified as confidential within that agency? They now can't do that? No. Well, there are nine exceptions so to what has to be exception. disclosed. And uh, there's that stuff they just assume them? not uh, they disclosed. But, uh, right. and they, I mean, and we did put LC confidential, you know, over a lot of, a lot of things. Yeah, well, well, that, well, if they were under the Privacy Act, they couldn't do that. That's right. They? On some and of them. The that. library doesn't want to disclose its acquisitions policies no. and a lot of its internal regulations. And that's one reason they've never been willing to. Or it's administrating. That's what I mean. Yeah. But th that's an interesting aspect of the interface of the library and the materials they produce to us vis-a-vis -vis these, these two acts. Uh, but in general, the word that we had from, uh, from the people at the symposium was that the agency's determination of what may be confidential probably would not uh, be ultimately determinative. In other words, they, the, the, the Congress has taken a very <clears throat> close look at this, and as a result, they have made a change recently so that, for example, in the case of classified documents, uh, in order to enjoy the benefits of the exemption, they have to be, quote, properly classified. Mm -hmm. It isn't sufficient that they be classified. Barbara gets uh, So the courts have a chance, you see, to look at it and see whether or not, in a particular instance, the, the classification was Proper. Of course, this primarily arises in regard to military classifications. Barbara Secret. gets things from the librarian occasionally, or the library marked LC confidential. Mm -hmm. Now, if if this these are documents that are used here in the copyright business, would this it's original. It's original. no longer this classification would not apply? Well, it might turn on whether the burden well, is governed by the originating agency or the receiving agency is one of the problems of marketing. And one of the one of the areas of exemption would be uh, working papers, attorney's papers, mm -hmm. and things of this kind of a confidential nature. But there are some interesting nuances. For example, if the, if, if the head of an organization uh, calls for opinions from, from the staff, and then uh, having received, say, 10, 10 different opinions and being presented with as many options in regard to a particular decision, uh, uh, decides to say, well, <clears throat> opinion number eight, uh, I prefer. In fact, this, this fairly states <laughs> my thinking all along. Then, then the question arises, has that agency had adopted this opinion so as to make it, so as to open it under the Freedom of Information Act. And the general opinion seems to be that, that by virtue of having adopted that opinion, that working paper, and uh, identifying one's thinking with its <coughs> argumentation, then uh, no longer would the agency be able to invoke that uh, the fifth exemption there to, to exclude that. So, so the agency has to be very careful. Just never agree with your subordinates. <laughs> <laughs> any policy or practice that you, you adopt should go out. Well, of course, we've had this pulling and hauling in this office over uh, attorneys' memos. Yeah. And I'm not sure I know exactly where we have come out on that. One, one very difficult area is, is the so-called Exemption 4, which involves trade secrets, commercial knowledge, commercial information, and so forth. It seems to be directly pertinent to uh, the searching operation. If Corporation A <coughs> writes to the Copyright Office, contemplate, well, we'll say a, an attorney representing Corporation A writes to the Copyright Office, they're contemplating merger or purchase or something of this kind. And uh, it's definitely in their interest to uh, keep that confidential. So the question is, uh, well, what is the status of that correspondence in their request? Can, 
questions? Can some third party come along who has gotten wind of the fact that something is up but doesn't know the details, and they come to the copyright office and say, well, what requests have you had within the last six months from All these things will have to be studied, though, aren't they? And right. but papers I, put forward. Do you can you see? Uh, I was getting a regulation out on, on the implementation of this in the copyright office, or at least making this part of our regulations. Other agencies have done so. Look at that. So that the question you're asking, well, we'll probably have hearings and then interchange on. I'd be interested to see what people said. I my own well, my. I don't think the problems are going to end up being that difficult for the office. Once we get it structured and organized and know what all the questions are, I think that really has to be our first concern now, right? I think we can live with what the answers have to be given. My, my real concern is finding out what all the questions are and getting the office organized so the Freedom of Information Act requests, if indeed we ever get any, and we may never get any in that circuit, go one way and circuit points another way, one just way. so that we can comply with the reporting. Right. One, one thing that uh, stood out <coughs> at the symposium and also at the attorney <coughs> seminar was, the, was our unique situation. Nobody seemed to have an answer <coughs> or be able to address the special problems that, that, that we uh, encountered by virtue of being an office of record yeah. rather than an agency that keeps records for some other purpose. A representative, for example, from the Department of Defense uh, conceded that that their uh, budgetary uh, allotment for for the implementation of these two acts was very extensive, and so extensive, in fact, that they couldn't even afford to undertake an, a, a cost accounting analysis to determine precisely what it was. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Federal Bureau of Investigation uh, has, I believe, currently $12 million allocated for for implementing these acts in one year. Well, with us, you divide that by 10, and that's how many work. Yeah. So reports <laughs> being <laughs> In some respects, that makes it a little easier <laughs> to answer some of the questions, since we are set up to make our information public. Right. Well, is that the uniqueness that they were pointing yeah. out? Yeah. Uh, our fact is that if we Torsion, that's true. Presumably we will have some of this in as much of it as we can have by the first of January published and written and so forth. But obviously there will be things coming up under the new law all the time. You know, does this mean that we can't take an action that's not published? In other words, somebody sends something in that's novel. Can we take an action? Go into that novel question without having a fact that's published first. Dick, I think that's exactly the type of thing that Mark's subcommittee shouldn't even be bothering with. Mm -hmm. I think it, it'll be our job to get that out of my own way. I was just curious. And I think the answer is no, but the, there's a difference between publishing so that everybody's aware of it <coughs> and publishing for comment. And you don't no, have to handle right. the two things the same way. But you do have to. For example, it might be sufficient to put it in the compendium if the compendium is publicly available. But certain things that might not be sufficient to put in the compendium because you haven't requested comment on them it might have to be raised to the dignity of regulations. That is something someone asked for comment. Yeah, but we've got an application before us. We've got no. an act on We can't publish the thing. We can't publish the action that we take with respect to this particular case. We've got to act on the case. Well, presumably, you know Can we act on it without? Well, I think we'll have to I have some things, things we'll have to act on it. <laughs> if we refuse to think so, so it's that material which is not subject to copyright, right. and if we get something newly invented, which we think right. is not subject to copyright, I think we can reject it. I don't think we have We can use yeah. broad language. Mm -hmm. But uh, coming back to those, those practices that were uh, that uh, Walter prepared under mm -hmm. the three recording uh, mm -hmm. operations, mm -hmm. This is part of what troubled me. That, um, I realize we're not bound by this now, but uh, uh, I, I would like to have this in, the, in some kind of framework that did actually provide a form of publication and public availability. We, would, we probably would have to disclose the basis for a rejection, for example. Yeah. Right. Whatever that was. And uh, 
what we do. Remember to come and ask to see a UV envelope on his uh, tape? Yes. Now, now we, have, we are changing our, our practice with respect to rejections, uh, which are not now. Isn't that right? Um, bring me up today. I've, I've lost the, the thread. Uh, on rejections, what what is the regulation with respect to disclosing rejections to third parties? Now, we do that, don't we? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Only if it's in litigation. That's right. If only it's in litigation mm -hmm. under under the new. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, under yeah, the new yeah, law, it sure. has to be made. Available. Yeah, yeah, sure. uh, yeah. We made the decision yeah. months ago when we made that mailing list change not to go ahead with all the rest of the changes. That's right. That's right. I, I, was to, I, I was trying to. I was remembering that, and I was trying to remember what, where we came out. The only so we are still not making that. Uh, that is one one area that we're, we'll clearly have. And to that's change. good. Cause is shown. I understand from Waldo, we, we do it virtually all the time. Mm -hmm. Okay. So unless the good cause is shown, we out. Yeah, well, that's just now. But under the new law, you, yeah, yes. they'll all be open. Yeah, yeah. Luke, did you have a question? Yeah, you had mentioned that about the library's reluctance to disclose its acquisitions policies. Um, I don't know if that's true generally or just in specific acquisitions. Mm -hmm. Generally, do they know? Do they know about Section 407 uh, and the regulations that the register adopts <coughs> and the format in which? Those are going to be adopted. Uh, you mean the best edition? Business. Well, uh, if we're going to act as if we're under the APA, um, it's asked that, you know, at least insofar as the organization that hearing is concerned, uh, is the library going to participate in it in, in any way, shape? They have an acquisitions manual. They just don't want to open it up to the whole world. Isn't that really because it hadn't been edited? It used to no, be that the canons of selection <laughs> used to be that the canons of selection were at the end of every uh, quarterly yeah, journal. Yeah, but they didn't want to put these uh, policies in their regular recommend mm -hmm. regulations. We tried to get that done, and the processing department always objected. And I think that part of it was they're not up to date. If they think there's less, there's more flexibility if you don't publish them as regulations. Well, they don't publish their regulations. Right. LCRs are not. Uh, well, LCRs were, when I administered them, open to anybody who came in and wanted to know a particular regulation. After this law on freedom of information, I had to show them. But I didn't volunteer any extra things. Anyway, I, I've always felt this was terribly self-defeating. Yeah, very but, no. Uh, yeah, I know. But that's that's their problem. No. <laughs> Admittedly, we have a problem in the, in the sense that we're linked with them. But uh, I am inclined to think that we should go our own way and let I them. Think, I know. think so too. And that and that the other things where you the administrative things would be a separate thing. I don't see why that would affect our leave record. That, that doesn't seem to me really a problem. Um, obviously, we can't function without exchanging leave records with the, the Library of Congress, so your common sense would tell you that this is not a, that is a disclosure that would require the kind of uh, public accounting. If, you're, if the uh, CIA is asking for a record from uh, the Agriculture Department, it's one thing. If uh, the Library of Congress is getting weekly leave records from the Copyright Office. It's quite a different thing. If an unsuccessful applicant asks to see uh, the recommendation of PAR for the position for which he applied for, ordinarily in the library he could not see that. Well, that's again, that's forbidden by law. Can't. You can't do that. It's a question of, of uh, well, like rifling the IRS files uh, mm -hmm. for other purposes, security yeah. or so, so, so forth and so on. Uh, that, uh, I think you have to apply a certain amount of common sense here. It just seems to me if we say in the Federal Register what we're doing in the personnel area, then that's all we need to do. Yeah. Make it very general. Yeah. I don't see any problem. And if, uh, if, if anybody had any other thoughts, I'd want to take them on. Uh, but I, it seems to me that uh, you have to look at what the law is intended to do and not worry about its literal wording, which it may, may not even I'd like to go back to the general premise that led to creating more 
task force has a separate task force in the record subcommittee other than merely an assignment out of the legal subcommittee. Because I think everything Marx has said here and all the questions totally justifies that, and that is it cuts across so many lines. It, it raises the question I asked much earlier this afternoon about where does one locate correspondence on the rejected recordation or something. And I, I still think the ultimate objective, the first objective of Marx task force has to be some kind of overall report, not even giving answers, just raising all the questions. But I don't think you, at least in this task group, cannot have the luxury of sitting down and asking questions now and then working on those. I think at some point you'll have to come up with one massive document that raises all the questions, and at the end come up with one massive document that gives all the answers, and then pull out parts of that and, and publish them or do whatever you have to do with them. I just don't, you know, we've all operated under the copyright law for a long time. We know what the questions are. Here, identify the impact here. Mm -hmm. And here, that's, that seems to be the first step. None of us are, are familiar with this, right. these statutes at all. And, uh, we could take shortcuts in all the other task groups because of our historical knowledge that we simply can't take here. Who will in, in, end up writing the regulations that implement this? You, I think the recommendations would come from Mark. The recommendations would come from Mark, but the actual regulations? Well, they could, try to, they could draft them as well, uh, I imagine. We should start moving in this direction fairly soon. Mark, has, do you still feel that you need a, a full-time attorney on the task force? Well, we can certainly use some assistance in that direction. And would it be very expensive, virtually full-time for a couple of months? <coughs> well, it's, it's hard to say at this point. I would rather uh, feel my way along. when you do need somebody, um, let John know. Um, as soon as possible, so that we can marshal our forces again. Okay, let's go on to the last item, which is um, Jim Roberts and the preparation of records and indexes. <coughs> Outline that's here in the, in the handout this past night for the meeting is somewhat shortcutted by design because the safe and work overall, mainly uh, the first part on the record books and the card catalog is pretty detailed. But then when it gets down to new records, I will basically deviate from that completely. Uh, as John mentioned, well, back to the record, let me start the record. Uh, we are kind of static at, the, at this point because we're waiting for a lot of things. Uh, we, we have considered uh, the continuation of the present method of keeping the application form and binding them or whether to go into some microform publication, either micro film or microfiche, uh, but we don't know what, what we're dealing with, and we found that this to be a kind of a hindrance in, in our whole task. Uh, we knew that, that something would exist, and we had to go forward with this ideal in mind that, that we would have something to work with uh, eventually. So we, we put forth some ideas uh, and, and have just kind of set tight with those ideas until we get more, more to work with. Uh, we don't know, for instance, with the application form, whether it's going to be a one-pager or a multi-page. We know it will be multi-page, of course, in the, in the contribution area where there's more than one contribution registered at one time. Uh, we've also explored the feasibility of rather than retain the notices of intention as we get it now, which comes in in all shapes, sizes, and forms, <coughs> formats, uh, to with the thought of possibly microfilming that uh, somewhat along the lines of, of the way the assignments are done now and uh, possibly returning that letter to the sender. Uh, we, we've thought along those lines. Uh, with the card catalog, uh, as I'm sure most of you know, the 
decision was made to go ahead with an inner filing project and uh, for the 1946, the 55, and the 71 in Texas. And uh, we have, under my task group, and we have a subgroup, which Dr. Stevens mentioned earlier, which is headed up by Leo Beth LaRue, and she is, that was instrumental in the inner filing project. And she's going forward with that and with the thoughts of how to inner file the cards or machine readable records or what have you, uh, beginning with 78. And also we're looking into the thoughts of really how to inner file the past CCC. Uh, we've Talking about filing rules or procedure now, Jim? Well, actually I guess with the filing, I don't know whether it comes filing rules or procedures or the way to do it. Uh, I don't know whether it's actually the rules. I guess it is the filing rules you, you would actually say. Uh, it, it's, uh, I think it crosses over into the rules area. And we have on that, on that little subgroup, we have representatives from all the divisions uh, represented to, uh, to put forth. And we're going to, I may mention, come forth with a paper on that in about two weeks with a tentative recommendation to each division chief and the committees and so on on uh, what to do, what our recommendations are on, on inner filing, whether they go character by character, word by word, uh, what have you. And there are some definite advantages and disadvantages in both directions. And uh, we're trying to identify those. Is it pretty set which way they're recommending? Is it what? Is it pretty much set which way it's going to be uh, I think at this point we're going to really consider a, a character by character uh, from 78 forward. Uh, it seems more compatible with the with the computer uh, to do it that way. And I, I have reservations about uh, making it easier for the computer or being uh, governed by the computer. But it seems that, that uh, it would certainly cut down the workload throughout the office uh, if we went with a character by character filing versus the word by word, because there are difficulties in the word by word. Uh, as we have the cards spewed out now by the computer, uh, in order to file them in the word by word mode, they have to be rearranged. want to comment as well as question on this point? Yeah. I know you have feelings. I think there's various issues. I, I, I think I'm generally for it. It's, uh, it's going to mean that the, that the file from 1978 on is going to be different in some extent than the earlier file, and yet it's going to be simpler. You can publish a list of rules and people say the public can deal with it in an easier fashion. I think it's easier for ourselves. Uh, I, I guess I, I would You're in favor of is anybody opposed to it? I reserve judgment. I would defer to Waldo to some extent. Again, it's a question of are we going to uh, take the easy way out and get incompatible with the rest of the world? But is it important to us to follow the same kind of filing that LC follows? Yeah, I think, I think compatibility with LC is a big use factor. Are we going to our catalogs over, over there? Or are we going to use theirs? Well, the uh, the letter by letter, or character by character approach is something that was developed. I think uh, most recently in TPRO, the Technical Processes Office, that John Rather headed an LC, and uh, I used his rules to completely revise the card catalog and found it to be to be very effective and to have uh, really no problems at all with, with the public. And I think one thing we need to keep is we talk about compatibility between us and the library. Remember that they're talking very seriously about closing the catalog. 
And they're going to have two systems as well. That's right. That's right. No, I'm not saying I, I think we ought to be generally parallel with them. In other words, our card files ought to be there, by and large, filed under the rules of their card file. Then when we go to machines, <clears throat> our rules ought to be generally parallel to their machine rules. But there are going to have to be some differences, but I'm talking about grosso modo. Filing under, under the character of a character business is much simpler from the standpoint of the filing. And I think the chance of error, which is always present, is reduced so under character by character. It's simpler for cattle artists because uh, if you want to file word by word, there are certain things you have to do, and you have to put a space before a slash and a space after. So you kind of like I think my own feeling right now is subject to the studies is that the break ought to be between cards and not cards. Anyway, we can yeah, certainly talk about what we get when we have machines. Yeah, yeah. Are you aware that there was a uh, enormous degradation? Filing rules were changed to accommodate it. That our catalogs changed so that things were filed out of registration number instead of title, or a whole package of uh, imprints were thrown out. No, I really wasn't uh, right. aware. In, in, in really terms you describe it, enormous degradation. It really was. Yeah. 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 You mean here in our here? here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, some of this, of course. Not asking anybody. <coughs> well, some of this can be repaired with this, mm -hmm. this editing and combining project. Well, let's talk about the editing and combining for a minute. Now, what, what, what route are we taking there? Okay, we have not, we have not addressed you know, what we have touched on, so we haven't looked at it in depth. Uh, my thoughts on it are that we really are going to have to keep it the way it is. Uh, however, some Also uh, discussed changing the way the assignment file is filed if we go for character by character. We also change that at the same time. Uh, the break. Make make the break across mm -hmm. the board and in the office. Uh, so as I say, the Arab recommendations and, and the thoughts on that will be forthcoming. Okay. In a couple okay. Of weeks. okay. Okay. Sure. It's more than preliminary at this point, but it's not certainly not finalized. Uh, I might mention uh, that we have, well, again, this, this kind of jumps into to, uh, new records. So, but we have considered with, with everything uh, or kept as our main thought to hold down the number of files uh, to try to keep, limit the number of places one would have to look and put everything that we could uh, in the existing files as they are, using them as a guideline, uh, putting things, uh, at least the initial access to these, to the record, in either the CCC or in the assignment files. You would maintain uh, them separate? Yes. 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 The thought was has been brought forth to, to combine those, but um, I personally don't see putting the assignment with the CCC. Two entirely different. Does anybody do What about if we're completely automated? Do you still see them being two different files? I would think, Mary, when you're automated, you could have an auto automated link between them, and it doesn't matter whether they're separate files or not in the same manner. Well, that's all I was interested in, whether you could just make your search inquiry once. If you, if you tie the registration number. Now you probably have you might not have Well, so you can't tie them a registration number because not everything has a registration number. Mm -hmm. 
But if you went in by a name, would you have to repeat the name twice to search in those files? You could have a search. You could go across two files. You could add into your automated system. The fact that the files are physically separate doesn't mean you can't search them both under an automated system. I think, that, I think the question goes away. Well, the question, the question goes away, maybe, but the the when you get the answer, I mean, when you get the <laughs> items back, you know, you, you might funny. you might query it in with one question, but right. but the results that you get may be manifold, and then at that point you're going to have to say this belongs here and this belongs here and this belongs here, and you're going to have to handle them uh, that way. By and large, uh, our search reports report registrations and then documents, and. Uh, I would think of it would be mixing apples and oranges in a report to, to try to enter lard and be sure you had the right assignment record below the right registration. It's better to have them do and let the let the public make the linkage uh, rather than us taking leaps of faith here. And, uh, to well, this is a different question, but it does seem to me we're going to have to consider changing our policy and not searching assignments unless people ask for it. Oh yeah, I under the new law, no law, question, no almost, question. You, no don't, question. you don't disagree with it? No. Well, good, because no. I, uh, I feel that way. I think we're going to have to Surprise do it. Surprise you, didn't I? No. But is your concern partly the integrity of the assignment record, that you don't want to no, mess them up or uh, anything? it's not the integrity of it, it's just the, the fact that you have to carry, you know, the thought, you know, if you're looking for registrations, if you start to mix in notices of use and notices of intention and assignments and termination <coughs> notices and, and all these other items, uh, it, it's too much to carry mentally, I guess, and, and keep separate. It, it's, it seems to me uh, easier Well, you would you you would have everything uh, that you just described, other than registrations in one file. You have the termination and the. Uh, okay. I'm, yeah. I'm getting, oh, go ahead. Getting, okay. Getting from me. Uh, we have considered uh, all of the items in our in our task group. We've also made note that we feel there are other records. Retrospectively, this would be what, yes. what we've now got. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And that may enter, I mean, that may be part of your of their microfilming. You know, what Tom Nichols is doing now, I mean, that may be one of his projects. This would have to be spaced out, you'd have to have, give it a five year yeah. lag back because it. Well, let me say there that, uh, Paul, I think that the chances are very good that the manufacturing clause will be phased out in accordance with. Law. It's not a foregone conclusion. The no. manufacturers are mounting a campaign to keep it, and I don't think we can assume that it's going to go away. 
Uh, it's not a it's not a complete uh, certainty. Uh, there are there's going to have to be further consideration by Congress in some way or another. And so I think we just have to assume that for the time we can't assume that this is a five year thing. Uh, no, we we for, have for assumed that purpose. you know yeah. at this point that it is. Or yeah. will pay back, but we do realize that there's a build up to keep it. We can't, uh, in, a, in other words, we have to implement it for the, the five years that it's going to be in existence, uh, as if it were going to be in existence forever, and give it the full treatment. Okay. To jump into the new records, which uh, is only a couple of little items there, we have already uh, put forth statements on the notices of identity and signal carriage complement of the cable systems, uh, <coughs> which is under one, section 111B, and then the agreements voluntarily negotiated between copyright owners and public broadcasting entities, which is under 118, and then the item on notices of termination, which is 203 and 304C. Uh, those documents which were mentioned by John on Friday and uh, going forward, and we pretty well set those up uh, so that they go along, uh, well, the, the two anyway, the, the, uh, the agreements and the termination notices, so they go along with the general mode of the assignment, what we, how we handle the assignments and that. And then uh, the other item is set up so that the, the documents Cells are handled or filed under the particular owner of the system, uh, and and that had would have all come forward. Yes, but that only covers the interim period. That, well, yeah. I, I I assume that yeah. we're not locked into 35 mm uh, microfilm for those uh, two for the indefinite future. Just no, because no, we're starting no, out that way, I assumed that. Would somebody look at whether we ought to, in the future, call our assignments by by real and frame uh, rather than bottle and number or something? Uh, somebody else. Remember that's yeah, that's right. Maybe by <laughs> maybe by the time we do it, we'll be away from real and frame too. <laughs> by some feature form or something. <laughs> That'd be awesome. <laughs> yeah. Jim, under the new records, are you looking into areas like the death file or biobib? We have. We've done preliminary work on those. Uh, for the, I think there's there's legal assignments out on the author identity and on the uh, statement, you know, whether, whether the author is still living or whether he's dead statements, right? Those are actually, yeah. both of those assignments are signed to three yeah, people, the same one, of, one of whom is from your side team. Yeah, right. right. Well, two of them are from my side team. Eastridge and the mm -hmm. West. Mm -hmm. But uh, what I envision or what I would, would like to see with this sort of thing is that even though that statement might be kept somewhere, uh, maybe in the video file or something like this, I would like to see this sort of thing, that information, uh, rather than be put into the assignment and related documents index, I'd rather see it in something like, uh, I'd rather see it in the CCC. With a, with a, something directing you to, you know, just the fact that it's there and if you want to see what the content is or see what that statement says, then uh, say see video file or, or whatever. Uh, I agree with you. It always bothered me that we put some of those corrected documents in the assignment <coughs> records. I know they're sometimes an index card might be a general file, but it just seemed all wrong to go in with, with recordation. It isn't the normal place where you would search for that kind of information. It seemed to me at first that maybe this sort of thing would go in the assignment file, but but after looking at it, thinking about it, it seemed to me more appropriate to go into the CCC. Um, it's it's like the uh, receipt of the of the record with deposit copies only, uh, which seems to me it shouldn't be a separate file. It ought to be something that's in the CCC. 
States is that uh, all of this means more work for Canada in the end. I mean, that's just, mm -hmm. that's just a thing. Uh, but it, it seems, as I say, as I said at the outset, the thing that we're trying to do is is cut down the number of files, or at least keep it down to, to two or three at a minimum. And even if you do have to go somewhere else to see what the person said about somebody still living, uh, if you have this something that keys you into uh, John Doe was still living on, on uh, January 2, 1978, if you wonder who said it and, and what what they said or, or what their basis for it was, then they go somewhere else to see it. And uh, I think we could provide that information to the public. And then if they wanted a copy of this thing, then they could ask for a photocopy of it or, or something. Mm -hmm. I, think. Uh, I agree. I mean, those are, those are just some thoughts that, yeah. that we are, are kicking around. And, and we welcome, of course, any suggestions from anyone. The, the uh, people that are working on this uh, death student file study asked me to, to raise this question probably the policy group to what extent is it I'm just saying that we will go outside the office to compile these obituary files so it's so we go to AGAC and BMI and places like that that have these records and try and bring them in or are we just going to passively sit back and let people record these statements well, I'll tell you what my, my own personal thinking is, and I think this should be formalized as a question put to the formal, to the policy group, but um, as best I recall in the origins of this, there wasn't any thought of going greatly beyond the present BioBiblio, which after all is a self-generated file. We do uh, uh, base this on more than material that people give us. We have we use obituaries and that sort of thing. Uh, we use book jacket blurbs and that sort of thing too. Uh, it's hard to know exactly how this would evolve and the extent to which the public would use it and the extent to which it would become a, a fundamental part of the, uh, the working out of the term provisions of the law. But I could see it growing to some extent. Uh, it would seem to me that uh, based on published records, not mm -hmm. unpublished records, we could go beyond just uh, odds and ends of obituaries that happen to come our way. There is some background to that. I had been approached by a couple of the organizations Dick mentioned, uh, offering to cooperate, cooperate with us. And I recently had an exchange of correspondence with Ed Kramer that you might have seen when Ed and I were discussing uh, the problem of far north and how one files a biographical file on foreign authors, and Ed had recommended a, a vice president of BMI who's very much up on what the uh, international organizations of performing rights societies have in machine-readable databases and offering to sit down with us and talk to us. And I had told uh, Santora just to hold all these and not to approach anybody until we decided indeed if we would approach anybody. But the other part of that uh, raises the point that hopefully the people who are doing the studies are using that legislative history list and going back to the discussions in the early 60s to see if there was any discussion about that. Some of the answers may be there, or some guidelines to the answers may be there. The statute gives us the authority to go outside for the OPIT file, not for the author identity file. Um, the way it, way it reads, uh, register shall maintain current records of information related to the death of authors of any of copyrighted works based on such recorded statements, and to the extent the register considers practicable on data contained in any of the records of the Copyright Office or in other reference sources. Whether that would include private databases, I don't know. Are these pu considered published by these organizations, or are they proprietary? I don't know enough about them to answer that. I think the ones of the international organizations that Ed Kramer was discussing are available to sale, certainly to member of performing rights societies and perhaps to anyone who wants them. Mm -hmm. On death information, it just occurred to me, to what extent are uh, government records of deaths 
federal government records available to us. Well, Don Ryan is a couple, of, I'm sorry, this isn't federal, but apparently Don had done some work on, uh, and he's a member of both of the study teams, had done some right, uh, background work on death certificates and similar documents, and apparently you developed a wealth of information about it. So that, that, but those are generally state rather than federal. Well, it just occurred to me that Social Security must have tons of death certificates. Yeah, but they're probably they're going to go everybody. speak for them. That is no doubt. But we realize that. I, I, I realize that, but what I'm wondering is if we're, if we're trying to search somebody down or if we want to be active on a particular basis, I just wonder what's available. Well, they, they should be looking into that, but they may be constrained by the Privacy Act from, from disclosing that information. Does the Privacy Act extend to the, to the deceased? No. It doesn't. Yeah. Not even if there's an implication as to the family. But there may be an implication from the air of That's the, the, it. the old libel question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure how far. I, I don't feel that we need to move four square into this. In the first place, it isn't going to be that relevant for 25 years. And... Uh, until that first batch runs out in 2003, the life of the author is really not going to be that relevant. And uh, I, I will be long gone by then, so it'll be somebody else's problem. In terms of uh, um, answering the question, though, I think we do have to have some kind of policy. So if you could, along the lines you suggested, uh, get this in, in, a, in the form of a formal question, then we'll address it. We'll be some kind of half-baked answer. Can I ask one other general policy direction question that uh, this uh, collection of these same studies these can be filed by any person having an interest in the Kappa and their proceeding on the ground uh, will be interpreted very literally. Right. That, that was certainly I, mean, I take it we should continue. Again though uh, this is the sort of question that I think the policy uh, committee should address directly and uh, on the basis of something in writing. I don't think, j just asking me a question, I'm giving you my opinion right off the top of my head. I don't think that's the way we should decide this sort of thing. I think the question should be accompanied by some input, some, some historical analysis or some suggested alternatives or something. And that, that's what they're there for. Right? Now the question is, where do we go from here? Um, I think this has been extremely successful and also extremely long and exhausting, but uh, very necessary. We had to go through this to get ourselves off the ground. Uh, it seems to be pretty obvious that the most important things we have to do are, well, obviously there are some things that are ongoing that should be continued. There are th some things that have kind of gotten hung up because decisions have to be made. And the two most important are the numbering and the classification. There's no two ways about it. We can't move forward in those areas without decisions. And I think at the same time, uh, because I know of the, the, the massive problems that are involved, we need to move forward in the organization area. And But I, your six weeks doesn't bother me. It seems to me that's not unrealistic. Uh, I would think that maybe in the six weeks we could have a, a meeting of this kind to discuss your recommendations in that area. Maybe so we can do it earlier than that. Well, six weeks is what? The, around the 1st of May, mm -hmm. something like mm -hmm. that. I think that's time. Um, you need time to consult yeah. with the division chiefs and so forth. But does anybody see anything other than numbering? Well, and, and obviously we've got to start thinking about the formatting of the application form yeah. too. But I think numbering and classification are, are crucial. Right? Yeah, I think we have to. Maybe this is more registers conference business than this place. But we've mentioned it a dozen times in the last two meetings. The uh, public broadcasting, particularly the cable, and by the end of this week, the termination notice, both practices close for. I. I acknowledge your questions. I just think we have to get something out in writing to tell the people what to do with these pieces of paper when 3,000 right. of them will be in the office. Um, Couldn't they be issued as a memoranda from division chiefs just to get us over this hump or something? Well, I think that's a good question. I had raised some questions, and those questions would have to be answered first. No, I don't think it should be from a division chief. If we're taking responsibility from it, it should be from uh, 
I still don't have any answers to my questions about how does this plug into the larger framework. Well, I think the answer was the one we discussed Friday. It's this whole residuary, residuary category of, of the compendium and the patent area, so like it's something that will have to be looked at by Penny and Mary as a unit. But just as I said, my only concern here is that all these papers are going to be coming in. I have one of them on my desk. Waldo has two. What happens with them? All right. Um, well, this isn't what I was talking about, but obviously those, those should get out in the next day or so, and I think that we can. Yeah. I think we have to put some kind of a deadline on the BSO uh, question, including the ones that I need to uh, come to you with data on. And the whole problem of uh, what are the pants we are putting on them yeah. and analyze and do that kind of thing. By the way, I might mention this also like registers conference business, but uh, I have I've met with BSO and they have agreed to come back by Thursday with a complete schedule of resources again and where they're at and topics and two boxes and, and perhaps in process and we'll go from there and see what they can do and what they can't do with their present resources. Well this is partly re registers comments but it's certainly germane to what we're talking about and uh, you're raising it in the revision implementation context which is Good. terribly important obviously. Yes I agree with you. I think that's equally crucial. Uh, but we do have some some action there and, and the promise of a continuing development from what Ed is saying, they're, they're going to get something to us Thursday and that we can go on with this. I think that the, the numbering and the classification is something that we all have to address. And well, Do you have any suggestions? Uh, well, Dale's forwarded a recommendation to us now on classification and uh, I believe we'll be getting one on numbering. It is, okay. Well, what do we do with it? Let's let's come to grips with that. And then how do we communicate the decision? To what extent do we give this kind of group or the, the, the subgroups under these people uh, an opportunity to input into the decision? I guess that's a question of whether the policy decision group can really meet as a closed group as opposed to something like this. Well, it, I would say it would vary. <coughs> in some cases, I think we can. In other cases, and this may be one of them, I'm not sure. I thought before you guys, th these recommendations are to go along with the entire staff. To the staff as a whole? Mm -hmm. Or at least to the division chiefs to see if they want to circulate it. I think part of the deadline for comment. Mm -hmm. well, the deadline well, the for deadline comment. comment, but I really do think most of the members of the staff will have something to say on it. And what about the public? What about our commitment to, if, if we present a whole package to the public uh, that's tightly integrated, we're not really well, it may be the only feasible thing to do, but in a way, it's locking them out uh, of making. It's a real problem. Yeah. Well, I'm raising questions. I don't have any clear answers. Well, we, when I've suggested somebody like Buddy, John had problems with that because of the rulemaking. My problem wasn't with Buddy. My problem was just Buddy. Well, yeah. that's with Buddy and Buddy <laughs> are probably the only two outside attorneys that have anything to say about them. Can't we, can we set a deadline, for example, of, of even by the end of this week, where everybody would have what they consider to be, including Gail, questions that require immediately policy, immediate policy guidance, and by early next week, Mary and Penny can pretty much decide how to, uh, how to resolve it, and what kind of, of forum to hold to answer it. I think our approach to questions for the policy decision group should, should be rather conservative. In many cases, the people should just consider alternatives and, and post out alternatives. And obviously in Gail's case and some of the ones Dick mentioned that that would just be too time consuming. But I don't I think there are a lot of questions, others that Dick and I have gotten that the answers have been, you know, you tell us and we'll give the policy decision later on. But I think Mary and Penny have to have some way to decide what type of forum and to, to, so let's get a, a Friday deadline on all questions that people want to have put for policy decision and then the, Coordinating committee decide how to go. Well, obviously, that's not, I mean, that, that's a, a deadline for this go round. Obviously, there's well, going to be millions I'm and millions more as we go along. Well, I don't think there should be millions and millions. Oh, wait and see. <laughs> we can't keep a question from rising. No, but in a lot of cases, you can say to the person working on the assignment, instead of bucking this up to the policy decision group, 
give us an answer, give us a recommended answer. Well, or I don't give argue us that. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, All those procedures that uh, Waldo sent up, why couldn't they be incorporated in the present compendium? It's just another chapter or an enlargement of the present assignment. Well, I would stress they were written as procedures, not as compendium and entries and not as regulations. They were written at a lower level with the idea of, that our but terms of reference were. To put a, the it would take up some editing. Uh, if you want to get them assuming that everybody agreed with it. Yeah. Well, I think we'll have to do that in order to get them out. Uh, I, I, I do feel that they should be formalized, that they shouldn't just be something that's sitting in somebody's file. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of the Freedom of Information Act, but I'm also conscious of the fact that this is, these are actually the first practices of any sort that we have gotten out under the new law, and we should uh, be careful what precedents that we establish. But well, let me ask you a question. In future, when people write procedures, uh, do you mean that when they're written, they're written in stone, and, uh, or aren't they just put forward as tentatives and, and draft uh, proposals, and they don't become anything until we, one, issue them, and two, say at the same time that we're going to follow them? Well, it seems to me that uh, the two things you just mentioned merge. Uh, mm -hmm. that the issue if you, issue, if you tell somebody you're following, you've got to issue. Uh, and a decision takes place at a certain point, at which that's point right. the stuff come, becomes public. That's right, that's right. But, and, but isn't it subject to editing and so forth before that takes place? Well, because it considerably cons it's going to considerably constrict a lot of these yeah, people in, yeah. in what to put forward if it's going to be forever and ever a, a, a record. This is exactly why I'm concerned about mm -hmm. this. Um, there were some little odds and ends in those. I, by